Section Zero of Psychological Warfare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jared. Psychological Warfare by Paul M. A. Leinbarger. Preface and Acknowledgements. Preface to the Second Edition. The present edition of this work has been modified to meet the needs of the readers of the mid-1950s. The material in the first edition following page 244 has been removed. It consisted of a chapter hopefully called Psychological Warfare and Disarmament. A new part four, comprising three fresh chapters, has been added, representing some of the problems confronting students and operators in this field. Pages 1 through 243 are a reprint from the first edition. This edition, like the first, is the product of field experience. The author has made nine trips abroad, five of them to the Far East since 1949. He has profited by his meeting with such personalities as Sir Henry Gurney, the British High Commissioner for the Federation of Malaya, who was later murdered by the Communists, meetings with Philippine, Republic of Korea, Chinese nationalist, captured Chinese communist, and other personalities, as well as by association with such veterans in the field as General MacArthur's chief Psy War expert, Colonel J. Woodall Green, to Colonel Joseph I. Green, who died in 1953. The author is indebted as friend and colleague. He owes much to the old friends listed in the original acknowledgement, who offered their advice and comment in many instances. Many readers of the first edition wrote helpful letters of comment. Some of their suggestions have been incorporated here. The translators of the two Argentine editions of this book, the translator of the Japanese edition, the Han Suma Yokachiro, and the translator of the first and second Chinese edition, Mr. Chen N. Cheng, all of them have been direct or indirect improvements in the content or style of the work. The author also wishes to thank his former student, later his former ORO colleague, now his wife, Dr. Genevieve Leinbarger, for her encouragement and her advice. The author hopes that, as U.S. agencies and other governments move toward a more settled definition of doctrine in this field, a third edition, a few years from now, may be able to reflect the maturation of Psy War in international affairs. He does not consider the time appropriate for a fundamental restatement of doctrine. He hopes that readers who have suggestions for future editions of scope policy, or operations can communicate these to him for inclusion in later printings of this book. Acknowledgements. This book is the product of experience rather than research, of consultation rather than reading. It is based on my five years of work, both as civilian expert and as army officer, in American psychological warfare facilities at every level from the joint and combined chiefs of staff planning phased down to the preparing of spot leaflets for the American forces in China. Consequently, I have tried to avoid making this an original book, and have sought to incorporate those concepts and doctrines which found readiest acceptance among the men actually doing the job. The responsibility is therefore mine, but not the credit. Psychological warfare involves exciting wit-sharpening work. It tends to attract quick-minded people, men full of ideas. I have talked about psychological warfare with all sorts of people, all the way from Mr. Mao Zetong in Yenin and Ambassador Joseph Davies in Washington, to an engineer corporal in New Zealand and the Latrine Cooley, second class, at our Chung King headquarters. I have seen one New York lawyer get mentally befuddled and another New York lawyer provided the solution, and have seen Pulitzer Prize winners run out of ideas only to have the stenographers supply them. From all these people I have tried to learn, and have tried to make this book a patchwork of enthusiastic recollection. Fortunately, the material is non-copyright. Unfortunately, I cannot attribute most of these comments or inventions to the original proponents. Perhaps this is just as well. Some authors might object to being remembered. A few indebtednesses stand out with such clarity as to make acknowledgement a duty. These I wish to list with the caution that this list is not inclusive. First of all, I am indebted to my father, Judge Paul M. W. Leinbarger, who during his lifetime initiated me into almost every phase of international political warfare, whether covert or overt, in connection with his lifelong activities on behalf of Sun Yat-sen and the Chinese nationalists. 
On a limited budget, for years out of his own pocket, he ran campaigns against imperialism and communism, and for Sino-American friendship and Chinese democracy, in four or five languages at a time. For five and a half years, I was his secretary, and believe that this experience has kept me from making this a book of exclusively American doctrine. There is no better way to learn the propaganda job than to be whipped thoroughly by someone else's propaganda. Second only to my debt to my father, my obligation to the War Department General Staff Officers detailed to the Psychological Warfare stands forth. By sheer good fortune, the United States had an unbroken succession of intelligent, conscientious, able men assigned to this vital post, and it was my own good luck to serve under each of them in turn between 1942 and 1947. They are, in order of assignment, Colonel Percy W. Black, Brigadier General Oscar N. Solbert, Colonel Charles Blakeney, Lieutenant Colonel Charles Alexander Holmes Thompson, Colonel John Stanley, Lieutenant Colonel Richard Hirsch, Lieutenant Colonel Bruce Buttles, Colonel Dana Johnston, Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Tatum, and Lieutenant Colonel Wesley Edwards. Their talents and backgrounds were diverse, but their ability was uniformly high. I do not attribute this to the peculiar magic of psychological warfare, nor to unwanted prescience of the part of the adjutant general, but to plain good luck. A special thanks are due to the following friends, who have read this manuscript in whole or in part. I have dealt independently with the comments and criticism, so that none of them can be blamed for the final form of the book. These are Dr. Edward K. Merritt, the Columbia-trained MIS propaganda analyst. Mr. C. A. H. Thompson, State Department International Information Consultant and Brookings Institution staff member, Professor E. P. Lilly of Catholic University and concurrently Psychological Warfare Historian to the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Lieutenant Colonel Innes Randolph, Lieutenant Colonel Heber Blankenhorn, the only American to have served as a Psychological Warfare Officer in both World Wars, Dr. Alexander M. Layton, M.D., the psychiatrist and anthropologist who, as a Navy Lieutenant Commander, headed the OWI-MIS Foreign Morale Analysis Division in wartime. Mr. Richard Hirsch, Colonel Donald Hall, without whose encouragement I would have never finished this book. Professor George S. Petit, whose experience in strategic intelligence lent special weight to his comment. Colonel Dana Johnston. Mr. Martin Hertz, who may someday give the world the full account of the mysterious Yaksiv operations, and Mrs. M. S. Leinbarger. Further, I must thank several of my associates in the propaganda agencies, whose thinking proved most stimulating to mine. Mr. Jeffrey Gorer was equally brilliant as colleague and as ally. Dean Edwin Guthrie brought insights to the psychological warfare which were as much the reflection of judicious, humane personality as of preeminent psychological scholarship. Professor W. A. Aiken, himself a historian, provided data on the early history of U.S. facilities in World War II. Mr. F. M. Fisher and Mr. Richard Watts, Jr. of the OWI China Outpost, together with their colleagues, taught me a great deal by letting me share some of their tasks. And my immediate chief in China, Colonel Joseph K. Dickey, was kind to allow a member of his small, overworked staff to give time to psychological warfare. Messrs. Herbert Little, John Creedy, and C. A. Pierce have told me wonderful stories about their interesting end of propaganda. Mr. Joseph C. Grew, formerly Under Secretary of State and Ambassador to Japan, showed me that the processes of traditional responsible diplomacy include many skills which psychological warfare rediscovers crudely and in different form. Finally, I wish to thank Colonel Joseph I. Green in his triple role of editor, publisher, and friend to whom this volume owes its actual being. While this material has been found unobjectionable on the score of security by the Department of the Army, it certainly does not represent Department of the Army policy, views, or opinion, nor is the department responsible for the matters of factual accuracy. I assume sole and complete responsibility for this book, and would be glad to hear the comment or complaint of any reader. My address is indicated below. 2831 29th Street Northwest, Washington 8, D.C. Date, 20 June 1947. End of Section 0「Section 1 of Psychological Warfare」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Psychological Warfare by Paul M. A. Leinbarger 
Part 1. Definition and History. Chapter 1a. Historic Examples of Psychological Warfare. Psychological warfare is waged before, during, and after war. It is not waged against the opposing psychological warfare operators. It is not controlled by the laws, usages, and customs of war. And it cannot be defined in terms of terrain, order of battle, or named engagements. It is a continuous process. Success or failure is often known only months or years after the execution of the operation. Yet success, though incalculable, can be overwhelming, and failure, though undetectable, can be mortal. Psychological warfare does not fit readily into familiar concepts of war. Military science owes much of its precision and definiteness to its dealing with a well-defined subject, the application of organized, lawful violence. The officer or soldier can usually undertake his task of applying mass violence without having to determine upon the enemy. The opening of war, recognition of neutrals, the listing of enemies, proclamation of peace, such problems are considered political and outside the responsibility of the soldier. Even in the application of force short of war, the soldier proceeds only when the character of the military operation is prescribed by higher, that is, political, authorities, and after the enemies are defined by lawful and authoritative command. In one field only, psychological warfare, is there endless uncertainty as to the very nature of the operation. Psychological warfare, by the nature of its instruments and its mission, begins long before the declaration of war. Psychological warfare continues after overt hostilities have stopped. The enemy often avoids identifying himself in psychological warfare. Much of the time he is disguised as the voice of home, of God, of the church, of the friendly press. Offensively, the psychological warfare operator must fight antagonists who never answer back, the enemy audience. He cannot fight the one enemy who is in plain sight, the hostile psychological warfare operator, because the hostile operator is greedily receptive to attack. Neither success nor defeat are measurable factors. Psychological strategy is planned along the edge of nightmare. The Understanding of Psychological Warfare In a formal approach to this mysterious part of the clean-cut process of war, it might be desirable to start with Euclidean demonstrations, proceeding from definition to definition until the subject matter had been delimited by logic. Alternatively, it might be interesting to try a historical approach, describing the development of psychological warfare through the ages. The best approach is perhaps afforded by a simplification of both a logical and historical approach. For concrete examples, it is most worthwhile to look at instances of psychological warfare taken out of history down to World War II. Then, the definitions and working relationships can be traced, and with these in mind, a somewhat more detailed and critical appraisal of World Wars I and II organizations and operations can be undertaken. If a historian or philosopher picks up this book, he will find much with which to quarrel. But for the survey of so hard to define a subject, this may be a forgivable fault. Psychological warfare and propaganda are each as old as mankind, but it has taken modern specialization to bring them into focus as separate subjects. The materials for their history lie scattered through thousands of books, and it is therefore impossible to brief them. Any reader contemplating retirement from the army to a sedentary life is urged to take up this subject. Footnote. Histories of warfare, of politics, though there are no good recent ones, Edward Jenks's little book being half a century out of date, of political theory, especially the excellent though dissimilar volumes by G. H. Sabine and by G. E. C. Catlin, of particular countries, of diplomacy, of religion, and even of literature, all cast a certain amount of light on the subject. No writer known to the author specializes in the topic of historical propaganda. None takes up the long-established historical role of nonviolent persuasion in warfare. Some of the sociologists and anthropologists, such as Karl Mannheim, Max Weber, Talcott Parsons, Jeffrey Gorer, Ruth Benedict, to mention a few at random, have presented approaches which would justify re-evaluations of history in a way useful to propaganda students, but they have not yet persuaded the historians to do the work. End footnote. A history of propaganda would provide not only a new light on many otherwise odd or trivial historical events, it would throw genuine illumination on the process of history itself. There are, however, numerous instances which can be cited to show applications of psychological warfare. The Use of Panic by Gideon One of the earliest, by traditional reckoning, 
1245 BC applications was Gideon's use of the lamps and pitchers in the great battle against the Midianites. The story is told in the seventh chapter of the book of Judges. Gideon was in a tactically poor position. The Midianites outnumbered him and were on the verge of smiting him very thoroughly. Ordinary combat methods could not solve the situation, so Gideon, acting upon more exalted inspiration than his usually vouchsafed modern commanders, took the technology and military formality of his time into account. Retaining 300 selected men, he sought for some device which would cause real confusion in the enemy host. He knew well that the tactics of his time called for every century of men to have one light carrier and one torchbearer for the group. By equipping 300 men with a torch and a trumpet each, he could create the effect of 30,000. Since the lights could not be turned on and off with switches, like ours, the pitchers concealed them, thus achieving the effect of suddenness. He had his 300 men equipped with lamps and pitchers. The lamps were concealed in the pitchers, each man carrying one, along with a trumpet. He lined his forces in appropriate disposition around the enemy camp at night, and had them, himself setting the example, break the pitchers all at the same time, while blowing like mad on the trumpets. The Midianites were startled out of their sleep and their wits. They fought one another throughout their own camp. The Hebrew chronicler modestly gives credit for this to the Lord. Then the Midianites gave up altogether and fled, and the men of Israel pursued after the Midianites. That settled the Midianite problem for a while. Later, Gideon finished Midian altogether. This type of psychological warfare device, the use of unfamiliar instruments to excite panic, is common in the history of all ancient countries. In China, the emperor usurper Wang Mang on one occasion tried to destroy the Hunnish tribes with an army that included heavy detachments of military sorcerers, even though the Han military emperor had found orthodox methods the most reliable. Wang Mang got whipped at this, but he was an incurable innovator, and in 23 AD, while trying to put down some highly successful rebels, he collected all the animals out of the imperial menagerie and sent them along to scare the enemy, Tigers, rhinoceri, and elephants were included. The rebels hit first, killing the imperial general Wang Sun, and in the excitement the animals got loose in the imperial army where they panicked the men. A hurricane which happened to be raging at the same time enhanced the excitement. Not only were the imperial troops defeated, but the military propaganda of the rebels was so jubilant in tone and so successful in effect that the standard propaganda theme, Depress and Unnerve the Enemy Commander, was fulfilled almost to excess on Wang Mang. Here is what happened to him after he noted the progress of the enemy. Quote, A profound melancholy fell upon the emperor. It undermined his health. He drank to excess, ate nothing but oysters, and let everything happen by chance. Unable to stretch out, he slept sitting up on a bench. End quote. Wang Mang was killed in the same year, and China remained without another economic new deal until the time of Wang Anshi, AD 1021 to 1086, a thousand years later. Better psychological warfare would have changed history. Field Propaganda of the Athenians and the Han A more successful application of psychological warfare is recorded in the writings of Herodotus, the Greek historian. Quote, Themistocles, having selected the best sailing ships of the Athenians, went to the place where there was water fit for drinking, and engraved upon the stones inscriptions, which the Ionians, upon arriving the next day at Artemisium, read. The inscriptions were to this effect. Men of Ionia, you do wrong in fighting against your fathers and helping to enslave Greece. Rather, therefore, come over to us, or, if you cannot do that, withdraw your forces from the contest and entreat the Carians to do the same." But if neither of these things is possible, and you are bound by too strong a necessity, yet in action when we are engaged, behave ill on purpose, remembering that you are descended from us, and that the enmity of the barbarians against us originally sprang from you. End quote. Footnote. The author's attention to this reference was drawn by an unpublished, undated typescript article in the War Department files by Lieutenant Colonel Samuel T. Mackall, Infantry. End footnote. This text is very much like leaflets dropped during World War II on reluctant enemies, such as the Italians, the Chinese puppet troops, and others. Compare this Greek text with figure 5. Note that the propagandist tries to see things from the viewpoint of his audience. His air of reasonable concern for their welfare creates a bond of sympathy, and by suggesting that the Ionians should behave badly in combat, he lays the beginning of another line, the propaganda to the Persians, 
quote, black, unquote, propaganda, making the Persians think that any Ionian who was less than perfect was a secret Athenian sympathizer. The appeal is sound by all modern standards of the combat leaflet. Another type of early military propaganda was the political denunciation which, issued at the beginning of war, could be cited from then on as legal and ethical justification for one side or the other. In the Chinese San Kuo novel, which has probably been read by more human beings than any other work of fiction, there is preserved the alleged text of the proclamation by a group of loyalist pro-Han rebels on the eve of military operations, about A.D. 200. The text is interesting because it combines the following techniques, all of them sound. 1. Naming the specific enemy. 2. Appeal to the, quote, better people, unquote. 3. Sympathy for the common people. 4. Claim of support for the legitimate government. 5. Affirmation of one's own strength and high morale. 6. Invocation of unity. 7. Appeal to religion. The issuance of the proclamation was connected with rather elaborate formal ceremony. Quote, the house of Han has fallen upon evil days. The bonds of imperial authority are loosened. The rebel minister, Tang Cho, takes advantage of the discord to work evil, and calamity falls upon honorable families. Cruelty overwhelms simple folk. We, Xiao and his confederates, fearing for the safety of the imperial prerogatives, have assembled military forces to rescue the state. We now pledge ourselves to exert our whole strength and to act in concord to the utmost limits of our powers. There must be no disconcerted or selfish action. Should any depart from this pledge, may he lose his life and leave no posterity. Almighty heaven and universal mother earth and the enlightened spirits of our forefathers be ye our witnesses. End quote. Any history of any country will yield further examples of this kind of material. Whenever it was consciously used as an adjunct to military operations, it may appropriately be termed military propaganda. Emphasis on ideology. In a sense, the experience of the past may, unfortunately, provide a clue to the future. The last two great wars have shown an increasing emphasis on ideology or political faith, see definition page 30 below, as driving forces behind warfare rather than the considerations of coldly calculated diplomacy. Wars become more serious and less gentlemanly. The enemy must be taken into account not merely as a man but as a fanatic, to the normal group loyalty of any good soldier to his army, right or wrong, there is added the loyalty to the ism, or the leader. Warfare thus goes back to the wars of faith. It is possible that techniques from the Christian Mohammedan or from the Protestant Catholic wars of the past could be re-examined with a view to establishing those parts of their tested experience which may seem to be psychologically and militarily sound in our own time. How fast can converts be made from the other side? In what circumstances should an enemy word of honor be treated as valid? How can heretics, today read subversive elements, be uprooted? Does the enemy faith have weak points which permit enemy beliefs to be turned against personnel at the appropriate times? What unobjectionable forms should leaflets and broadcasts follow in mentioning subjects which are reverenced by the enemy, but not by ourselves? The expansion of the Islamic faith and empire provides a great deal of procedural information which cannot be neglected in our time. It has been said that men's faith should not be destroyed by violence, and that force alone is insufficient to change the minds of men. If this were true, it would mean that Germany can never be denazified, and that there is no hope that the democratic peoples captured by totalitarian powers can adjust themselves to their new overlords, or, if adjusted, can be converted back to free principles. In reality, warfare by Mohammed's captains and successors demonstrated two principles of long-range psychological warfare, which are still valid today. A people can be converted from one faith to the other if given the choice between conversion and extermination, stubborn individuals being rooted out. To effect the initial conversion, participation in the public ceremonies and formal language of the new faith must be required. Sustained counterintelligence must remain on the alert against backsliders, but formal acceptance will become genuine acceptance if all public media of expression are denied the vanquished faith. If immediate wholesale conversion would require military operations that were too extensive or severe, the same result can be effected by toleration of the objectionable faith, combined with the issuance of genuine privileges to the new preferred faith, the conquered people are left in the private, humble enjoyment of their old beliefs and folkways, but all participation in public life, whether political, cultural, or economic, 
is conditioned on acceptance of the new faith. In this manner, all uprising members of the society will move in a few generations over to the new faith in the process of becoming rich, powerful, or learned. What is left of the old faith will be a gutter superstition, possessing neither power nor majesty. These two rules worked once in the rise of Islam. They were applied again by Nazi overlords during World War II, the former in Poland, the Ukraine, and Belarus, the latter in Holland, Belgium, Norway, and other Western countries. The rules will probably be seen in action again. The former process is difficult and bloody, but quick. The latter is as sure as a steamroller. If Christians or Democrats or progressives, whatever free men may be called, are put in a position of underprivilege and shame for their beliefs, and if the door is left open to voluntary conversion so that anyone who wants to can come over to the winning side, the winning side will sooner or later convert almost everyone who is capable of making trouble. In the language of Vilfredo Pareto, this would probably be termed capture of the rising elite. In the language of present-day Marxists, this would be described as utilization of potential leadership cadres from historically superseded classes. In the language of practical politics, it means cut in the smart boys from the opposition so that they can't set up a racket of their own. Figure 1. A Basic Form of Propaganda This American leaflet, issued during the Philippine landings, was dropped on inhabited Philippine areas in order to obtain local civilian cooperation with the landing forces. It can be called the civilian action type. End of Figure 1. Figure 2. Nazi Troop Morale Leaflet in this leaflet used on the Italian front in 1944, the Nazis did not call for any specific action from their American GI readers. Their aim was merely depression of American morale for future exploitation by action propaganda. Note the extreme simplicity of the message. Throughout World War II, the Nazis were misled by their own tendentious political intelligence reports and consequently overestimated the kind and degree of American opposition to Franklin D. Roosevelt. They mistook normal complaint for treasonable sedition, Hence, leaflets such as this seemed practical to the Germans. End of figure 2. Figure 3, one of the outstanding leaflets of the war. Prepared in 1945 for distribution by B-29s operating over Japan, this leaflet lists 11 Japanese cities which were marked for destruction. The leaflet is apparently of the civilian action type, calling on Japanese civilians to save their own lives. At the same time, it had the effect of shutting down 11 strategically important cities, thus hurting the Japanese war effort, while giving the Americans a reputation for humanity and also refuting enemy charges that we undertook indiscriminate bombing. End of figure three. Figure four, the pass which brought them in. Germans liked things done in an official and formal manner, even in the midst of chaos, catastrophe, and defeat. The Allies obliged and gave the Germans various forms of very official-looking surrender passes, of which this is one. The original is printed in red and has banknote-type engraving, which makes it resemble a soap premium coupon. Western Front, 1944-45, issued by Schaeff. End of figure four. Figure five, revolutionary propaganda. When revolution favors one side or the other in war, revolutionary propaganda becomes an instrument which is used by one constituted government against another. This leaflet was issued by the Azad Hind Fauj, Free India Army, of the Japanese puppet Supas Chandra Bose, Singapore, then called Shonan, 1943 and 1944. The leaflet avoids direct reference to the Japanese and is therefore block propaganda. Its theme is simple. The British are alleged to eat while the Hindus starve. At the time, this argument had some plausibility. There was famine in Bengal, but no white men were found among the thousands of emaciated dead. End of figure five. Figure six, propaganda for illiterates. Propaganda reached out for the mass audience in World War II. Some of the most interesting developments in this line were undertaken by CBI theater facilities and their Japanese competitors. The leaflet shown above is designed to tell its story in Hindustani Devanagari script or in Romanized Hindustani, to Indians who could read either form, and in pictures to the illiterates. It starts with the Union Jack, and ends with the Congress flag used by the puppet pro-Japanese Indian leader Supas Chandra Bose. End of figure six. Figure seven, propaganda through news. News is one of the best carriers of psychological warfare to the enemy. One of these newspapers is directed by the Allies to the German troops in the Aegean Islands, the other by the Germans to the Americans in France. Of the two, the Allied paper in German is the more professional job. Note the separation of appeals from the news, 
the greater newsiness of the news columns, and the explanation provided for third-party civilians in their own Greek language, top right. End of figure 7. End of section 1. Read by Eli Bishop, San Francisco, March 6, 2021. Section 2 of Psychological Warfare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Brandon Mitchell. Psychological Warfare by Paul M. A. Leinbarger. Chapter 1b Historic Examples of Psychological Warfare, Part 2. The Black Propaganda of Genghis Khan. Another demonstration of psychological warfare in the past was so effective that its results lingered to this day. It is commonly thought that the greatest conqueror the world has ever seen, Temujin, the Genghis Khan, affected his Mongol conquest with limitless hordes of wild Tartar horsemen who flooded the world by weight of sheer numbers. Recent research shows that the sparsely settled countryside of Inner Asia could not have produced populations heavy enough to overwhelm the densely settled areas of the great Mongol periphery by weight alone. The empire of the Khan was built on bold military inventiveness, the use of highly mobile forces, the full use of intelligence, the coordination of half-global strategy, the application of propaganda in all its forms. The Mongols were fighting the Sung Dynasty in China and the Holy Roman Empire in Prussia 4,000 miles apart when neither of their adversaries knew, in more than rumor, that the other existed. The Mongols used espionage to plan their campaigns and deliberately used rumor and other means to exaggerate accounts of their own huge numbers, stupidity, and ferocity. They did not care what their enemies thought as long as the enemies became frightened. Europeans described light, hard-hitting, numerically inferior cavalry as a numberless horde because Mongol agents whispered such a story in the streets. To this day, most Europeans do not appreciate the lightness of the forces nor the cold intelligence of command with which the Mongols hit them seven centuries ago. Genghis even used spies of the enemy as a means of frightening the enemy. When spies were at hand, he indoctrinated them with rumors concerning his own forces. Let the first European biographer of Genghis tell, in his own now quite words, how Genghis put the bee on Khorzum. And a historian to describe their strength and number makes the spies whom the king of Karazmi had sent to view them speak thus. They are, say they to the sultan, all complete men, Vigorous and look like wrestlers, they breathe nothing but war and blood, and show so great an impatience to fight that the generals can scarce moderate it, yet though they appear thus fiery, they keep themselves within the bounds of a strict obedient command, and are entirely devoted to their prince, they are contented with any sort of food, and are not curious in the choice of beasts to eat, like Muslimen, Mohammedans so that they are subsized without much trouble, and they not only eat swine's flesh, but feed upon wolves, bears, and dogs when they have no other meat, making no distinction between what was lawful to eat and what was forbidden, and the necessity for supporting life takes them all the dislike which the Mahatmatins have for many sorts of animals. As to their number, they concluded, Gagas and troops seemed like the grasshoppers, impossible to be numbered. In reality, this prince making a review of his army found it to consist of 700,000 men. Enemy espionage can now, as formerly, prove useful if the net effect of it is to lower enemy morale. The ruler and people of Khorizm put up a terrific fight, nonetheless, despite their expectation of being attacked by wolf-eating wrestlers without number, but they left the initiative to Genghis's hands and were doomed. However good the Mongols were in strategic and tactical propaganda, they never solved the problem of consolidation propaganda. They did not win the real loyalty of the peoples whom they conquered, unlike the Chinese who replaced conquered populations with their own people or the Mohammedans who 
converted conquered peoples. The Mongols simply maintained law and order, collected taxes, and sat on top of the world for a few generations. Then their world stirred beneath them, and they were gone. The Blindness of John Milton Moving across the centuries, for an example, it is interesting to note that John Milton, author of Paradise Lost and of other priceless books of the English-speaking world, went blind because he was so busy conducting Oliver Cromwell's psychological warfare that he disregarded the doctor's warning and abused his ailing sight. And the sad thing about it was that it was not very good psychological warfare. Milton fell into the common booby trap of refuting his opponents item by item, thus leaving them the strong affirmative position instead of providing a positive and teachable statement of his own faith. He was Latin secretary to the council in that Commonwealth of England, which was, to its contemporaries in Europe, such a novel, dreadful, and seditious form of government. The English had killed their king by somewhat off-handed legal procedures and had gone under the Cromwellian dictatorship. It was possible for their opponents to attack them from two sides at once. Believers in monarchy could call the English murderous king killers, a charge as serious in those times as the charge of anarchism or free love in this, believers in order and liberty could call the British slaves of a tyrant. A Frenchman called Claude de Semai, in Latin form, Samisius, wrote a highly critical book about the English, and Milton seems to have lost his temper and his judgment. In his two books against Salmasus, Milton then committed almost every mistake in the whole schedule of psychological warfare. He moved from his own ground of argument over to the enemies. He wrote at excessive length. He indulged in some of the nastiest name-calling to be found in literature and went into considerable detail to describe Salmasus in unattractive terms. He slung mud wherever he could. The books are read today under compulsion by Ph.D. candidates, but no one else is known to find them attractive. It is not possible to find that these books had any lasting influence in their own time. In these texts written by Milton in Latin, but now available in English, army men wearying of the monotonous phraseology of basic military invective can find extensive additions to their vocabulary. Milton turned to disappointment and poetry, the world is the gainer. The vocabulary of 17th century propaganda had a strident tone which is, perhaps unfortunately, getting to be characteristic of the 20th century. The following epithets sound like an American Legion description of communists or a communist description of the Polish Democrats, yet they were applied in a book by a Lutheran to Quakers. The title of the tirade reads, in part, a description of the new Quakers making known the sum of their manifold blasphemous opinions, dangerous practices, godless crimes, attempts to subvert civil government in the churches and in the community life of the world, together with their idiotic games, their laughable action and behavior, which is enough to make sober Christian persons breathless, and which is like death, and which can display the lazy, stinking cadaver of their fanatical doctrines. In its first few pages, the book accuses the Quakers of obscenity, adultery, civil commotion, conspiracy, blasphemy, subversion, and lunacy. Milton was not out of fashion in applying bad manners to propaganda. It is merely regrettable that he did not transcend the frailties of his time. Other Instances from History Innumerable other instances of propaganda in warfare and diplomacy could be culled out of history. These would not mean much if they were presented as mere storytelling. The cultural factors would have to be figured out, the military situation would need to be appraised in realistic terms, the media available for psychological warfare would have to be charted pretty carefully before the instances would become usable examples. Here are some of the most promising topics. Naval psychological warfare techniques used by the Caribbean pirates to unnerve prospective victims. Cortez's use of horses as psychological disseminators of terror among the Aztecs, along with his exploration of Mexican legends concerning the fair god. The failure of Turkish psychological warfare in the great campaigns of 1683, which left the issue one of purely physical means and cost Turkey the possible hegemony of Central Europe.
the propaganda methods of the British East India Company in the conquest of India against the overwhelming Indian numerical superiority. Edmund Taylor mentions these in his Richer by Asia. The preventative psychological warfare system set up by the Tokugawa shoguns after 1636, which bottled up the brains of the Japanese through more rigorous control than has ever been established elsewhere over civilized people. The field psychological warfare of the Machus, who conquered China against odds running as much as 400 to 1 against them, and who used terror as a means of nullifying Chinese superiority. The propaganda of the European feudal classes against the peasant revolts, which identified the peasants with filth, anarchy, murder, and cruelty. The Inquisition, considered as a psychological warfare facility of the Spanish Empire, the agitational practices of the French revolutionaries, early uses of rockets and balloons for psychological effect, the beginnings of leaflet printing as an adjunct to field operations. Such a list just begins to touch on subjects which can and should be investigated either as staff studies or by civilian historians. Collection of the materials and framing of sound doctrines for psychological warfare are no minor task. The American Revolution in the American Revolution, psychological warfare played a very important role. The Whig campaign of propaganda, which led up to colonial defiance of Britain, was energetic and expert in character, and the very opening of hostilities was marked by passionate appeals to the civilian population in the form of handbills. The American forces at the Battle of Bunker Hill used one of the earliest versions of frontline combat propaganda. The appeal was as direct as could be wished. Artful use was made of the sharp class distinctions then existing between British officers and enlisted men. Fear was exploited as an aid to persuasion. The language was pointed. Even in our own time, the Bunker Hill propaganda leaflet stands as a classic example of how to do good field propaganda. The Americans made extensive use of the press. When the newspaper proprietors veered too far to the loyalist side, they were warned to keep a more patriotic line. If, in the face of counter-threats from the loyalists, the newspaper threatened going out of business altogether, it was warned that suspension of publication would be taken as treason to America. The Whigs, before hostilities, and their successors, the patriots of the war period, showed a keen interest in keeping the press going and in making sure that their side of the story got out and got circulated rapidly. In intimidation and control of the press, they far outdistanced the British, whose papers circulated chiefly within the big cities held as British citadels throughout the war. Political reasoning, economic arguments, allegations concerning the course of the war, and atrocity stories all played a role. George Washington himself, as commander of the Continental Forces, showed a keen interest in war propaganda and in his just, moderate political and military measures provided a policy base from which patriot propagandists could operate. Some wars are profoundly affected by a book written on one side or the other. The American Revolutionary War was one of these. Thomas Paine's Common Sense, issued as a widely sold series of pamphlets, swept American opinion like wildfire. It stated some of the fundamentals of American thinking and put its bold but reasonable revolutionary case in such simple terms that even conservatives in the Patriot group could not resist using it for propaganda purposes. Common Sense has become a classic of American literature, but it has its place in history, too, as the book that won the war. Other pamphleteers, with the redoubtable Sam Adams in the lead, also did well. American experience in the Mexican War was less glorious. The Mexicans waged psychological warfare against us with considerable effect, ending up with traitor American artillerymen dealing out heavy murder to the American troops outside Mexico City. Historians in both countries gloss over the treason and subversion which occurred on each side. In the Civil War... Psychological warfare was practiced by both Lincoln and the Confederacy in establishing propaganda instrumentalities in England and on the continent of Europe. The northern use of Negro troops, which was followed at the end of the war by the Confederate plans for raising Negro troops, did not become the major propaganda issue it might have because of the community of feeling on the two sides 
indecision on each side as to the purpose of the war, apart from the basic issue of union or disunion, and the persistence of politics as usual both north and south of the battle line. Boers and Burmese In the latter part of the 19th century, two sets of British wars indicate the effect psychological warfare can play. The British conquered both Burma and the Boers. The Burmese were more numerous, had the larger country, and, if they had leadership comparable to the Japanese leadership of the time, could have developed a larger military potential. But Burma was conquered by the British in a final war which went on quietly and ingloriously. No nation came to their aid. They did not even get a chance to surrender. The British simply ended the war in the middle by announcing the end of the Burmese government and by making a one-sided declaration that Burma was annexed to the Empire of India. The political death of Burma occurred on 1 January 1886, but the event has been forgotten. The Boers, on the other hand, made a stir throughout the world. They got in touch with Germans, Irish, Americans, French, Dutch, and anybody else who might criticize Britain. They stated their case loudly and often. They waged commando warfare, adding the word commando to international military parlance and sent small units deep into the British rear, setting off a mad uproar and making the world press go crazy with excitement. When they finally gave in, it was on reasonable terms for themselves. They left the British with an internationally blackened eye. Nobody remembered the Burmese. Everybody remembered the Boers. The Boers used every means they could think of. They did everything they could. They even captured Winston Churchill. These examples may show that the military role of propaganda and related operations is not as obscure or intangible as it may have seemed. They cannot be considered history, but must be regarded as a plea for the writing of history. More recent experience is another question, and involves tracing the doctrines pertaining to psychological warfare, which have now become established military procedure in the modern armies. End of section 2. Section 3 of Psychological Warfare this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Psychological Warfare by Paul M. A. Leinberger Chapter 2a The Function of Psychological Warfare, Part 1 Psychological warfare in the broad sense consists of the application of parts of the science called psychology to the conduct of war. In the narrow sense, psychological warfare comprises the use of propaganda against an enemy, together with such military operational measures as may supplement the propaganda. Propaganda may be described in turn as organized persuasion by nonviolent means. War itself may be considered to be, among other things, a violent form of persuasion. Thus, if an American fire raid burns up a Japanese city, the burning is calculated to dissuade the Japanese from further warfare by denying the Japanese further physical means of war, and by simultaneously hurting them enough to cause surrender. If, after the fire raid, we drop leaflets telling them to surrender, the propaganda can be considered an extension of persuasion, less violent this time, and usually less effective, but nevertheless an integral part of the single process of making the enemy stop fighting. Neither warfare nor psychology is a new subject. Each is as old as man. Warfare, being the more practical and plain subject, has a far older written history. This is especially the case since much of what is now called psychology was formerly studied under the heading of religion, ethics, literature, politics, or medicine. Modern psychological warfare has become self-conscious in using modern scientific psychology as a tool. In World War II, the enemies of the United States were more fanatical than the people and leaders of the United States. The consequence was that the Americans could use and apply any expedient psychological weapon which either science or our version of common sense provided. We did not have to square it with emperor myths, the Fuhrer principle, or some other rigid fanatical philosophy. The enemy enjoyed the positive advantage of having an indoctrinated army and people. We enjoyed the countervailing advantage of having skeptical people, with no inward theology that hampered our propaganda operations. 
It is no negligible matter to be able to use the latest findings of psychological science in a swift, bold manner. The scientific nature of our psychology puts us ahead of opponents wrapped up in dogmatism, who must check their propaganda against such articles of faith as Aryan racialism or the Hegelian philosophy of history. Psychological Warfare as a Branch of Psychology Good propaganda can be conducted by persons with no knowledge of formal psychology. The human touch, the inventive mind, the forceful appeal, things such as these appear in the writings of gifted persons. Thomas Paine never read a word of Freud or Pavlov, yet Paine's arguments during the Revolutionary War played subtly on every appeal which a modern psychologist could catalog. But war cannot, in modern times, assume a statistical expectation of talent. Psychology makes it possible for the able but ordinary statesman or officer to calculate his persuasion systematically and to obtain by planning those results which greater men might hit upon by genius. What can psychology do for warfare? In the first place, the psychologist can bring to the attention of the soldier those elements of the human mind which are usually kept out of sight. He can show how to convert lust into resentment, individual resourcefulness into mass cowardice, friction into distrust, prejudice into fury. He does so by going down to the unconscious mind for his source materials. During World War II, the fact that Chinese babies remain unimpeded while they commit a nuisance, while Japanese babies are either intercepted or punished if they make a mess in the wrong place, was found to be of significant importance in planning psychological warfare. See below, page 154. In the second place, the psychologist can set up techniques for finding out how the enemy really does feel. Some of the worst blunders of history have arisen from miscalculation of the enemy's state of mind. By using the familiar statistical and questionnaire procedures, the psychologist can quiz a small cross-section of enemy prisoners and from the results estimate the mentality of an entire enemy theater of war at a given period. If he does not have the prisoners handy, he can accomplish much the same end by an analysis of the news and propaganda which the enemy authorities transmit to their own troops and people. By establishing enemy opinion and morale factors, he can hazard a reasoned forecast as to how the enemy troops will behave under specific conditions. In the third place, the psychologist can help the military psychological warfare operator by helping him maintain his sense of mission and of proportion. The deadliest danger of propaganda consists of it being issued by the propagandist for his own edification. This sterile and ineffectual amusement can disguise the complete failure of the propaganda as propaganda. There is a genuine pleasure in talking back, particularly to an enemy. The propagandist, especially in wartime, is apt to tell the enemy what he thinks of him, or to deride enemy weaknesses. But to have told the Nazis, for example, you Germans are a pack of murderous baboons, and your Hitler is a demented oaf, your women are slobs, your children are halfwits, your literature is gibberish, and your cooking is garbage, and so on, would have stiffened the German will to fight. The propagandist must tell the enemy those things which the enemy will heed. He must keep his private emotionalism out of the operation. The psychologist can teach the propaganda operator how to be objective, systematic, cold. For combat operations, it does not matter how much a division commander may dislike the enemy. For psychological warfare purposes, he must consider how to persuade them, even though he may privately thirst for their destruction. The indulgence of hatred is not a working part of the soldier's mission. To some it may be helpful, to others not. The useful mission consists solely of making the enemy stop fighting by combat or other means. But when the soldier turns to propaganda, he may need the advice of a psychologist in keeping his own feelings out of it. Finally, the psychologist can prescribe media, radio, leaflets, loudspeakers, whispering agents, returned enemy soldiers, and so forth. He can indicate when and when not to use any given medium. He can, in conjunction with operations and intelligence officers, plan the full use of all available psychological resources. He can coordinate the timing of propaganda with military, economic, or political situations. The psychologist does not have to be present in person to give this advice. He does not have to be a man with an M.D. or a Ph.D. and years of postgraduate training. He can be present in the manuals he writes, in the indoctrination courses for psychological warfare officers he sets up, in the current propaganda line he dictates by radio. It is useful to have him in the field, particularly at the higher command headquarters, but he is not indispensable. The psychologist in person can be dispensed with. The methods of scientific psychology cannot. Further on throughout this book, Reference will be made to current psychological literature. 
The general history of psychology is described in readable terms in Gregory Zilborg and George W. Henry, A History of Medical Psychology, New York, 1941, and in Lowell S. Selling, Men Against Madness, New York, 1940, Cheap Edition, 1942. Propaganda can be conducted by rule of thumb, but only a genius can make it work well by playing his hunches. It can become true psychological warfare, scientific in spirit, and developed as a teachable skill, only by having its premises clearly stated, its mission defined, its instruments put in systematic readiness, and its operations subject to at least partial check only by the use of techniques borrowed from science. Of all the sciences, psychology is the nearest, though anthropology, sociology, political science, economics, area studies, and other specialties all have something to contribute, but it is psychology which indicates the need of the others. Psychological Warfare as a Part of War An infantry officer does not need to study the whole nature of war in order to find his own job. Tradition, military skill, discipline, sound doctrine, these have done the job for him. Sun Tzu, Vigidius, Frederick, Clausewitz, and a host of lesser writers on war have established the place of combat in war and have appraised its general character. How much the traditional doctrines may be altered in the terrible light of atomic explosion, no one knows. But though the weapons are novel, the wielders of the weapons will still be men. The motives and weaknesses within war remain ancient and human, however novel and dreadful the mechanical expedients adopted to express them. Warfare as a whole is traditionally well-defined, and psychological warfare can be understood only in relation to the whole process. It is no mere tool to be used on special occasion. It has become a pervasive element in the military and security situation of every power on earth. Psychological warfare is a part of war. The simplest, plainest thing which can be said of war, any sort of war, anywhere, any time, is that it is an official fight between men. Combat, killing, and even large-scale group struggle are known elsewhere in the animal kingdom, but war is not. All sorts of creatures fight, but only men declare, wage, and terminate war, and they do so only against other men. Formally, war may be defined as the reciprocal application of violence by public armed bodies. If it is not reciprocal, it is not war. The killing of persons who did not defend themselves is not war but slaughter, massacre, or punishment. If the bodies involved are not public, their violence is not war. Even our enemies in World War II were relatively careful about this distinction because they did not know how soon or easily a violation of the rules might be scored against them. To be public, the combatants need not be legal, that is, constitutionally set up. It suffices, according to international usage, for the fighters to have a reasonable minimum of numbers, some kind of identification, and a purpose which is political. If you shoot your neighbor, you will be committing mere murder. But if you gather twenty or thirty friends together, tie a red handkerchief around the left arm of each man, announce that you are out to overthrow the government of the United States, and then shoot your neighbor as a counter-revolutionary impediment to the new order of things, you can have the satisfaction of having waged war. In practical terms, this means that you will be put to death for treason and rebellion, not merely for murder. Finally, war must be violent. According to the law of modern states, all the way from Iceland to the Yemen, economic, political, or moral pressure is not war. War is the legalization in behalf of the state of things which no individual may lawfully do in time of peace. As a matter of fact, even in time of war, you cannot kill the enemy unless you do so on behalf of the state. If you had shot a Japanese creditor of yours privately, or even shot a Japanese soldier when you yourself were out of uniform, you might properly and lawfully have been put to death for murder, either by our courts or by the enemies. This is among the charges which recur in the war trials. The Germans and Japanese killed persons whom even war did not entitle them to kill. The governments of the modern world are jealous of their own monopoly of violence. War is the highest exercise of that violence, and modern war is no simple reversion to savagery. The general staffs would not be needed if war were only an uncomplicated orgy of homicide, a mere getting mad and throat-cutting season in the life of man. Quite to the contrary, modern war, as a function of modern society, reflects the institutional political complexity from which it comes. A modern battle is a formal, ceremonialized, and technically intricate operation, you must kill just the right people, in just the right way, with the right timing, in the proper place, for avowed purposes. Otherwise, you make a mess of the whole show, and, 
What is worse, you lose. Why must you fight just so and so, there and not here, now and not then? The answer is simple. You are fighting against men. Your purpose in fighting is to make them change their minds. It is figuratively true to say that the war we have just won was a peculiar kind of advertising campaign designed to make the Germans and Japanese like us and our way of doing things. They did not like us much, but we gave them alternatives far worse than liking us so that they became peaceful. Sometimes individuals will be unpersuadable. Then they must be killed or neutralized by other purely physical means, such as isolation or imprisonment. Some Nazis, perhaps including the Fuhrer himself, found our world repellent or incomprehensible and died because they could not make themselves surrender. In the Pacific, many Japanese had to be killed before they became acceptable to us. But such is man that most individuals will stop fighting at some point short of extinction. That point is reached when one of two things happens. Either the defeated people may lose their sense of organization, fail to decide on leaders and methods, and give up because they can no longer fight as a group. This happened to the American Southerners in April 1865. The president and cabinet of the Confederate States of America got on the train at Richmond. The men who got off farther down the line were refugees. Something happened to them and to the people about them so that Mr. Davis no longer thought of himself as President Davis, and other people no longer accepted his commands. This almost happened in Germany in 1945, except for Admiral Dönitz. Or, the defeated people can retain their sense of organization and can use their political organization for the purpose of getting in touch with the enemy, arranging the end of the war, and preparing through organized means to comply with the wishes of the conquerors. That happened when Britain acknowledged American independence, when the Boers recognized British sovereignty, when Finland signed what Russia had dictated, and when Japan gave up. Sometimes these things are mixed. The people might wish to make peace, but may find that their government is not recognized by the enemy. Or the victors may think that they have smashed the enemy government when the new organization is simply the old one under a slightly different name, but with the old leaders and the old ideas still prevailing. It is plain that whatever happens, wars are fought to effect a psychological change in the antagonist. They are then fought for a psychological end unless they are wars of extermination. These are rare. The United States could not find a people on the face of the earth whose ideas and language were unknown to all Americans. Where there is a chance of communication, there is always the probability that one of the antagonistic organizations, governments, which have already cooperated to the extent of meeting one another's wishes to fight, will subsequently cooperate on terms of primary advantage to the victors. Since the organizations comprise human beings with human ways of doing things, the change must take place in the minds of those specific individuals who operate the existing government, or in the minds of enough other people for that government to be overthrown. The fact that war is waged against the minds, not the bodies, of the enemy is attested by the comments of military writers of all periods. The dictum of Karl von Clausewitz that war is politics continued by other means is simply the modern expression of a truth recognized since antiquity, War is a kind of persuasion, uneconomical, dangerous, and unpleasant, but effective when all else fails. End of section 3. Read by Eli Bishop, San Francisco, March 7, 2021. Section 4 of Psychological Warfare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Psychological Warfare by Paul M. A. Leinbarger Chapter 2b The Function of Psychological Warfare Part 2 Ideology An ideology is a system of deep-rooted beliefs about fundamental questions in human life and affairs. Footnote In his The Political Doctrines of Sun Yat-sen, Baltimore, 1937, page 17 and following, this author attempted to present some of the relationships of ideology to other methods of social control, and in connection with that enterprise was furnished by the philosopher A. O. Lovejoy with a definition of ideology more systematic and more elaborate than the one used here. End footnote. Ideology also plays a part in psychological warfare. A difference in beliefs which does not touch fundamentals is commonly termed a difference of opinion, 
You may believe in high tariffs, and I in no tariff. You may believe in one world, I may not. You may support Republicans, I Democrats. Despite these differences, both of us can still believe in dollars as a method of paying income, in marriage as a system of setting up the family, in private property for most goods, industrial or personal, in the government of the United States, in majority rule, in democratic elections, in free speech, and so on. If our difference of opinion is so inclusive that we can agree on nothing political, our differences have gone from mere opinion into the depths of ideology. Here the institutional framework is affected. You and I would not want to live in the same city. We could not feel safe in one another's presence. Each would be afraid of the effect which the other might have on the morals of the community. If I were a Nazi and you a Democrat, you would not like the idea of my children living next door to yours. If I believed that you were a good enough creature poor deluded devil, but that you were not fit to vote, scarcely to be trusted with property, not to be trusted as an army officer, and generally subversive and dangerous, you would find it hard to get along with me. It was not metaphysical theories that made Protestants and Catholics burn one another's adherents as heretics in early wars. In the 17th century, the Protestants knew perfectly well what would happen if the Catholics got the upper hand, and the Catholics knew what would happen if the Protestants came to power. In each case, the new rulers, fearful that they might be overthrown, would have suppressed the former rulers and would have used the rack, the stake, and the dungeon as preventatives of counter-revolution. Freedom cannot be accorded to persons outside the ideological pale. If an antagonist is not going to respect your freedom of speech, your property, and your personal safety, then you are not obliged to respect his. The absolute minimum of any ideology is the assumption that each person living in an ideologically uniform area what the Nazi general Haushofer following Rudolf Kjellin would call a geopsychic zone, will respect the personal safety, etc., of other individuals in the same area. In our own time, we have seen Spaniards get more and more mistrustful of one another until years of ferocious civil war were necessary before one of the two factions could feel safe. Spain went from republican unity to dictatorial unity in four years. In neither case was the unity perfect, but it was enough to give one government and one educational system control of most of the country. The other countries of the world vary in the degree of their ideological cohesion. Scandinavia seemed serene until the German invasion brought to the surface cleavages, latent and unseen, which made quisling a quisling. Russia, Italy, Germany, and various other states have made a fetish of their ideologies and have tried to define orthodoxy and heresy in such a way as to be sure of the mentality of all their people. But most of the countries of the world suffer from a considerable degree of ideological confusion, of instability of basic beliefs, without having any immediate remedy at hand or even seeking one. Education Education is a process usually institutional, by which the people of a given area transmit to their successors, their own children, the purely practical information needed in modern life, together with a lot of other teachings designed to make good men and women, good citizens, good Christians or other believers of them. In the democratic states, this process is ideological only in some parts of the curriculum. Elsewhere in the field of opinions, the government seeks to control ideology only negatively through laws concerning obscenity, blasphemy, subversion, and so on. In the states which are ideologically self-conscious and anxious to promote a fixed mentality, the process of education is combined with agitation and regulation, so that the entire population lives under conditions approximating the psychological side of war. Heretics are put to death or are otherwise silenced. Historical materialism and the Marxian objectivity, or the folk, or fascismo, or Yamato Damashi, or New Democracy, is set up as the touchstone of all good and evil, even in unrelated fields of activity. Education and propaganda merge into everlasting indoctrination. And when such states go to war against states which do not have propaganda machinery, the more liberal states are at a disadvantage for sheer lack of practice in the administrative and mechanical aspects of propaganda. Education is to psychological warfare what a glacier is to an avalanche. The mind is to be in both cases captured, but the speed and techniques differ. Salesmanship Salesmanship is related to psychological warfare. Propaganda is often compared to another art of our time, industrialized salesmanship through mass printing and telecommunications. This bad parallel was responsible for much of the inept American propaganda overseas in the early part of the war. Some of our propagandists had a fundamental misconception of the nature of wartime propaganda. 
Allegiance in war is a matter of ideology, not of opinion. A man cannot want his own side to lose while remaining a good citizen in all other respects. The desire for defeat, even the acceptance of defeat, is of tragic importance to any responsible sane person. A German who wanted the Reich to be overthrown was a traitor to Germany, just as any American who wished us to pull out of the war and exterminate American Jews would have been a traitor to his own country. These decisions cannot be compared with the choice of a toothpaste, a deodorant, or a cigarette. Advertising succeeds in peacetime precisely because it does not matter. The choice which the consumer makes is of slight importance to himself, even though it is of importance to the seller of the product. A dromedary cigarette and an old coin cigarette are both cigarettes. The man is going to smoke one anyhow. It does not matter so much to him. If dromedaries are associated in his mind with mere tobacco, while old coins call up unaccountable but persistent memories of actresses' legs, he may buy old coins. The physical implements of propaganda were at hand in 1941 to 1942, but we Americans had become so accustomed to their use for trivial purposes that much of our wartime propaganda was conducted in terms of salesmanship. In a sense, however, salesmanship does serve the military purpose of accustoming the audience to appeals both visual and auditory. The consequence is that competing outside propaganda can reach the domestic American audience only in competition with the local advertising. It is difficult for foreign competition to hold attention amid an almost limitless number of professionally competent commercial appeals. A communist or fascist party cannot get public attention in the United States by the simple expedient of a mass meeting of 300 persons, or by the use of a few dozen posters in a metropolitan area. Before the political propagandist can get the public attention, he must edge his media past the soap operas, the soft drink advertisements, the bathing beauties advertising Pennsylvania crude or bright leaf tobacco, the consequence is that outside propaganda either fails to get much public attention, or else camouflages itself to resemble and to exploit existing media. Clamorous salesmanship deadens the American citizen to his own government's propaganda, and may to a certain extent lower his civic alertness, but at the same time salesmanship has built up a psychological great wall, which excludes foreign or queer appeals, and which renders the United States almost impervious to sudden ideological penetration from overseas. Psychological Warfare and Public Relations Psychological warfare and public relations are different in the direction in which they apply. Psychological warfare is designed to reach the enemy. Public relations is designed primarily to reach the home audience. Both reach neutrals, sometimes confusingly much. In some nations, the two functions were combined in a single instrumentality, as in the Japanese Joho Kyoku, see page 184 below. The American Army and Navy Traditions of Public Relations are based on the ideas that the news should be as complete as military security may permit, that it should be delivered speedily and interestingly, that it should enhance the confidence of the people in their armed services, and that its tenor, no less than its contents, should not aid the enemy morale. These ideas are justified in terms of sound newspaper practice, but they can lead to a weak psychological warfare position when we must deal with an inventive and enterprising enemy. It is not possible to separate public relations from psychological warfare when they use the same media. During World War II, the Office of War Information prepared elaborate watertight plans for processing war news to different audiences. At their most unfortunate, such plans seemed to assume that the enemy would listen only to the OWI stations, and that the American public releases issued from Army and Navy would go forth to the world without being noted by the enemy. If a radio in New York or San Francisco presented a psychological warfare presentation of a stated battle or engagement, while the theater or fleet public relations officer presented a very different view, the enemy press and radio were free to choose the weaker of the two, or to quote the two American sources against each other. Psychological Warfare and Morale Services All modern armies, in addition to public relations, also employ morale services facilities, officers or employees whose function it is to supply troops with entertainment, educational materials, political indoctrination, and other attention-getting materials. Morale services are the prime overt defense against enemy psychological warfare, and by a program of keeping the attention of the troops can prevent the enemy from establishing effective communication. During World War II, the Armed Forces Radio Service of the United States established global radio service for Americans and incidentally turned out material of top importance to a United States propaganda. 
naturally, enemy and allied peoples would pay more serious heed to communications from Americans to Americans than they would to materials which they knew had been concocted for themselves. The American morale services in the last war indignantly rejected the notion that they were a major propaganda facility, rightfully insisting that their audience counted on getting plain information, plain news, and plain education without ulterior propaganda content. The fact that in a theater of war, all communication has propaganda effect was not always taken into account, and only on one or two critical occasions was there coordination of stress and timing. It must be said, however, that propaganda by any other name is just as sweet, and that the conviction of the propagandist that he is not a propagandist can be a real asset. Morale services provided the American forces with news, entertainment, and educational facilities. Most of the time, these morale facilities had huge parasitical audiences, the global kibitzers who listened to our broadcasts, read our magazines, bought our paper-bound books on the black markets. It was a happy day for Lienta University at Kunming, Yunnan, when the American information and education setup began shipping in current literature. The long-isolated Chinese college students found themselves deluged with good American books. The morale services lost the opportunity to ram home to their GI plus foreign audience some of the more effective points of American psychological warfare, but they gained as propagandists by not admitting even to themselves that they were propagandists. Since the United States has no serious inward psychological cleavages, the general morale services function coordinated automatically with the psychological warfare function, simply because both were produced by disciplined patriotic Americans. In the experience of the German and Soviet armies, morale services were parts of a coordinated propaganda machine which included psychological warfare, public relations, general news, and public education. In the Japanese armies, morale services were directed most particularly to physical and sentimental comforts, edible treats, picture postcards, good luck items, which bore little immediate relation to news and less to formal propaganda. Related Civilian Activities In a free nation, the big media of communication will remain uncoordinated even in time of war. The press, the stage, motion pictures, part of the radio, book publishing, and so on will continue. Psychological warfare has, in such private facilities, a constantly refreshed source of new material for news or for features. By a sparing but well-considered liaison with censorship, psychological warfare can affect negative control of non-governmental materials, and can prevent the most overt forms of enemy propaganda from circulating on the home front. News becomes propaganda when the person issuing it has some purpose in doing so. Even if the reporters, editors, writers involved do not have propaganda aims, the original source of the news, the person giving the interview, the friends of the correspondents, etc., may give the news to the press with definite purposes in mind. It is not unknown for government officials to shift their rivalries from the conference room to the press, and to provide on-the-record or off-the-record materials which are in effect ad hoc propaganda campaigns. A psychological warfare campaign must be planned on the assumption that these civilian facilities will remain in being and that they will be uncoordinated. The plan must allow an advance for interference, sometimes of a very damaging kind, which comes from private operations in the same field. The combat officers can get civilian cars off the road when moving armored forces into battle, but the psychological warfare officer has the difficult task of threading his way through civilian radio and other communication traffic over which he has no control. Psychological warfare is also closely related to diplomacy. It is an indispensable ingredient of strategic deception. In the medical field, psychological warfare can profit by the experiences of the medical corps. Whenever a given condition arises among troops on one side, comparable troops on the other are apt to be facing the same condition. If the Americans are bitten by insects, the same insects will bite the enemy. And enemy soldiers can be told how much better the American facilities are for insect repulsion. Finally, Psychological warfare is intimately connected with the processing of prisoners of war and with the protection of one's own captured personnel. Psychological warfare is a field to itself, although it touches on many sciences and overlaps with all the other functions of war. It is generally divisible into three topics, the general scheme of psychological warfare, the detection and analysis of foreign psychological warfare operations, and the tactical or immediate conduct of psychological warfare. Sections of this book deal with each of these in turn. In each case, it must be remembered, however, that psychological warfare is not a closed operation which can be conducted in private, but that, to be effective, 
psychological warfare output must be a part of the everyday living and fighting of the audiences to which it is directed. End of section 4. Read by Eli Bishop, San Francisco, March 7, 2021. Section 5 of Psychological Warfare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Psychological Warfare by Paul M. A. Linebarger. Definition of Psychological Warfare. Psychological warfare seeks to win military gains without military force. In some periods of history, the use of psychological warfare has been considered unsportsmanlike. It is natural for the skilled soldier to rely on weapons rather than on words, and after World War I, there was a considerable reluctance to look further into that weapon, propaganda, which Ludendorff himself considered to be the most formidable achievement of the Allies. Nevertheless, World War II brought a large number of American officers, both Army and Navy, into the psychological warfare field. Some of the best work was done without civilian aid or sponsorship. Captain J. A. Burden on Guadalcanal wrote his own leaflets, prepared his own public address scripts, and did his own distributing from a borrowed marine plane, skimming the treetops until the Japanese shot him down into the surf. He may have heard of OWI at the time, but the civilians at OWI had not heard of him. Psychological warfare has become familiar. The problems of psychological warfare for the future are problems of how better to apply it, not of whether to apply it. Accordingly, it is to be defined more for the purpose of making it convenient and operable than for the purpose of finding out what it is. The whole world found out by demonstration during World Wars I and II. Psychological warfare is not defined as such in the dictionary. Definition is open game. There are three ways in which psychological warfare and military propaganda can be defined. First, by deciding what we're talking about in a given situation, book, conversation, or study course. Second, by determining the responsibilities and authority involved in a given task. Or third, by stating the results which are believed to be accomplishable by the designated means. Plainly, the staff officer needs a different definition from the one used by the combat officer. The political leader would use a broader definition than the one required by soldiers. The fanatic would have his own definition, or more probably two of them. One, such as promoting democracy or awakening the masses for his own propaganda, and another, such as spreading lies, corrupting the press, or giving opiates to the people for antagonistic propaganda. Definition is not something which can be done once and forever for any military term, since military operations change, and since military definitions are critically important for establishing a chain of command. The first method of definition is satisfactory for research purposes. It may help break a politico-military situation down into understandable components. The second method, the organizational, is usable when there exists organization with which to demonstrate the definition, such as propaganda is what OWI and OSS perform. The third method, the operational or historical, is useful in evaluating situations after the time for action has passed. Thus one may say, this is what the Germans did when they thought they were conducting propaganda. Since the first lesson of all propaganda is reasoned disbelief, it would be sad and absurd for anyone to believe propaganda about propaganda. The propaganda boys in every army and government are experts at building up favorable cases, and they would be unusual men indeed if they failed to work up a fine account of their own performance. Propaganda cannot be given fair measurement by the claims made for it, 
it requires judicious proportioning to the military operations of which it is, in wartime, normally a part. Broad and Narrow Definitions The term propaganda springs from the name of that department of the Vatican, which had the duty of propagating the faith. A multitude of definitions is available. Among Americans, Walter Lippmann, Harold Laswell, and Leonard W. Dube have done some of the most valuable critical, analytical, and historical writing. But a host of other scholars have also made contributions, some of them works of very real importance. For the purposes of explaining what this book is about, propaganda may be defined as follows. Propaganda consists of the planned use of any form of communication designed to affect the minds, emotions, and action of a given group for a specific purpose. This may be called the broad definition, since it would include an appeal to buy antident toothpaste, to believe in the theological principle of complete immersion, to buy flowers for uncles on Uncle's Day, to slap the Japs, to fight fascism at home, or to smell nice under the arms. All of this is propaganda by the broad definition. Since war and navy department usage never put the Corps of Chaplains, the PX system, the safety campaigns, or the anti-VD announcements under the rubric of propaganda, it might be desirable to narrow down the definition to exclude those forms of propaganda designed to effect private or non-political purposes and make the definition read, Propaganda consists of the planned use of any form of public or mass-produced communication designed to affect the minds and emotions of a given group for a specific public purpose, whether military, economic, or political. This may be termed the everyday definition of propaganda, as it is used in most of the civilian college textbooks. For military purposes, however, it is necessary to trim down the definition in one more direction, applying it strictly against the enemy, and making it read, Military propaganda consists of the planned use of any form of communication designed to affect the minds and emotions of a given enemy, neutral or friendly foreign group, for a specific strategic or tactical purpose. Note that if the communication is not planned, it cannot be called propaganda. If a lieutenant stuck his head out of a tank turret and yelled at some Japs in a cave, Come on out of there, you blankety blanks, or we'll blank you all to blank, you etc. The communication may or may not work, but in the technical sense, it is not propaganda, because the lieutenant did not employ that form of communication planned and designed to affect the minds or emotions of the Japanese in the cave. Had the lieutenant given the matter thought, and had he said in the Japanese language, enemy persons forthwith commanded to cease resistance, otherwise American army regrets inescapable consequences attendant upon operation of flamethrower, the remark would have been closer to propaganda. Furthermore, propaganda must have a known purpose. This element must be included in the definition. A great deal of communication, both in wartime and in peacetime, arises because of the pleasure which it gives to the utterer, and not because of the result it is supposed to effect in the hearers. Sending the Japanese cartoons of themselves, mocking the German language, calling Italians by familiar but inelegant names, such communications cropped up during the war. The senders got a lot of fun out of the message, but the purpose was unintelligently considered. The actual effect of the messages was to annoy the enemy, stiffening his will to resist. Screams of rage had a place in primitive war. In modern military propaganda, they are too expensive a luxury to be tolerated. Planned annoyance of the enemy does, of course, have its role, a minor, rare, and special one. Psychological warfare is simple enough to understand if it is simply regarded as application of propaganda to the purposes of war, as in the following definition. Psychological warfare 
comprises the use of propaganda against an enemy, together with such other operational measures of a military, economic, or political nature as may be required to supplement propaganda. In this sense, psychological warfare is a known operation which was carried on very successfully during World War II under the authority of the Combined and Joint Chiefs of Staff. It is in this sense that some kind of a psychological warfare unit was developed in every major theater of war, and that the American military assimilated the doctrines of psychological warfare. However, this is only one of several ways of using the term psychological warfare. There is, in particular, one other sense, in which the term became unpleasantly familiar during the German conquest of Europe, the sense of warfare psychologically waged. In the American use of the term, psychological warfare was the supplementing of normal military operations by the use of mass communications. In the Nazi sense of the term, it was the calculation and execution of both political and military strategy on studied psychological grounds. For the American uses, it was modification of traditional warfare by the effective, generous use of a new weapon. For the Germans, it involved a transformation of the process of war itself. This is an important enough distinction to warrant separate consideration. Warfare psychologically waged. Various labels were devised to name Hitler's queer, terrifying strategy for the period 1936 to 1941. One writer, Edmund Taylor, called it the strategy of terror in a book by that name, Boston, 1940, and also the war of nerves. Another, Ladislas Farago, a political journalist who started out as an authority on the Axis fifth column in the Near East and ended up in American naval psychological warfare planning, put forth a book called German Psychological Warfare, a Critical, Annotated, and Comprehensive Survey and Bibliography, New York, 1941, which digested hundreds of German works on topics pertaining to psychology and war, much of this material concerned personnel practices, psychosomatic medicine, and other non-propaganda aspects of psychology. But the book as a whole was an impressive demonstration of how much the Germans had done to make their war scientific. Other articles and books on the Nazi inventions followed in rapid succession. After the excitement had died down, it was found that the novelty of the German war effort lay in two special fields. First, the perfect or perfect-seeming synchronizing of political, propaganda, subversive, and military efforts. Second, the use of the findings of modern psychology for the attainment of military goals. The Germans set the pace in the pre-war and early war period and United Nations psychological warfare tried to keep up, even though the two efforts were different in scope and character. In conquering Europe, the German staff apparently used opinion analysis. Much of this analysis has turned out to have been superb guesswork. At the time, it looked as though the Nazis might have found some scientific formula for determining just when a nation would cave in. In the conduct of war, the Germans waged a rapid war, which was industrially, psychologically, and militarily sound as long as it worked. Their diplomacy of dramatic intimidation used the war threat to its full value, with the result that the Czechoslovaks surrendered the Sudetenland without a shot and then submitted themselves to tyranny half a year later. The Germans wrung every Fennig's worth of advantage out of threatening to start war, and when they did start war, they deliberately tried to make it look as horrible as it was. The psychologists had apparently taught the German political and military intelligence people how to get workable opinion forecasts. 
German analysis of anti-Nazi counter-propaganda was excellent. Add all this to strategy and field operations, which were incontestably brilliant, the effect was not that of mere war, but of a new kind of war, the psychological war. The formula for the psychological war is not to be found in the books of the psychologists, but in the writings of the constitutional lawyers. The totality of war is a result of dictatorship within government. Total coordination results from total authority. The secret weapon of the Germans lay in the power which the Germans had openly given Hitler, and in his use of that power in a shrewd, ruthless, effective way. The Führer led the experts, not the experts the Führer. If the Germans surprised the world by the cold calculation of their timing, it was not because they had psychological brain trusters inventing a new warfare, but because they had a grim political freak commanding the total resources of the Reich. Even in wartime, no American president has ever exercised the authority which Hitler used in time of peace. American cabinet members, military and naval figures, press commentators and all sorts of people are free to kibitz, to offer their own opinions, to bring policy into the light of day. That is as it should be. The same factors which made psychological warfare possible in the beginning of the war were the ones which led to Germany's futile and consummate ruin in 1944-45. to Excessive authority, an uninformed public, centralized propaganda, and secret political planning. That kind of psychological warfare, war tuned to the needs of fanatically sought lusts for power, war coordinated down to the nth degree, waged in the light of enemy opinion and aiming at the political and moral weaknesses of the enemy, is not possible within the framework of a democracy. Even from within Imperial Japan, Pearl Harbor had to be waged secretly as a purely naval operation. Those Japanese who would have told the board of field marshals and fleet admirals that an unannounced attack was the best way to unify all American factions against Japan were obviously not brought into the planning of the Pearl Harbor raid. The Japanese still had too much of their old parliamentary spirit left over, as Ambassador Grew's reports show. The military had to outsmart the home public, along with the foreigners. In the Western dictatorships, the home public is watched by elite troops, secret police, party cells, and is made the subject of psychological warfare along with the victim nations. Hitler could turn the war spirit on and off. The Japanese did not dare do so to any effective extent. Psychological warfare was too dictatorial a measure even for pre-war Japan. It is therefore permanently out of reach of the authorities of the United States. After war starts, we are capable of surprising the enemy with such things as incendiary raids, long-range bombers, and nuclear fission, but we cannot startle with the start of war. The United States is not now capable, and under the spirit of the Constitution can never be capable, of surprising an enemy by the timing of aggression. If the same were true of all other nations, peace would seem much nearer than it does. German psychological warfare, in the broad sense of warfare psychologically waged, depended more on political background than on psychological techniques. Disunity among the prospective victims, the complacence of powers not immediately affected, demonstration of new weapons through frightful applications, use of a dread of war to harness pacifism to appeasement, the lucky geographic position of Germany at the hub of European communications. Such factors made the German war of nerves seem new. Such psychological warfare is not apt to be successful elsewhere except for aggressions by dictatorships against democracies. Where the democracies are irritable, tough, and alert, it will not work at all. 
the psychological warfare which remains as a practical factor in war is therefore not the hitlerian war of nerves but the anglo-american application of propaganda means to pre-decided strategy let him who will advocate american use of the war of nerves he will not get far with commentators publishing his top-secret schedule of timing with legislators very properly catechizing him on international morality with members of his own organization publishing their memoirs or airing their squabbles right in the middle of the operation he would end up by amusing the enemy whom he started out to scare psychological warfare has its place in our military and political system but its place is a modest one and its methods are limited by our usages morality and law propaganda definitions propaganda has been defined it remains to distinguish some of the other technical and professional terms which apply in this field in operational terms propaganda can be distinguished by the consideration of five elements one source including media two time three audience four subject five mission these factors are given in approximate order of importance to the analyst and provide a good working breakdown for propaganda analysis when expert staffs are not available the five factors can be remembered by memorizing the initial letters in order s t a s m the last factor mission covers the presumed effect which the enemy seeks by dissemination of the item without going into the technique of field propaganda analysis described below it is useful to apply these analysis factors to the definition of some subordinate types of military propaganda source is the most important if the source is open and acknowledged the government issuing it is putting the propaganda on the record before the world and must therefore issue the propaganda with a certain amount of dignity and with an eye to the future if the source is faked then it is important for the government or army to make sure that the faking is a good job and that the propaganda cannot readily be traced back two very different techniques are employed open sources require responsible public officials preferably men with international reputations who will get the best effect from use of the name and facilities of the government use of an open source usually but not always implies belief of the disseminator in the veracity of his materials fabricated sources require persons adept at illicit imaginativeness impromptu forgery and general devilment combined with a strong sense of discipline and security the united states was so chary of mixing the two kinds of propaganda during world war ii that it operated them in different categories giving rise to the three following types white propaganda is issued from an acknowledged source usually a government or an agency of a government including military commands at various levels this type of propaganda is associated with overt psychological operations gray propaganda does not clearly identify any source black propaganda purports to emanate from a source other than the true one this type of propaganda is associated with covert psychological warfare operations white propaganda is shown in figure four which does everything possible to make the message the official message of the british and american governments figure four illustrates the pass which brought them in germans liked things done in an official and formal manner even in the midst of chaos catastrophe and defeat the allies obliged and gave the germans various forms of very official looking surrender passes of which this is one the original is printed in red and has banknote type engraving which makes it resemble a soap premium coupon western front nineteen forty four to forty five issued by Schaeff. 
End figure four. The border is done up in handsome banknote fashion. The great seals of the nations are handsomely displayed. The signatures of the commanding generals are shown as further attestation of the openness and good faith of the issuer of the propaganda. Figure 38 was also prepared by British American authority. It, too, had the job of making Germans surrender. Figure 38 illustrates black counter-propaganda. Seeing that the Germans had a good counter-propaganda medium, the Allies decided to use it themselves. They issued this counter-propaganda sheet, shown in original and facsimile in English. The blackness is not very black, since few Germans would consider this to be German in origin once they had read it. End figure 38. But in this case, nothing was done to make the British-American source evident. Indeed, every effort was made to hide the source, so that the German who read it would think that it came from within his own territory. The two different kinds of propaganda were both of them needed. Each supplemented the other, but they had to be kept apart as far as possible. In the field of radio, the difference between covert and overt was even more plain. During World War II, the ether over Europe was filled with appeals from radio stations both public and covert in character. The British spoke to the Germans over BBC, making no effort to conceal the fact that they were British. But they also spoke to the Germans over clandestine stations, which pretended to be freelancing Nazis, German army stations, or freedom group operations. The Germans, comparably, beamed official German news to the United States in English, but they also pretended to be Americans broadcasting from an isolationist radio in the American Midwest. In some cases, the belligerent powers used the identical radio transmission facilities for overt and covert propaganda. Radio Saipan, under the Americans, was, most of the time, the relay for the acknowledged San Francisco programs. Intermittently, OSS borrowed it, and it then became a Japanese station. Under such conditions, black radio cannot remain black very long. In terms of the timing, propaganda can be subdivided into two further categories, strategic and tactical. Strategic propaganda is conducted with no immediate effect in view. Its purpose is to wear down the enemy by psychological changes that may extend over months. Figure 19, warning the Germans of the remote future, is an example of this in leaflet form. Figure 19 illustrates propaganda against propaganda. As an occasional stunt, Propaganda is directed against propaganda. Hitler did so in his book, Mein Kampf. The leaflet, shown in the original and in facsimile, was used by the Allies on the Germans in the West. A German leaflet, addressed to their own troops, defensive propaganda, was picked up, X'd out, copied, and refuted. End figure 19. Tactical propaganda is operated to accomplish an immediate short-range purpose and normally does not cover a long time span. Only in a few cases, such as leaflets for a besieged enemy unit, is tactical propaganda run for a purpose that encompasses a long delay between the operation and the expected result. These two forms may be defined as follows. Strategic propaganda is directed at enemy forces, enemy peoples, and enemy occupied areas in their entirety, and, in coordination with strategic planning, is designed to effectuate results planned and sought over a period of weeks, months, or years. Tactical propaganda is directed at specific audiences, usually named and is prepared and executed in support of localized combat operations. 
another set of distinctions can be set up, depending on the relationship of the propaganda operation to the simultaneous hostile propaganda operations, namely offensive or defensive propaganda. Before the advent of World War II, this distinction appeared to be significant, but experience on almost all fronts indicated that it meant little when applied to day-in, day-out necessities of actual practice. Propaganda is so intimately keyed to the news and opinion situation that it does not usually bear elaborate pre-operational analysis. Elaborate planning very often ends up in the locked files. The distinction of offensive and defensive means little in routine work. However, for the sake of the record, the distinction can be listed. Defensive propaganda is designed to maintain an accepted and operating form of social or other public action. Soviet propaganda for the five-year plans is a conspicuous instance. Offensive propaganda is designed to interrupt social action not desired by the propagandist or to predispose to social action which he desires either through revolutionary means within the same society or international, either diplomatic or belligerent, between different societies. Another set of distinctions arises from the purpose which the propaganda officer or group may have in mind for the people whom he addresses. These distinctions, like offensive-defensive, are theoretical rather than practical, and did not often appear in the actual operations, although all the more hush-hush plans made elaborate references to them. Conversionary propaganda is designed to change the emotional or practical allegiance of individuals from one group to another. Divisive propaganda is designed to split apart the component subgroups of the enemy and thereby reduce the effectiveness of the enemy group considered as a single unit. An instance is provided by the Allied effort to make German Catholics think first as Catholics, then as Germans. Consolidation propaganda is directed toward civil populations in areas occupied by a military force and is designed to ensure compliance with the commands or policies promulgated by the commander of the occupying force. Counter-propaganda is designed to refute a specific point or theme of enemy propaganda. Japanese charges of American atrocities usually followed American charges of Japanese atrocities. Except for those terms that are firmly rooted in the literature of propaganda, most of the distinctions can be forgotten. The basic distinctions are those determined by the task involved and not by the propaganda content. World War II brought up a very sore issue between military and civilians with respect to propaganda in areas with unsettled governments, such as Darwinist North Africa, Communist China, all of Siam. See also discussion of World War II below. In these areas, every military act involved the definition of the political relations of the United States government to the governments locally enjoying authority. Were we at war with them or not? And so on. In these cases, politics itself became a vital foundation to propaganda, especially when the local authorities were themselves active in the propaganda field. The American theater and unit commanders had to decide what kinds of political promises they could or could not make. In this job, they had a more difficult task than did the British, who possessed in the political warfare executive a pooling facility, which coordinated foreign policy with propaganda. Could we promise freedom from France to the Algerians? or immunity to the Siamese who re-double-crossed in the matter of allegiance and got ready to subvert the Japanese, or the Yenan people 
who wanted us to hijack the Generalissimo as a price of their support? Or the Indonesians, who might oppose the Japanese and already opposed the Dutch? Such questions transcended propaganda. Their decision made propaganda or unmade it, but the deciding power was outside the authority of the propaganda people. Political warfare is, therefore, in administrative terms, a higher level activity than propaganda and may be defined as follows. Political warfare consists of the framing of national policy in such a way as to assist propaganda or military operations, whether with respect to the direct political relations of governments with one another or in relation to groups of people possessing a political character. Such policy framing does not normally fall within the authority of the army or navy, though these may be consulted and called upon to effect appropriate military action. An outstanding instance of the use of political warfare was President Roosevelt's impromptu enunciation of the theme Unconditional Surrender at Casablanca. The theme affected not only our propaganda, but the types of surrenders which American generals could accept from Germans. End of Section 5 Recording by Linda Johnson Section 6 of Psychological Warfare This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Psychological Warfare by Paul M. A. Leinbarger The Limitations of Psychological Warfare, Part 1 Psychological warfare cannot be known simply in terms of what it is. It must also be understood in relation to the limits which are imposed on it. The limitations can be described under four headings. Political limitations, security limitations, limitations arising from media, limitations of personnel. Like all limitations, these are handicaps only to the person who lacks the courage and resourcefulness to turn them into assets. Propaganda is dependent on politics, even for such frontline requirements as definition of the enemy, yet intelligent exploitation of political goals yields valuable results. Security is an asset to any army. Its price is rarely too high a price to pay for protection, but a selective and flexible censorship can lead to positive advantages. Media, that is, the actual instrumentalities by which propaganda is conveyed, are the ordinance of psychological warfare. They limit the performable job, but they also make it possible in the first place. And, as in any military operation, success depends most of all on proper use of personnel. Each of these merits discussion. The experience drawn upon has, in almost all instances, been that of World War II. As in most other fields, common sense runs a close second to experience as a guide in new methods of struggle. Political Limitations of Psychological Warfare Politics has great influence on the content of psychological warfare. The relationship between two warring states is not one of complete severance. On the contrary, in wartime, the relationship becomes abnormal, acute, sensitive. Each belligerent takes a strong interest in the other, in its affairs and weaknesses. During World War II, the American armed forces... Government and people learned more about the Japanese than they would have in 20 years of peacetime education. Japanese names made news. The purposes and weaknesses of the Japanese became the objects of hatred and, along with the hatred, intense scrutiny. Each warring nation tries to turn the known enemy interest in itself into favorable channels. 
the propagandists of each country try to give the enemy the news which the enemy wants, while so arranging that news as to create a drop in enemy morale, to develop uncertainty in enemy policies, to set enemy cliques into action against each other. The propagandist sometimes becomes very agitated because he recognizes as a technician propaganda opportunities which national policy prohibits his using. The propagandist, who is so intent on his target that he forgets his broader responsibilities, can often spoil the entire operation. German broadcasters who emphasized the anti-capitalist character of National Socialism in the programs beamed to Eastern Europe found that BBC picked up the most tactless statements and repeated them to Western Europe, where the Germans posed as anti-Bolshevik champions of private property. American attacks on the Germans for associating with Japanese monkey men were passed along by the Japanese to the Chinese, who did not like the slur either. The most notorious example of backfiring propaganda was, of course, the famous rum, Romanism, and rebellion phrase, which may have made James G. Blaine lose to Grover Cleveland in the national election of 1884. The phrase was used by a Republican clergyman in New York, referring to the Democrats, and implied that the Wets, anti-prohibitionists, Catholics, and Southerners were important components in the Democratic Party. This may have been true, but it pleased none of them to have the matter pointed out with such epithets. The phrase succeeded in its short-range purpose, that of rousing Republicans, but failed by rousing the enemy even more and offending neutral-minded persons as well. The balance between home-front politics and field psychological warfare is difficult to maintain. The closer the psychological warfare officer is to the enemy, the more apt he is to think of the mission in terms of getting the enemy to come on over. Why quibble about a few phrases if the words will save lives, material, and time? Unfortunately, the phrase that is successful against the enemy on the battlefront may prove to be an irritant to the home public with the sure consequence that the enemy will pick it up and send it back to do harm. Similarly, home-front propaganda can get out to do the theaters of Operation Harm. Do your utmost, save lard, sounds silly to men in combat areas. This can be illustrated by the propaganda problem of the Japanese emperor. It would have helped domestic American politics to call the Japanese emperor a monkey, a swine, a lunatic, a witch doctor, or comparable names. Some people did so. But if the American government had done so at home for the purpose of rousing its own public, the Japanese home public would have been roused even more with the net result that the Americans would have lost by such attacks. If the Russians promised as in another instance they are reported to have done, good food and warm clothes to the Germans on the winter fronts, the Nazis passed that promise along to the Russian civilians who would not think well of Stalin's letting fascist invaders be plump and snug while they themselves nearly starved. For the enemy audience, it is good to portray excellent care of enemy personnel. For the home audience, it is poor. For the home audience, it is sometimes good to present the enemy as ruthless lunatics, beasts in human form, cruel degenerates, and so on. But the same claims falling into enemy hands can be used to the disadvantage of the originator by being relayed to the enemy home audience. Furthermore, Sound psychological warfare must take account of the fact that its ultimate aim is the successful ending of the war. For the end to be successful, it must occur. The fighting must stop, and the nations must enter into altered but renewedly peaceful relations. 
propaganda that promises the enemy too much will alienate both allies and home public. But propaganda that promises bloody vengeance hurts possible peace movements in the enemy camp. None of the great powers in World War II went so far as to promise specific frontiers for the post-war period. They kept their promises vague, knowing that a definite promise would please somebody but alienate everyone else. Furthermore, by not promising, the expectations of the hopeful parties can be kept at a higher pitch. If the French do not know that they will get the Tsar, they will fight so much the harder. But if they are promised the Tsar, they come in a very short while to regard the promise as a settled matter and proceed to ask for something else. Meanwhile, other possible claimants to the Tsar either have a sense of grievance or lose interest in the matter. For this reason, post-war political uncertainty can be a propaganda asset. President Roosevelt, in his conduct of the political world role of the United States, promised Manchuria to the Chinese, Korea in due course to the Koreans, and the integrity of the French colonial empire to the French. Outside of that, he avoided specific promises. In another instance, to put a complicated matter baldly, the British promised Palestine to both the Arabs and to the Jews in World War I, and consequently got themselves into a political mess, which, thirty years later, was still a mess. Definition of the Enemy Another significant connection between politics and propaganda is found in the definition of the nature of the enemy. For combat operations, it is easy most of the time to tell who the enemy is. He is the man with the other uniform, the foreign language, the funny color or physique. For psychological operations, it is not that easy. The sound psychological warfare operator will try to get enemy troops to believing that the enemy is not themselves, but somebody else. The king, the fuhrer, the elite troops, the capitalists. He creates a situation in which he can say, we're not fighting you. This should not be said too soon after extensive use of bombs or mortars. We are fighting the so-and-sos who are misleading you. Some of the handsomest propaganda of World War II was produced by the Soviet experts along this line. Before the war was over, Soviet propaganda created a whole gallery of heel-clicking reactionary German generals on the Russian side and made out that the unprofessional gutter-snipe Hitler was ruining the wonderful German army in amateurish campaigns. Joseph Stalin's ringing words, the German state and the German Volk remain, gave the Russians a propaganda loophole by which they implied that Germany was not the enemy. No, not Germany, just the Nazis. This was superb psychological warfare, since the Russians had already built up the propaganda thesis that the common people, workers and peasants, were automatically, by virtue of their class loyalty, on the side of the workers' country, Russia. That left very few Germans on the other side. For psychological warfare purposes, it is useful to define the enemy as 1. the ruler, 2. or the ruling group, 3. or unspecified manipulators, 4. or any definite minority. It is thoroughly unsound to define the enemy too widely. On the other hand, too narrow a definition will leave the enemy the opening for a peace offensive if the ruler dies or if the ruling group changes part of its composition. It was fear of a peace move by the German generals, plus the desire to maintain the precarious anti-German unity of the occupied countries, which led the United States and Britain to adopt the policy of defining the German Reich rather than Nazism as the enemy. 
In the instance of Japan, we defined the enemy as the militarists and fascists, with the capitalists a poor second, and left the emperor and people with whom to make peace. If the psychological warfare campaign is operated for a definite political purpose, it is possible for politics to be an aid rather than a limitation. The operator can describe his own political system in its most radiant light. He can say complimentary things about the enemy leaders or groups who might come over, though he should avoid giving them the kiss of death, which the Nazis gave certain prominent American isolationists by praising them too much. He can promise his own brand of utopia. If the politics are defensive, vague, well-meaning but essentially non-committed, psychological warfare has to avoid making blunders. In World War II, we could not say that we were against one-party states, because our largest ally, Russia, was a one-party state. We could not attack the ruin of free enterprise by the Japanese and German governments, since socialism existed on the Allied side, too. We could not bring up the racial issue, because our own national composition rendered us vulnerable to racial politics at home. There was a huge catalogue of don'ts, usually not written down but left to individual judgment in every propaganda office. Whenever we violated them, we paid the price in adverse opinion. Promises Finally, psychological warfare must avoid promises that may not be kept. The Americans, during World War II, never promised much as a government, but individual American agents promised all sorts of things which could not be delivered. We promised the Dutch their homeland and empire by implication. We promised the Indonesians self-government also by implication. And we promised everybody, including the Japanese, access to Indonesian raw materials. It is highly probable that individual Americans off the record stated that they expected, hoped, or thought that their government would fulfill each of these promises. The three are not compatible, especially the first and second. The New York banker James Warburg has written a book, Unwritten Treaty, pointing out that the United States promised just about everything to everybody during the war. He was in OWI, and he ought to know, and that it is going to take a generous wise and intelligent foreign policy to fulfill even in part the promises which we made. The promises of the loser are forgotten. He can write them off and start international policies with a clean slate. But the promises of the victor remain and have to be carried out or else repudiated. The psychological warfare officer should not make promises to persons in occupied territory to friendly guerrillas, to underground movements, or to enemy troops, when those promises are not backed up by word-for-word -word quotations from the head of his government or someone of cabinet rank. The promises may not conform with promises which other psychological warfare officers are making to other groups. In China, some American officers told the Chinese communists that the Chinese communists were wonderful people and would be sure to get American material aid and political sympathy against Chiang Kai-shek. At the same time, other American officers told the Chinese government people that the United States did not propose to short-circuit recognition of the Chinese government or to interfere in internal Chinese affairs. The two sets of Chinese heard about the American promises and, for a while, could not decide whether Americans were fools or liars. Much the same sort of thing happened in our dealings with French, Serbs, and Poles. It is a poor piece of work for a combat officer to promise elections, liberties, labor rights, or even food to people in his path 
unless the rear echelon people will be able to deliver the goods when they come up. And it is an irresponsible radio or leaflet man who makes promises without finding out whether his government is in a position, in relation to the political situation, to back up the promises one way or other. His nation itself will be called a liar if he slips up. Security Limitations Another serious set of limitations arises from security problems. The very conduct of psychological warfare encroaches upon perfectionist plans for security. Security is designed to keep useful information from reaching the enemy. Propaganda operations are designed to get information to him. Security is designed to keep the enemy from knowing true figures, but propaganda must have a lot of good, current, true information, if it is to be believed. Security demands that military and naval news be withheld until the extent of the enemy's knowledge is known. Propaganda is designed to tell the enemy the news faster than his own sources tell him, thus discrediting enemy news. Security demands that dubious persons, intimately associated with the enemy, be kept away from communications facilities. Propaganda officers have to keep an eye open for people who speak the enemy language well, who can address the enemy sympathetically and get his attention, who have a keen appreciation of the enemy culture. Often it is plain Psychological warfare and security officers get in each other's way. This conflict was lessened by American censorship organization during World War II. The United States Office of Censorship under Byron Price achieved a distinguished record of smooth, reasonable, and modest operation. It took an adult view of the intelligence of the American public and permitted bad news to reach the public except when the services or the White House intervened. Much of the story of this office is told in Theodore Koop's exciting book, Weapon of Silence, which makes it plain that censorship sought to avoid developing negative psychological warfare campaigns on its own initiative. The usual wartime security procedures apply with special force to psychological warfare operations. Civilian employees who are qualified as political experts, as writers, or as propaganda analysts are often well-educated and artistic. They are apt to value classified information highly for the pleasure which they can derive by violating security, that is, by showing people they can trust how much they are in on certain operations. The temptation to show off is almost irresistible. The vice is not unknown even in military echelons. An atmosphere of excessive security easily degenerates into melodrama, bringing out in many individuals a silly zest for displaying to others how much top-secret information they possess. Where military and civilian personnel work together, this human weakness is stimulated by rivalry. Even among the Germans in World War II, propaganda groups were easily infected by an atmosphere of gossip and intrigue. End of Section 6 Recording by Linda Johnson Section 7 of Psychological Warfare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Psychological Warfare by Paul M. A. Linebarger. The Limitations of Psychological Warfare, Part 2. Security Procedures. Security procedures for psychological warfare involve the usual common-sense precautions which apply to all operations and which may be summarized in the following rules. 1. Classification should be kept at an absolute minimum. 
No information should be classified unless there are genuinely strong reasons for supposing that it would benefit the enemy. Classification and declassification should be the responsibility of designated officers trained for the task. In World War II, many American civilians classified information recklessly, with the result that all classification became a subject of disrespect. The author once found a highly classified inter-allied plan in the hands of an elderly woman stenographer in Washington, who safeguarded the information by leaving the papers in a desk drawer which had no pull. The drawer had to be opened with a nail file, and that fact comprised the security. 2. Security should apply, generally speaking, to units as a whole, taking working units up to the limit of face-to-face -face working acquaintance as a base. It is unsound procedure to give certain individuals a higher level of information than others, since the privileged individuals will be tempted to display their inside knowledge, and the underprivileged individuals will be goaded by unwholesome, resentful, and acute curiosity. Either the entire unit should be given the information or denied it. 3. Security should not be applied for editorial purposes. Censorship is a separate function. Improper security procedures, vesting arbitrary powers in stated officers, may tempt the security officer to express his personal, literary, artistic, or political preferences under the guise of maintaining security. The inevitable consequence is the breakdown of both security and of procedure. Censorship should be applied in conformity with national or theater censorship policies. Review and estimate of radio or leaflet output is another function. 4. Security for printed materials is easy enough to maintain. The leaflets can be sent to the G2 to check or wherever else security functions may be vested. Radio security is another problem. Experience in World War II indicates that spot news cannot wait for routine security but must be processed through. Two types of control supplementing one another are desirable. Security liaison on a 24-hour basis should be available to the radio operatives for the rapid processing of military news. The security duty officer should be indoctrinated with an attitude of cooperativeness based on an understanding of the value of propaganda and should conceive it as his mission to explain the needs of radio propaganda to his superiors rather than taking the attitude of being superior to the radio operatives. There is a sound psychological reason for this. The presence of a sympathetic security officer will increase cooperativeness on the part of the propaganda broadcaster. An unsympathetic one will merely maintain the official dignity of his office and position. High morale on the part of script writers is more important than high morale of security officers. Security supervision can be exercised by monitoring facilities. That is, the security officers can equip themselves with a good radio receiver and listen to the broadcasts without ever meeting the broadcasters. A critical frame of mind on the part of such security personnel is desirable. Unlike liaison officers, they need not be cooperative. Since their criticism applies after the operation, they can afford to apply rigorous standards. During most of 1942 and 1943, no one in Washington had any idea of what actually went out from San Francisco. The civilians who broadcast to Japan received elaborate orders to do this and to do that, but the Washington policymakers did not know what was going on the air. On one occasion, the civilian propaganda broadcasters told the Army in Washington that the information was too highly classified to be released or circulated. The result was that Army and Navy found out what OWI was doing 
by receiving reports from listeners in the Pacific. Security liaison can check propaganda output in the process of transmission. Security supervision can check the output after it goes on the air and can transmit through channels recommendations for punitive or corrective action. The final military connection should exist for an all-military psychological warfare group in the person of a responsible commanding or executive officer. For a civilian group functioning under military control, the military connection should lie in the hands of an officer capable of watching a great deal and of saying little. Attempts by security to act as propagandists have been found to be as disastrous as the efforts of operators to get along without security. Media Limitations Psychological warfare should not broadcast into areas in which radio sets are unknown. Psychological warfare should not drop books to illiterates. These rules seem obvious, but they have often been violated. Psychological warfare should not assume that an extensive news or morale campaign is going to achieve the desired results unless there is trustworthy intelligence to the effect that propaganda is getting through. It is ridiculous to broadcast to the masses of a country when the masses are known not to have radio facilities. This was done in the anti-Japanese broadcasts of OWI, at least in the early part of the war, in which mass audience soap operas and popular music were sent to Japan on the shortwave. This, despite reports that shortwave sets were almost unknown outside governmental or plutocratic circles. What was known was that the Japanese government itself had listening facilities and that the content of American broadcasts was relayed through Japanese military and governmental groups. The propaganda, to fit the medium radio, should have been designed to affect the persons actually reached and not an audience known to be out of reach. The mere fact that enemy counter-propaganda mentions one's own material is nothing more than a professional exchange of compliments. Goading the enemy radio into a reply may be fun, but unless non-propagandists are known to be listening, the fun is expensive and unprofitable. It is really fun, though. The author suggested in the spring of 1942 that the San Francisco radio carry an item to the effect that American art lovers hoped the Japanese would move their priceless books and paintings away from the great cities. This was preparation for eventual nagging on the topic, the air raids will get you if you don't watch out. The radio civilians in San Francisco put the item on the air, Nothing was heard from the Japanese on the subject. Four days later, Radio Luxembourg, then under Nazi control, of course, broadcast in German to Europe that a spokesman for the beastly American Air Ministry had told the Japanese that the Americans planned to destroy cultural monuments. The Nazi commentator added that this was characteristic of the actions of uncivilized Americans. New York picked up the German broadcast. The author enjoyed seeing his item go all the way around the world, but in retrospect, he wonders whether he did any good other than to please himself. He did do the actual harm of giving the Nazis another point to distort. Media consist simply of the facilities possessed. These are, most commonly, 1. Standard Wave Radio, 2. Shortwave radio, 3. Loudspeakers, 4. Leaflets, 5. Pamphlets, 6. Books, 7. Novelties. The limitations consist simply of applying the right medium at the right time. Radio broadcasts need be made only when receiving sets are known to exist. Written material should be dropped only to areas in which at least some people can read. The OWI in China 
at the request of CBI Forward Echelon Headquarters, made up the leaflet showing pictures only. This was designed for the aboriginal hillmen between China and Tibet to tell them to rescue downed American pilots. Broadcasting to these people would have been as profitable as spitting in the ocean. None of them could read, much less understand, radio. The probable number of listeners or readers should be calculated conservatively, taking enemy policing, amount of enemy interest, customs of the people, tension among enemy troops or civilians and other appropriate factors into account. Occasionally, propaganda media exceed the expected limitations. The Americans and British dropped leaflets on Berlin. The leaflets had little key numbers in the corners showing to which series they belonged and could thus be arranged in series. The Germans prohibited civilians from picking up the leaflets. The Nazi authorities followed up the prohibition by sending the Hitlerjugend and Hitler Mädel out to pick up the leaflets and turn them in for destruction. The boys and girls did their job with gusto. Vast quantities were turned in for destruction. What the Nazis discovered too late, too late, was that the school children had begun collecting the leaflets using the key numbers to make up perfect sets. Some numbers were rarer than others, so that the Hitlerite children swapped allied leaflets all over Berlin, trying to make up attractive albums. Mother and father, who did not dare pick the leaflets up off the street for fear the Gestapo might be watching, found a convenient file, reasonably complete, in the room of little Fritzel or Ermintrude. The most hopeful British or American planner could not have counted on such a happy result. Maximum Performance of Personnel Another limitation to be found in any psychological warfare operation is that imposed by the types of personnel available. It would be a rash commander who assumed that he had air support because he saw airplanes without knowing whether air crews were available. A microphone does not make a propagandist. Personnel using the speaking voice have to be good speakers. Merely knowing the language is not enough. Writing personnel must be up to the level of professional writers. On the other hand, the available personnel must not be driven above its limits of performance. Often, an attempt to do a too professional job will defeat the propaganda. When the Japanese pretended to be perfectly American and used the corny, obsolete slang of the 1920s, they aroused more contempt than they would have done had they confined themselves to rather bookish, plain English. The psychological warfare operation must be gauged to the personnel facilities no less than to the material facilities. In China, the author sat in with an expert on medieval and modern Japanese art, who was writing leaflets which were to be dropped on the Japanese garrisons of the Yangtze cities. The expert wrote pure, dignified Japanese, but the Chinese-Japanese language experts brought up the point, would the Japanese common soldier understand this kind of talk? For a while, we had no plain-spoken Japanese at hand, and we had to send our Japanese leaflets from Chongqing up to Yan'an, where the Japanese communists read the leaflets and wrote back long, detailed criticisms. Whenever the politico-military situation permits, it is sound procedure to check output with live enemies, either interned civilians or captured military personnel. A shrewd interrogator can soon find out whether the comments from the enemy jury are honest or not. Intelligent psychological warfare procedures have often turned liabilities into assets. Absence of a good orchestra has compelled propagandists to make up current music schedules by recording enemy musical programs, 
rebroadcasting them with new spoken commentary. Failure to obtain native speakers, such as genuine homegrown Japanese or Chinese with the properly slurred Wu dialect, has led to the use of substitutes that proved better than the original. There is no point in trying to establish rapport with the enemy unless you talk his language with effortless perfection on the one end of the scale, or else admit that you really are a foreigner on the other end of the scale. It is easier to build up the image of a trustworthy enemy than it is to create trust in a traitor. Frequently, the attempt to talk the enemy's own language is less successful than a frank acceptance of handicaps. In actual practice, this means that either A, the speaker should be authentically perfect in use of the enemy language, whether spoken or written as script, or B, the speaker should make no effort to conceal his foreign accent. In British broadcasts to Germany, for example, it was found to be desirable for the radio announcers to have British accents in their German, rather than the Viennese or Jewish lilt which many of them did have. A Nazified audience was so infected with anti-Semitism that no Jewish speaker could carry much weight, no matter how cogent his arguments nor how eloquent his appeals. The British tone in the voices of other speakers actually helped carry conviction. The Germans were prepared to listen to a genuine Britisher and might have been disappointed if he had spoken letter-perfect German. Furthermore, with the perfect speaker of the enemy language, there is always the question, what is that guy doing over there? A traitor is less appealing than an open enemy spokesman. A traitor has to be sensationally good in order to get across at all. Lord Haw Haw was one of a kind, but he seems to have had genuine theatrical talent, along with a crazy zeal which persuaded his hearers that, though he was on the wrong side, he did believe his own line. The perfect speaker, whether enemy renegade or friendly linguist, has an inglorious role at the beginning of war, when enemy morale is high and the enemy population has not had time to think over the problem of changing sides. Only toward the end of the war, or in any morale downgrade, the man who says, come on over, see, I'm here, it's fine, has a chance of being believed. The propaganda administrator must use his personnel thoughtfully. It is a waste of talent and, in advance field units, of life as well, to impose tasks which operatives cannot handle. An American Nisei from California should not be asked to talk slangy edoko Japanese. A soldier detailed to psychological warfare because of some special linguistic qualification should not be considered a great journalist, radio commentator, or actor just because he speaks the right language. If he is given a microphone and the feeling of having an audience one that cannot write adverse fan mail, it will be easy for the average man to overestimate the effect of his own talk. The intelligent officer tries to see his staff as the enemy would see them. He keeps their limitations in mind. If they speak the enemy language perfectly, they fall under suspicion as traitors. If they speak it poorly, they may sound like bunglers or jackasses. Nevertheless, propaganda must come from men and through words written by men, and the flavor must be fitted to the situation. Advance planning should therefore consider the available personnel as an actual factor in estimating the situation. Counter-propaganda Counter-propaganda could be listed as a limitation as the enemy combat strength is sized up in physical warfare. This, however, is one of the points at which psychological warfare differs from other forms. If the propaganda message is worth putting across, it need not be geared to what the enemy is saying. 
enemy propaganda should in well-conducted operations be taken into account only when it becomes an asset that is the enemy need only be heeded when he tells a whopping lie or comes forth with a piece of hypocrisy so offensive to his own people that it needs little improvement to be adapted for counter-propaganda. Most enemy themes are beyond reach, especially those of inter-ideological warfare. The Nazis and Russians made the best propaganda against each other when they got down to the basic necessities of life, not when they were trying to weave fine-spun theories about each other's way of thinking or of life. Refutation is a joy. It is delightful to talk back. But the best propaganda is only incidentally counter-propaganda. It uses enemy blunders and counteracts enemy success by building up unrelated successes of its own. This does not mean that propaganda analysis is not needed. Somewhere in every psychological warfare unit, there must be an intelligence group servicing the operation. If, for example, the enemy has announced that the candy your aviators are dropping is poisoned and has proved it by dropping some of your candy made by his black operations boys and actually poisoned, there is no point in calling him a liar. You may not know for some time whether poisoned candy has been dropped or not. If the enemy commander has shown his troops photographs of prisoners whom your side has taken and murdered according to his well-staged photos, it is not a good idea to ask people to surrender without sending along equally convincing pictures of well-cared-for prisoners. If the enemy alleges that you and your allies are rioting in the streets or stealing each other's women folk, or that one of you is doing all the fighting while the other sits around in safe staging areas, it may be a good idea to send along some leaflets showing inter-allied cooperation on your side, or to run a few radio shows on the subject. This consists merely of reckoning the enemy propaganda as part of the psychological warfare situation, and of using the enemy as part of the background to your own advantage. The moment you start letting him take the initiative, your propaganda wags along behind his. Tell his people something he can't deny. Let him sit up nights worrying about how he will counteract you. Make him drive his security officers crazy, trying to release figures that will please your G2 in order to reassure his home audience. Really good propaganda does not worry about counter-propaganda. It never assumes that the enemy propagandist is a gentleman. He is, by definition, a liar. Your listeners and you are the only gentlemen left on earth. End of Section 7 Recording by Linda Johnson Section 8 of Psychological Warfare this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Psychological Warfare by Paul M. A. Leinberger. Chapter 5A. Psychological Warfare in World War I. Part 1. World War I saw psychological warfare transformed from an incidental to a major military instrument, and later it was even called the weapon which won the war. The story spread since the Germans liked to imagine that they had been talked out of winning, and since ex-propagandists among the Allies enjoyed thinking that their own cleverness had been decisive, when even the tremendous violence of trench warfare had produced nothing more than a stalemate. If psychological warfare is considered in the broad sense, it seems plain that it was among the decisive weapons of 1914-1918. to 1918. The political decency of the Allies, the appeal of President Wilson's 14 points, the patent obsolescence of the Kaiser and what he stood for, the resurgence of Polish, Baltic, Finnish, Czechoslovak, and South Slav nationalisms, all these played a real part in making Germany surrender in 1918. More real than the role of guns, men, ships, planes, tanks? This cannot be answered. 
It is like asking of a long-distance runner whether his heart, lungs, legs, or head contributed most to his success. Since war is waged by and against all parts of the human personality, physical condition, skills, intelligence, emotions, and so on, it is impossible to distinguish between the performance of one kind of weapon and the other in the attainment of a goal itself complex, governmental surrender. Only a weapon which left no enemy survivors could claim for itself undisputed primacy and victory. Propaganda came to prominence in war because the nations involved had made mass communications part of their civilian lives. The appearance of huge newspapers, systematic advertising, calculated political publicity, and opinion manipulation in other forms made it inevitable that skills which developed in civilian life should be transferred to the military. In general, the psychological warfare efforts of each belligerent were the direct equivalent of his peacetime non-political propaganda facilities. By way of exception, the peculiar genius of the Bolshevik leaders stimulated a propaganda effort disproportionate to the facilities, either of personnel or material, to be found in pre-1914 Russia. Nations rarely change their basic character in time of war. When war starts, it is usually too late to re-educate generations already grown up, teach them wholly new skills, or develop administrative or operational procedures unknown in peacetime life. Sometimes, by great effort, a nation can transform a small available cadre into large new and effective units on the political, military, economic, or social fronts. Even then, the character of the war effort will be colored and influenced by the experience of the men undertaking it. The British had, in 1914, one of the world's finest news systems, a highly sophisticated press, and extensive experience in international communication for technical and commercial purposes, notably the undersea cable system, and they turned these to war use with considerable smoothness. The Germans had a far more regimented press and a more limited network of commercial and technical connections. The British, furthermore, had a diplomatic and consular service of superb quality. Comparable German services included a much higher proportion of bunglers and enthusiasts. From the very beginning, the British had the lead. They nailed German propaganda as propaganda, while circulating their own as news, cultural relations, or literature. The Germans who boasted that they were a cultured people had their naivete rewarded when the British let the German word Kultur become a synonym for boorish pedantic arrogance. The Germans had the awful habit of putting many of their own unattractive emotions into words, and their even more ruinous habit of then printing the words. In many instances, the British simply let the Germans think up braggadocio or vengeful phrases, then circulated the German phrases to the world. The English language was permanently enriched by some of these. Strafe comes from the German plea that God strafe, punish England. The actual hymn of hate was originally a song made up by Germans for Germans. The word Hun was applied to the German army by Kaiser Wilhelm himself, and so on. Furthermore, the Germans created, in their press and information services, a condition of bureaucratic snafu which has rarely been excelled in any war. National character certainly worked out its automatic vengeances in World War I. The American psychological warfare effort of 1917 to 1919 also drew heavily on familiar skills. The American press, second only to that of the British at the time, the church, YMCA, and Chautauqua groups, and the wealth of private clubs which flourish under our liberal system of laws and usages. Other nationalities made efforts similarly in keeping with their peacetime facilities. The Japanese were adroit, but even at that time confused by the mix-up of trying to be a civilized power, but simultaneously expansionist. The French showed high professional skill in adapting their military and diplomatic personnel to propaganda tasks. France's position as battleground ensured her of the rage of her own people and the sympathy of neutrals, giving propaganda from Paris a hearing. The Chinese, though undergoing the downfall of the Yuan Shikai dictatorship and lapsing into chaos, maintained an impeccable diplomatic front and played a weak hand for everything it was worth. They had their private quasi-war with the Japanese in 1915. That they did so while putting the blame for Allied disunity squarely on the Japanese where it belonged is to their credit. The weight of the propaganda war, as of the material war, fell on its prime contestants, Britain, Germany, and the United States. The private and revolutionary groups which emerged as the revolutionary governments played a vigorous part because they had few other functions to distract their attention. The Republic of Czechoslovakia got its start in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 1918 and fought psychological warfare from the instant it took form. Not till later did it assume the weightier and more expensive responsibilities of ruling and warring. The British effort. 
In World War I, the British made most of the mistakes and learned most of the lessons which the Americans were to make and learn in World War II. The British Foreign Office formed a War Propaganda Bureau in 1914, but a great deal of the effort was done by private facilities, patriotic associations, or by lower political and military echelons of the government and armed forces, and without coordination. Things became so confused that at the midpoint of the war, the British organized a Department of Information with Colonel John Buchan at its head. Buchan will be remembered by all adventure lovers as author of The Thirty-Nine Steps, The Courts of the Morning, and other first-class thrillers. He was also made a peer under the style Lord Tweedsmer, and became a popular Governor General of Canada. Buchan did not always get along with the committee which floated above him, telling him how to run his business. The British, like the Germans, had immense organizational difficulties. The British ended up by inventing a distinction of roles. Thus, they finished World War I with two separate propaganda agencies, the Ministry of Information under Lord Beaverbrook, with Colonel Buchan as Director of Intelligence, carried on civilian psychological warfare outside Britain. The National War Aims Committee carried on civilian psychological warfare within Britain. Military psychological warfare was carried on by military and civilian agencies both. The British required five years of honest effort, bitter wrangling, and positive political invention in order to devise a psychological warfare system sufficient to meet the needs of a great power at war. They did not let their administrative difficulties prevent their conduct of correct, poised, and highly moral propaganda, nor impede their use of plentiful funds and high ingenuity in getting their propaganda across. Footnote. On World War I, see Harold Laswell's Propaganda Technique in the World War, previously cited, George Creel's How We Advertised America, New York and London, 1920, the very title of which is an indication of its chief shortcoming, Lieutenant Colonel W. Nikolai, Nachrichtendienst Presse und Volkstimmung in Weltkrieg, Berlin, 1920, by the German General Staff Officer chiefly responsible for staff work and propaganda and public opinion, a very thoughtful, though prejudiced book. Heber Blankenhorn's enjoyable little classic, Adventures in Propaganda, Boston, 1919, Blankenhorn was the only American officer to see field service in propaganda in both wars, as a captain in one and a lieutenant colonel in two. And George C. Brunson's scholarly monograph, Allied Propaganda and the Collapse of the German Empire in 1918, Stanford, 1938. Readers desiring further references should consult the bibliographies by Laswell, Casey, and Smith cited above. End footnote. The British set the pace in coordinating political warfare with news propaganda and in effecting workable liaison between national policymakers and operational and public relations chiefs of the armed services. It is not likely that, even in World War II, the Americans, within the looser, younger, bigger framework of our more compendious government, achieved as good results in terms of timing. State, War, Navy, OWI, OSS, Treasury, timing of related events or news items was obtained through most of World War II in the following manner. The federal agency affected did whatever it was going to do anyhow, and other federal agencies took notice after the event, initiating their related actions, if any were feasible, then and only then. The British sought to get around this in World War I by correlating their policy toward various countries with their policy involving different departments. They were not totally successful, but they learned a lot. The net product of their propaganda was, for most of its purposes, superb. The German Failure in Propaganda German writers after World War I sometimes attributed the superiority of the British in propaganda to the innate fiendishness of Britishers, as contrasted with the gullible purity of Germans. The psychoneurotic non-com who made himself famous to the world's cost did not make this mistake. In Mein Kampf, Hitler stated categorically that the British had understood the professional touch in propaganda, while the Germans had not. Hitler's contempt for the masses was shown in his explicit statement of their inattentiveness, their poor response to formal logic, their affirmative reaction to simple one-sided reiteration. He said, In England, Propaganda was a weapon of the first class, while with us it was a sop to unemployed politicians. German nationalists of whatever stripe found themselves in accord when they blamed their military defeat on the enemy's use of propaganda. They thus succeeded in maintaining the myth, already sedulously inculcated for two centuries, that the German army could not be beaten in the field. The extremists and crackpots among them went on to develop the stab-in-the-back theory that an unbeaten Germany was betrayed from within by Jews, socialists, and democratic people. The mutually exclusive alternatives, namely that either Allied propaganda was fiendishly good and the Germans merely innocent victims, 
or else that Allied propaganda was ineffectual and the anti-war sentiment a purely German development did not keep the Hitlerites from exploiting both alibis simultaneously. The post-war period of the 1920s saw, therefore, the curious spectacle of the Germans lauding American psychological warfare and counting it as a major factor of defeat, while the Americans naturally emphasized the fighting record of American troops. As for Kaiserist propaganda, it started out with the twin curses of amateurishness and bureaucracy, each of them crippling but deadly when paired. German writers and scholars ran wild in 1914 and 1915 in trying to put the blame on the Allies. Amateurish in public relations, they succeeded in arousing a tremendous amount of antagonism. They were handicapped by the ponderosity of the German imperial government, by the intervention of persons unfamiliar with news or advertising, at that time the most obvious sources of civilian propaganda personnel, and by a military stodginess which made German press communiques infuriating even to anti-British readers. Overseas propaganda developed through poorly secured clandestine channels and was mixed up with espionage and sabotage personnel. Inescapable breaks gave all German agents a bad name. George Sylvester Führich, who has enjoyed the odd distinction of being our most vocal pro-German sympathizer in both wars with Germany, later wrote a naive but revealing account of his operations under the title Spreading Germs of Hate, Boston 1930. No British information officer was guilty, even after the war, of a comparable breach of taste. Burek praises the British for their sang-froid and skill. Coming from him, the praise is more than deserved. More seriously, German propaganda lacked both organization and moral drive. Lieutenant Colonel Nikolai, the Imperial German General Staff Officer responsible, puts part of the blame on the German press and on the press officers of the Army and the Reich. Quote, In fact, the enemy remained virtually untouched by any kind of German propaganda. This reproach falls against the press, it would seem, as well as on the responsible officials. Internationally minded papers themselves failed to cooperate, yet it was precisely these which were circulated and esteemed abroad. Newspapers with other pro-militarist editorial policies, failing to get leadership from the government, could not aim at any unified effect. Instead, the goal of the governmental press leadership remained a thoroughly negative one, to prevent the press from doing harm to national policy. End quote. Without developing his theme into systematic doctrine for psychological warfare, the German colonel stated the basic defect of World War I from the German point of view. Writing in 1920, he went on to say, quote, The enemy alleges simply to have copied our frontline propaganda when he initiated his. In so doing, he is guilty of a deliberate untruth, made for the sake of removing the moral blot which is attached to his victory. Nikolai could not overcome the supposition that propaganda was a dirty and unsoldierly device, and that it was much more honorable for armies to exchange loss of life than to save men on both sides by talking the enemy into surrendering. But he went on to the real point at issue. Quote, Furthermore, it was not moralistic misgivings which kept us from applying to the enemy front lines a propaganda campaign as successful as theirs, but very sober practical obstacles. There were available to us none of the psychological points of attack at which propaganda would have been effective against the enemy forces, points such as the enemy found in our own domestic conditions. What was lacking was political propaganda as precursor of military. What the Germans failed to learn in World War I, they later learned and applied in World War II. The German imperial government started in 1914 with a defiant assurance of its own power. Power was not sought among the masses, so far as Kaiser Wilhelm was concerned. One inherited it from one's ancestors, along with an army, and the masses had better keep their noses out of it. The Hitlerite German government of 1939 began its world war only after two decades of shrewd, conscienceless, bitter domestic propaganda. Hitlerism had come to power by first wooing and then bullying the common man. And the Nazi chiefs, in their strategy of terror, or, quote, warfare psychologically waged, unquote, subsequently applied the same tactics to the international community. Hitler conquered Europe with these tactics. He started with flattery, made scenes, and ended with cold brutality. These were the skills of the urban slum. The Creel Committee The fabulous American propaganda of which the Germans expressed such dread was the work of two agencies— the Civilian Agency was the Committee on Public Information, universally known as the Creel Committee after its chairman, Mr. George Creel. The Military Agency was the Propaganda Section, or Psychologic Section, G2D, General Headquarters, American Expeditionary Forces, under Captain Heber Blankenhorn. The Creel Committee had the superlative advantage of possessing a chief who enjoyed the confidence of the President, 
and whose participation in national policy was on a high enough level to give propaganda coordination to other governmental policies on a basis of equality. Creel himself considered the task to be one of advertising, and he organized his committee with extreme looseness, expanding it rapidly. Although his total gross budget for the war was only a fraction of OWI's budgets in World War II, he systematized most of the publicity activities then available. News services were maintained by means of a news bureau in Washington that fed material to the commercial press and processed other material to publicity missions abroad. Heavy emphasis was placed on the home audience, for Creel's mission covered all phases of propaganda work. Sections were set up for posters, advertising, four-minute men, volunteer local speakers in all American communities, films, American minority groups, and the foreign language press, women's organizations, information bureaus, syndicated features, and cartoons. The young but already large American motion picture industry was made a channel whereby American propaganda movies went to both the United States and overseas audiences. In one instance, Creel got the American producers to threaten Swiss exhibitors with a boycott unless they showed American propaganda film along with the features. Missions were sent to France, England, Italy, Switzerland, Holland, Spain, Scandinavia, Mexico, and other Latin American countries, China, and Russia. It was not considered necessary to send American propagandists to Japan in World War I. The Japanese were given the American propaganda file and were asked to use it. They said they would. The Creel Committee was run in simple, almost chaotic fashion. Agencies proliferated whenever a new idea turned up. The basic concept was that of domestic American agitation as practiced commercially through advertising and socially through the civic clubs. The war propaganda left a rather bad taste in the mouth of many Americans, and the boisterous joviality of the arousers probably produced negative attitudes which encouraged pacifism and isolationism in the post-war years. The purely technical side of the work was done well, but at the terrible cost of overshooting national commitments. America emerged from the war disappointed at home and discredited abroad, so far as the heated propaganda of making the world safe for democracy was concerned. A more modest, more calculated national propaganda effort would have helped forestall those attitudes which in turn made World War II possible. Creel and his fellow workers did not remember that beyond every war there lies a peace, in its own way as grim and difficult as war. They did not understand that no war is the last war, that leeway must be left for propaganda to be effective again. They said that World War I would be the last of all wars. Perhaps they believed it themselves. End of section 8. Read by Eli Bishop, San Francisco, March 12, 2021. Section 9 of Psychological Warfare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Psychological Warfare by Paul M. A. Leinbarger. Chapter 5b. Psychological Warfare in World War I, Part Two. General Pershing's Headquarters The civilians of the Creel Committee patronizingly claimed to have helped the G-2 men at AEF headquarters run psychological warfare. In the official history of Captain Blankenhorn's group, which centered from the very beginning on leaflet production, there is little reference to outside aid. Radio did not exist as a means of mass communication, and loudspeakers then surpassed an ordinary megaphone very little, if at all. Hence, communication with the enemy had to be through print. Leaflets were basic. The Americans at AEF concentrated on morale and surrender leaflets. They did work that was superb from the point of view of common-sense psychology. They used British and French experience in applying techniques of leaflet distribution, making inventions and improvements of their own. Balloons and airplanes were the chief methods for air distribution. The plane-borne leaflet bomb was a development of World War II. Extensive improvements were made in the procedures of leaflet distribution by means of mortars. The morale leaflets used the anti-militarist, pro-democratic sentiments of the world at that time. The autocracy and inefficiency of the German government provided an excellent target. Since propaganda against the upper classes was not yet regarded as a communist monopoly, considerable appeal was introduced for the common German soldier against his generals, nobles, officials, and capitalists. German nationalism was attacked by means of sectional appeals to Lorrainers and Bavarians. The news that America was in fact producing vast weapons, that the American army was truly in Europe, that the German retreats were really serious, these were used in morale form, see below, page 212, rather than as spot news leaflets. 
It was in the primary mission of combat propaganda, the inducement to surrender, that the Americans excelled themselves. They produced limitless appeals, see figure 13, promising the Germans first-class American food when they surrendered. Emphasis was indeed on all surrender themes, good food, human care, privileges under international law, patriotic value of remaining alive, opportunity to return to loved ones, and so forth. But the Americans went over these variously and came back to the topic of food. For an army of hungry men who knew that their homeland starved behind them, the enumeration of things to eat had obsessive value. Haughty and incompetent, the German high command tried to counteract Allied leaflets, particularly the American leaflets, by the use of appeals to, quote, disregard propaganda. While the German armies plainly backed down toward defeat, such German statements preached about the situation. They did not put the common soldier's plight in concrete terms. They did not say, you will be unemployed, poor, sick, dishonored, lonely, if you surrender. Your wife will be beaten by Frenchmen, your daughters raped by savages, your father and mother starved to death by the food prices. Such tactics had to wait for a later war. In 1918, the German command, senile and fussy, pointed out that enemy leaflets were propaganda, nasty, nasty, and that good German soldiers would remember their duty. For men who probably imagined they could smell white bread baking, bacon frying, and coffee cooking across the lines, such wordage was nonsense. The Germans came on over to surrender. Captain Blankenhorn's unit, without benefit of psychologists, developed a German morale analysis chart. This was made up before scientific polling had become a common technique, and was consequently based on a group of selected known factors given arbitrary weight and then averaged into a total. It was not number of German prisoners per hundred who express attitudes characterized by doubt, but the U-boat situation, unity in Germany, and other abstracted generalities which were used as controls. The chart was carefully kept, and sought to follow morale from its causative factors, rather than by a percentage count of attitudes discovered in the newspapers or among prisoners. The Bolshevik and Chinese Revolutions The dynamic propaganda development of this period came about in Russia. The Russian Revolution began as reaction to an adverse military situation, disesteemed leadership, economic hardship, and long overdue reforms. In its first, or constitutional, phase, it had an inevitableness about it. There was little resistance to the revolution, and the popular mood was one of relief, joy, easement. However, the majority group of the Russian socialists interpreted the Marxist philosophy to mean, putting it bluntly, that the end is justified by the means. They believed that they had developed a system of politico-economic forecasting which, while not always certain, was close to certain, and they further believed that no one else lacking this system of forecasting, could lead the workers and peasants to their historically inevitable freedom. This philosophy may sound beside the point, but it is not. Such abstruse doctrines of Hegelianism and Marxism were used by the majority socialists, known by their Russian name Bolshevik, to give themselves a sense of unconditional rightness. From the first phase of the revolution on, the Bolsheviks pitilessly sabotaged all other democratic groups, there was no point in helping other groups when Bolsheviks alone had the inner secrets of history at their command. In the geniuses Lenin and Trotsky, the Bolshevik movement found its leadership. Lenin had no use for democracy as it was known in America. To him, it was a sham, a front for the great capitalist trusts, which, even though the capitalists themselves might not know it, were doomed to get bigger on a shrinking market until international capitalist war, bankruptcy, and working-class revolution was the result. Lenin was as sure that this would happen as he was that the sun would rise the next morning. The only dispute was the matter of timing. A few Bolshevik pessimists thought that the capitalist world might last into the 1920s. Such a frame of mind led to a very deadly kind of psychological warfare. The Bolsheviks despised their opponents, desiring to liquidate them, this meant breaking down a group and preventing its reforming as a group, but came above all to mean mass murder. They were so antagonistic to the capitalist world that they hated God, patriotism, national history, churches, money, private property, chastity, marriage, and verse that rhymed, all with equal intensity. Moscow became the mecca for the eccentrics and malcontents of the world, and for some years Russia was in fact looser in morals than any other civilized country. Hatred for the capitalist world enabled the Bolsheviks to throw Russian czarist patriotism into the discard. They delighted in getting Russian troops to desert at the front, 
The Germans delighted in this too, but the Bolsheviks were certain they would have the last laugh, because they knew it was only a matter of weeks or months before the revolution, the inevitable revolution, forecast by Karl Marx's peculiar economics, broke out in Germany as well. The Russian devil-may-care attitude toward all established forms of society was perfectly characterized by Trotsky's flip-but-deadly answer to the German military negotiators at the Brest-Litovsk negotiations. When the Germans balked at some point, all right, said Trotsky, no war and no peace. The Germans insisted that if the Bolsheviks did not sign the dictated peace terms, the German army would make more war. Fine, said Trotsky in effect, he didn't mind. Go ahead and make war. It wouldn't worry him or his army. They would go somewhere else and would refuse to play games with capitalists. This stopped the Germans in their tracks. They did not want to send their troops into a starving country that roared with subversive doctrines. They knew that while Trotsky wasted their time quibbling over negotiations, his printing presses worked night and day, telling the German troops that the war was over, that capitalism was on its way out, that the workers' revolution was coming everywhere, for everybody, with food, peace, plenty, atheism, and all the other delights of the good Bolshevik life. The Russians finally signed the surrender treaty, but, in point of fact, the German divisions on the Eastern Front were contaminated by Bolshevism, and when they came back across Germany, they brought the message of freedom and peace with them. Germany did have an abortive communist revolution, partly because of Russian operations, though it was stopped by an alliance of the moderate socialists and the dependable remnants of the army. The Russians went on merrily through a living hell. For five more years, the Bolshevik leaders held their country together with wretched industrial production, poor food, bad weapons. They had amazingly high morale among their own select Bolshevik group, and against the common people they had two weapons, propaganda and terror. The terror was symptomatic of the first of the modern totalitarian dictatorships. Its domestic police role is not a part of psychological warfare. The Bolshevik propaganda was probably the finest propaganda effort ever known in history down to that time, down perhaps all the way to our own time. The political limit was beyond reach. Anything in the old world was fair game. Things the sober Soviet citizen of 1946 would regard with veneration were open to ridicule in 1919 to 1922. Patriotism, religion, national sovereignty, international law, treaties with or between capitalist states. There flowed from Russia a worldwide stream of propaganda, mostly clandestine, some of it overt. In every nation of the world, there was, to a greater or less degree, a red scare. The propaganda of the Bolsheviks was regarded as having mystical, subversive powers which no other operation could match. In retrospect, it seems absurd that anyone could have worried about the Americans of the 1920s revolting against their own constitution. But a lot of people, including the Attorney General of the United States, did indeed worry. They had cause for alarm, though not for the reasons they supposed. Much of the magic of Bolshevik propaganda arose from its taking up where British, French, and American propaganda left off. The psychological warfare of the Allies had made the sad mistake of promising a new, a better world to everyone on Earth. When the war ended and conditions went back to normal, many people in the world did not consider normalcy the fulfillment of that better world. The Bolshevik propaganda reaped the harvest which the Allied propagandist had sown and then left untended, Expectations whipped up beyond normal turned to Bolshevism when the Western democracies abandoned both domestic and foreign propaganda operations. The strategic advantage of Bolshevik propaganda was overwhelming. The Allies had gotten the world ready for it, so that the wild utopia of the Leninists temporarily made sense to millions. This does not mean that the Bolshevik propaganda of the 1920s was not good. It was good, technically, psychologically, politically, but good in terms of achieving an immediate scare at the cost of long-range confidence. The eventual cost to the Soviet Union was terrible. The Soviet government isolated itself and declared a condition of open psychological warfare against every other government on Earth, including the United States. This so exasperated Presidents Wilson, Harding, Coolidge, and Hoover that they refused to recognize the Soviet Union. The Bolshevik propaganda was carried by Russian government channels, Communist Party channels, the Communists not really being a political party anywhere, but using the name party to designate the hierarchy of a dogmatic, ruthless, and fanatical political religion. Trade unions, individual subversive operators, cover organizations, trade, consular, and other official missions, leaflets in the mails, posters, books, and other literature, 
Films, Radio. The theme throughout was plain. The world revolution is coming by inescapable economic laws discovered by our theory. The world revolution, which will come, will remove the owning classes from control of the productive capital and will put all capital in the hands of the workers. The expropriators will be expropriated. Thereupon, the economic laws we have found in Marx's books will cease their bad influence and will guarantee world peace, world prosperity, happiness, human freedom. This is not an appeal, they said. This is science. This is objective. We know. Listen. The communists harped on these basic themes. They waged political warfare along with the psychological. Every attempt of the non-communist countries to discuss the situation was termed conspiracies of the warmongers. The word democratic was reserved to the communists or to non-communists who were certain to cause communism no trouble. The communists invented an entirely new vocabulary, which the Soviet and other communist papers still use, with meanings that have the same emotional value, plus value, or that's good, as in America or Britain, but which have entirely different meanings in concrete practice. Democracy means free elections. Free elections mean that the people elect democratic leaders, but democratic leaders are not the people who are elected in non-communist countries. Non-communist leaders are usually dubbed tools or stooges of something. They are servile or reactionary. Real democratic leaders are only those people approved by the international communist movement. It knows by science. What was the net effect of such psychological warfare? In the first place, much use of common terms without regard to ultimate fulfillment means that communist propaganda is self-defeating. It can succeed only in situations of desperation, anarchy, or terror. That is satisfactory to the communist leaders because they think their science tells them that the capitalist states will lead to desperation, anarchy, and terror anyhow. Secondly, communist propaganda sacrifices all other values to the propaganda. One has to be a religious fanatic of the Marxist sort to turn it out. One has to be ready for a totally new creed in order to keep on accepting it. International understanding, patriotism, truthfulness, freedom of action, artistic conscience, all these are sacrificed to propaganda. In the end, everything is propaganda to the communist. Nothing which hurts communism can be true. They have their science. If you would like to look at this fabulous science, read The Communist Manifesto, V.I. Lenin's The Teachings of Karl Marx, and Stalin's latest current compilation of speeches, you will be impressed by the crazy logic, the genuine but ill-informed zeal. Third and most important, communist psychological warfare is continuous. The themes may change, sometimes provocative, sometimes almost conciliatory, but the machinery, the operation, does not. Communist propaganda is therefore seasoned and professional, dependent on a powerful police state at home, and on uneducated or emotionally ill fanatics abroad, except for those few countries where communism is so stable as to attract hard-headed or practical idealistic men. This Bolshevik success, rather than the splendid but short-lasting accomplishments of the Allies in World War I, kept psychological warfare on the map. Modern communism is permanent psychological warfare in action. The communist leaders unwittingly made a tremendous mistake between 1922 and 1927. They invited the military and political staff of the Chinese nationalists, Kuomintang, to cooperate with them. Filled with their own communist sense of certainty, it never occurred to them that anyone else could outsmart them. The Chinese did. Their military chief of mission in Moscow learned everything that the communists had to teach about irregular fighting, subversive propaganda, revolutionary situations, mass agitation. He then went home and got more communist aid to carry out the military phase of the Nationalist Revolution, which started underway in the summer of 1922. The old warlord armies were helpless in the face of agents, agitators, poster crews, student strikes, press propaganda, and indoctrinated troops. The most sensational war in modern Asia involved relatively little combat. The nationalist leader used all the communist psychological warfare techniques and added a few more of his own. His name was Chiang Kai-shek. In 1927, the communists began a debate in Moscow as to whether they had used the nationalists enough or not. One group said they might as well liquidate the nationalists, Sun Yat-senism, Chiang Kai-shek, and all. The other said they should use the nationalists a little longer to carry on the struggle against American, Japanese, and British imperialism. Chiang Kai-shek displayed a keen interest in these formal theoretical discussions, which, thanks to his Moscow training, he understood perfectly. 
While the communists were still debating when and how to hijack him, he hijacked them. In the fall of 1927, he turned against them, using the weapons of terror and propaganda, and then shifting to the more solid ground of economic development. They have not forgiven him. Nationalist China, to this day, possesses a working duplicate of the Moscow propaganda facilities, which the communists, unconscious of the humor of it, call fascists. What is anti-communist, for whatever cause, is fascist, they say. The Russian Revolution of 1917 to 1922 and the Chinese Revolution of 1922 to 1927 represent the situations created by a communist psychological warfare. Since that time, except for Spain, communist psychological warfare has failed in every single attempt to come to power outside Russia. Following World War II, communist psychological warfare proved itself capable of holding countries only after the military force had occupied or won them. The magic has gone out of communist propaganda. It can keep control only with heavy military pressure behind it. But in the far past, it has been capable of winning, as in Russia and China, without outside military aid. With a renovation of techniques, doctrines, and personnel, it may do so again. Figure 13. Surrender Leaflet from the AEF Though this American combat leaflet from World War I copies the original form of the German Feldpostkarte, field postcard, an early precursor of the V-mail form, it is not black propaganda since neither source nor intent is concealed. Quote, when you are taken prisoner by the Americans, give this to the first officer who checks your identities. The prisoner is commanded to fill in his own battle order history. By marking out appropriate items, he indicates whether he is hurt or not, and can explain that he is well cared for and fed, quote, beef, white bread, potatoes, beans, plums, genuine bean coffee, milk, butter, tobacco, etc. End of figure 13. End of section 9. Read by Eli Bishop, San Francisco, March 20th, 2021. Section 10 of Psychological Warfare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Psychological Warfare of Hall M. A. Line Barger. Chapter 6 A. Psychological Warfare in World War II, Part 1. Chapter 6 Psychological Warfare in World War II. Bolshevik accomplishments in psychological warfare were often regarded as part of the peculiar mischief of Marxism, not as techniques which could be learned and used by other people. Similarly, the history-making sweep of the Chinese nationalist armies northward in 1922 to 1927 was considered to be specially and incomprehensibly Chinese. Possible lessons which might have been learned from Chinese communist psychological warfare were often left unheeded by officials and students in the West. Meanwhile, Germany, the greatest power of Europe, had been fighting bitter internal psychological warfare battles which looked like heated internal politics. Not until Adolf Hitler assumed the Reich's chancellorship and began using his brown shirt methods for foreign affairs that other people wake up to the existence and application of the new weapon. The War College files, for example, show that not one single officer was assigned full-time to study of these problems during 1925 to 1935. For the entire period 1919 to 1929, there are listed only two War College research papers on the subject. Yet the American army was far from negligent. It was an excellent army, though crippled by outright poverty of personnel and materials. The army was simply American, and like the rest of America for a while took the world for granted. The National Socialist German Workers' Party, as Hitler called his movement, was a conglomerate built up around a few determined fanatics. The Nazis do not appear to have believed their own doctrines to anything like the degree to which the communists believed theirs. From the first, the Nazis regarded propaganda very cautiously as a new fierce instrument which led to the accomplishment of modern power. 
The communists had proclaimed that democracy was a fake. The Nazis agreed. The communists have shown that a minority with a sacred mission of its own invention could get mass support for a government that claimed to be for the people, even though it was obviously not by the people, nor of them. The Nazis took this as a model. The communists have shown that a modern man-god could be set up and worshipped in a 20th century state and called leader, those hidden Russian. The Nazis elevated the Soviet practice all the way into a principle, the principle of the leader, few her in German. The communists have shown that an organization calling itself a party, actually a quasi-religious hierarchy with strong internal discipline, definite membership, and active organizational components, could control 50 times its own membership. The Nazis organized the same general sort of party, copying the Italian fascists in part, but copying more from the direct example of the German communists right in front of them. The communists have shown that such a movement needed to have youth branches, women's organizations, labor sections, clubs of its own, and so on, calling this mass organization. The Nazis copied this too. The machinery of Nazism was in many ways a copy of communism, applied to allegedly different ends. The Nazis had an Aryan myth, the communists had their pseudo-economics. But the important thing about them both was the destruction of the end by the means. The problem of getting and keeping power despite the people was so obsessive that propaganda became all-important. Theoretically, the end to the Nazi German world rule to the communists, the fulfillment of history and universal communism, was the most important thing. But since any means at any time which led to that end was good, and since the party bosses were the sole ones who could determine whether a particular action led to the very remote end or not. The outcome in both Russia and Germany became the consciousness seeking of power for its own sake. The new psychological warfare, a cause as well as a means of World War II, arose from the subjection of other considerations to propaganda. The propaganda addict takes everything with a ton of salt. What he does believe is lost in what he doesn't believe. The ordinary controls of civilized life, regard for truth, regard for law, respect for neighbors, obedience to good manners, love of God, cease to operate effectively because the propaganda dizzy man sees in everything its propaganda content and nothing else. Everything from a girl dancing on a stage to an ecclesiastic officiating in a cathedral is either for him or against him. Nothing is innocent. Nothing is pleasurable. Everything is connected with his diseased apprehension of power. Before he gets power, he hates the people who have power. He does not trust their intelligence, esteem their personalities, believe in their goodwill or credit their motives. They must be scum because they hold power when he, the propaganda-infatuated man, is a member of the group that should hold it. Yet when such a man comes to power, he hates his colleagues and comrades. Remembering the cold, cynical way in which he himself sought power, knowing that his brother fanatics have the same ruthless arrogance, the propaganda-using party man cannot trust anyone. Blood purges, mass trials, liquidations, removal of families, concealment of crimes. All these result from the establishment of propaganda in an overdeveloped role. It is against such people that we, ordinary folk, Americans, dared wait psychological warfare during World War II. Propaganda had grown into ideology. The world was convulsed with monstrous new religions. For instance, the greatest journalist of the Soviet Union, Karl Radak, was placed on trial for treason. He was asked by the prosecutor, Vyshinsky, these actions of yours were deliberate? 
Radak answered, Apart from sleeping, I have never in my life committed any undeliberate actions. This answer sums up the mood of the totalitarian who is obsessed by propaganda. He comes to believe that all activity, whether his own or of other people, has meaning. He had developed this sense of responsibility that made him violate tenets which Americans in a free society regard as fundamental to human nature. Things like self-respect, kindliness, the love of family, pity for the unfortunate. This kind of mentality was found chiefly in the national socialist and communist states, and to a lesser degree in dictatorships such as Italy. By contrast, reactionary Japan was almost democratic. This mentality makes it possible for the ruler to control his own people enough to undertake warfare psychologically waged. Without domestic fanaticism and domestic terror, governments have to fall back on psychological warfare. That is the mere supplementing of politics and military operations by propaganda. It is vain to expect a free people in a free country to submit to such humiliating control, even for the purpose of winning a war. What made the psychological warfare World War II peculiar was the fact that our enemies fought one kind of war, warfare psychologically waged or total war, and we fought them back with another. Theoretically, it is possible to argue that we had no business succeeding, but we did succeed. The Pre-Belligerent Stages the propaganda-cautious Axis states had first to control their own people enough to wage aggressive war. They then had to split their possible enemies to make piecemeal victory possible. They had to stay on good terms with the Soviet Union, Hitler till 1941, Japan till the last week of war. They had to frighten their immediate enemies while assuring their eventual enemies. This calls for a great deal of propaganda. Pre-belligerent operations required extensive use of black propaganda. Since their political systems aroused hostility and anger in audiences, which they wished to address, the aggressors sought to disguise their propaganda. They used pacifist groups to keep the democracies from rearming. Militarist groups were encouraged to keep the democracies from undertaking domestic reforms or discussing military matters with Russia. Financial groups were contacted to preserve the fiction of normal international relations. Cultural groups were employed to preserve friendliness for their respective nationalities as such. The Japanese did a little global propaganda and for a while subsidized several magazines in this country, but in general they concentrated their main effort in the immediate area of their military operations. It was the Germans who developed worldwide pre-belligerent propaganda to a fine art. They exploited every possible disunity which could contribute to the weakness of an enemy. They were not choosy about collaborators. If the Communist Party of the United States lent a hand, as it did between September 1939 and June 1941, terming the war an imperialist war, after Russia got in, the war was called the Democratic Anti-Fascist War, the Nazis did not object. They willingly listened to men who had fantastic schemes for world peace and later used such men as aids in getting appeasement. They tried to rouse Catholics against Communists, Communists against Democrats, Gentiles against Jews, Whites against Negroes, the poor against the rich, the rich against the poor, British against Americans, Americans against British, anyone against anyone, as long as it delayed action against Germany and weakened the enemy potential. They went to special pains to organize German-speaking minorities in non-German countries, but they never neglected using people who had no open connection with Nazism at all. This work was performed so far as the open propaganda itself was concerned through the instrumentalities of the Reich's Ministry for Propaganda 
and popular enlightenment under control of that malignant intelligence, Paul Joseph Goebbels. The broader program was not solely a publicity matter and was operated chiefly through party channels. The German capacity to learn was demonstrated by the contrast between World War I and World War II. In World War I, the Germans lacked political motifs, professionalism, and coordination. In World War II, they had all of these. German Accomplishments Three basic propaganda accomplishments were achieved by the Germans. First, in the political warfare field, they succeeded in making large sections of world opinion believe that the world's future was a choice between communism and fascism. Since they and the communists agreed on this, the point seemed well taken. Actually, there is no historical or economic justification for supposing that those two forms of dictatorship constitute a real choice in the first place, or that the civilized and truly free countries need ever depart from their ancient freedoms in the second place. Second, in the strategic field, they made each victim seem the last. There was still hope that war would not arise, even while the Spanish Republic was being strangled before the eyes of the world. The British hoped that they could stay out even after Czechoslovakia fell. Astute though the Russians were, they hoped to stay out even after Britain and France fought. And as late as December 6, 1941, many Americans still believed that the United States would avoid war. This suited the Nazis' book, Take Them On One at a Time. Thirdly, in the purely psychological field, the Germans used outright fright. They made their own people afraid of communist liquidations. They brazenly showed movies of their blitz rigs to the governing groups of prospective victims, just to lower morale. When one nation is really ready to fight, and the other knows it, the nation that doesn't want to fight can be reduced to something resembling a nervous breakdown by constant uncertainty. The author was in Chongqing during the summer of 1940 when the German's propaganda agent, Wolf Shenke, showed these German movies to the Chinese leaders. The author asked for an invitation and did not get it. It was for Chinese only, said Shenke, but the Chinese were not awed or made fearful of the power of Japan's ally. They simply said, nice movie, that's the kind of thing we used to do in the Qin dynasty, and let it go at that. The British-German Radio War With the outbreak of war, the British and Germans found radio at hand. Neither had to change broadcasting policies a great deal. Each could reach almost all of Europe on standard wave. Each could jam the other's wavelengths, never with complete success, and the struggle centered around a contest for attention. Who could get the most attention? Who could get the most credence? Who could affect the beliefs, emotions, loyalties of friendly, neutral, and enemy listeners the most? Figure 14, radio program leaflet NCO 1944. These leaflets were dropped by the Germans on American troops at NCO in April 1944. They show an interesting tie-in between two forms of propaganda. The counter-propaganda to the British Broadcasting Corporation is slight. Chief emphasis is on entertainment value of the German radio programs. From photograph taken by Signal Corps and released through War Department Bureau of Public Relations, end of figure 14. The Germans showed evidence of real planning. Their public relations facilities were perfectly geared to their propaganda facilities. When the Germans wanted to build the British up for a letdown, they withheld military news favorable to themselves. During the fight for Norway, 
They even spread rumors of British successes, knowing that if British morale went up for a day or two, it would come down all the harder when authentic bad news came through the war office. When the Germans wanted to turn on a war of nerves, their controlled press screamed against the victim. When they turned it off, their press was silent. The Germans thus had the advantage of not needing to make much distinction between news, publicity, and propaganda. All three served the same purpose, the immediate needs of the Reich. Figure 15, Radio Leaflet Surrender Form Anzio 1944. Willingness of prisoners to surrender sometimes involves speedy communication of their names to their families, as in the preceding illustrations. At other times, prisoners are very unwilling to be identified and want their faces masked. This leaflet combines radio program announcements with the standard surrender pass. End of figure 15. The Germans put on the following types of news propaganda. Number one, official OKW Oberkommando der Wehrmacht or Wehrmacht HQ communiques. These rarely departed from the truth, though they naturally gave favorable situations in detail and unfavorable ones scantily. Number two, official government releases marked by considerable dignity, possessing more political content than the military communiques. Number three, news of the world, part of it repeated from the British radio, part plain non-controversial news for stuffing, and part, the most important part, news of genuine curiosity value to the listeners, but which, at the same time, had the propaganda effect of damaging belief in the Allied cause. Number four, feature items comparable to feature articles in newspapers, which try to concentrate on a single topic or theme. Number five, recognized commentators speaking openly and officially. Number six, pseudonymous commentators pretending to speak from a viewpoint different from that of the German government, but who were announced as being broadcast over the official German radio system. Of these British traitor William Joyce, since hanged, known as Lord Ha Ha, was the most notorious. His colleagues were the American traitors Fred Keltenbach and Douglas Chandler. At the end of the war, Chandler was tried in Boston and sentenced to life imprisonment, but Keltenbach fell into Soviet custody and died. Number seven, falsified stations, which pretended to have nothing at all to do with Germany. The new British Broadcasting Company transmitted defeatist propaganda with a superficial anti-German tone. Others took a strong communist line and sought to build up opposition to the British government within England. Number eight, falsifies quotations on the official German radio. Sometimes it was easier to make up an imaginary foreign source, ostensibly quoted in the German program, rather than to set up a special fake program for the purpose. Number nine, planted news sources quoted on the German radio. A great deal of the German news was called out of Swedish, Spanish, and other papers which were either secretly German controlled or which, as in the case of the United States papers involved, were so sympathetic to Germany that they voluntarily printed German-inspired news, which the Nazis could then quote from a neutral or enemy source. Number 10. Open falsification of BBC, British Broadcasting Company, the official British agency materials, as which the Germans were not necessarily got by their ordinary listeners, but at which BBC got them. Number 11, ghost voices and ghost programs transmitted on legitimate Allied wavelengths when the Allied transmitters went off the air or else interrupting the Allied broadcasts by transmitting simultaneously. Figure 16, invitation to treason. 
Another German leaflet, also from NCO, combines the radio surrender notice form with a political invitation to Britishers to commit treason. The Germans had a few British traitors in their Legion of St. George and a few American civilian renegades, but in general this line of appeal was useless. The last paragraph of the appeal is such naive trickery that did probably arouse suspicion in the minds of the men it was supposed to persuade. End of figure 16. Of all these, it was soon found that the communiques and government releases were the most important. Although the bulk of the station time had to be diversified with other types of program, the Germans and British both found that radio was important as a starting point for news. It was more valuable to have the press, as in England, or rumor, as in Germany, pass along an item than it was to rely on the direct listeners. Each side sought to make opinion analyses of the enemy. Some of the British studies were clever in technique. The radio propagandists had to ask themselves why they made propaganda. It is simple to make mischief, spreading rumors, or putting practical jokes into circulation. Such antics do not necessarily advance a military political cause. Sustained psychological warfare required, as both British and German radio soon found out, a deliberate calculation of the particular enemy frame of mind to be cultivated over a long period of time, when radio stations had to broadcast day after day whether anything happened or not, it became difficult to continue to circulate news without faking it and losing the confidence of enemy listeners. End of section 10. Read by Shauna, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, March 21st, 2021. Section 11 of Psychological Warfare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Psychological Warfare by Paul M. A. Leinbarger. Chapter 6b, Psychological Warfare in World War II, Part 2. On the German side, the German radio had the forced attention of the entire world. As long as the Germans had the strategic initiative for field warfare, they were in a position to make new scoops whenever it suited them. The security policies of the Allies often gave the Germans a monopoly of news on a given operation. There was never any danger that the Germans were not listened in on. The danger the Nazi operators had to worry about was disbelief, and the Germans tried to keep a moderate tone in their news, tried to prepare between crisis for the news that would become sensational during crisis. The Germans soon learned a basic principle of war radio. They learned not to permit radio to run ahead of their military capacities. At first, when their spokesman promised attainment of a given goal by a given time, and the army failed to live up to the schedule, the British radio picked up the unfulfilled promise and dangled it before the world as proof that the Germans were weakening. The Germans thereupon effected army radio liaison so that the radio people could promise only those things which the army was reasonably sure of delivering. When Allied propaganda analysis woke up to this fact, it added one more source of collaboratory intelligence to be checked. The British had their hands full getting news out in the languages of the occupied countries. It was immensely difficult for them to follow the politics of the underground. German counter-espionage under the deadly Shisher high stand made it difficult to keep track of opinion in the occupied countries. Work against Nazism depended on the temper of the people. Propaganda against collaborators had to distinguish between outright evil collaborators and those public officials who stayed on out of a sense of mistaken or necessary duty. The British did not necessarily announce themselves at any time as anti-communists, 
and collaborated for short-range purposes with communists all over the continent. Mr. Churchill himself shifted his North Balkan political support from Mikhailovich to Bras Taito. But it was vitally necessary to know just how and when to change support from one group to the other. Since the undergrounds had very few radio transmitters, and none of these was reliable during most of the war, the British faced the task of providing radio facilities for all of the occupied countries. The consequence was to make their radio warfare highly sensitive to politics. They had to address the right people with the right language at the right time. On penalty of failure, to effect this end, the British set up an agency which never had an American counterpart. The Political Worker Executive, known by its initials PWE. This agency had representation from the War Office, the Admiralty, the Foreign Office, and the Ministry of Information. The PWE was the policy servicing and coordinating agency for all British external propaganda and left the execution of its operations to the Ministry of Information, MOI, and to the British Broadcasting Corporation, BBC. British radio propaganda maintained a high level of effectiveness. American officials and propagandists often complained that the British were running the entire war in their own national interest. The charge was unjust. The British had facilities for knowing exactly what they wished to do and when they wished to do it. The Americans came along without clear policies or propaganda purposes. It was natural that the British should take the lead and let the Americans string along if they wished. Furthermore, the British were usually scrupulous and yielding to America's primary interests in areas they felt to be American problems, Japan, China, the Philippines. They were least cooperative when the OWI tried to spread the ideals of Mr. Henry Wallace in Burma or to explain the CIOPAC to the Hindus. No clear victor emerged from the Anglo-German radio war. The victory of the United Nations gave the British the last say. In the opinion of many, the British were one more ahead of the United States. They have profited by their World War I experience and by their two years operational lead, which they had on the Americans. But side by side with the Germans, it is harder to appraise their net achievements. The British had immense political advantages. The resentment of a conquered continent worked for them, but they had disadvantages too. The enemy worked from the starting point of a fanatical and revolutionary philosophy. The British had the tedious old world to offer. The post-war interrogations of civilians in Germany show that an amazingly high proportion of them had heard BBC broadcasts and that many of the ideas and attitudes which the British propagandized were actually transmitted to the enemy. On the British side, it is almost impossible to find any surviving traces of the effect of Nazi propaganda. Had the war been purely a radio war, this test might be conclusive. But if psychological warfare supplements combat, combat certainly supplements propaganda. The Great British and American air raids over Europe unquestionably created an intense interest in British and American plans and purposes. It is historically interesting to note that the Germans went on fighting psychological warfare even after the death of Hitler and the surrender of the jury-rigged government of Grass Admiral Karl Duens which functioned 623 May 1945 at Flensburg under Allied toleration. This resulted from the inability of the 21st Army Group swiftly to initiate information control. The Flensburg radio, still under Nazi direction, emphasized Anglo-American differences with the Soviet Union in every possible way short of direct appeals. 
German naval radio also carried on propaganda for a while, using topics such as the sportsmanship of the German surrender, the hatred of the German navy for atrocities committed by the Nazis, and the usefulness of the phantom government to the Western Allies. Black Propaganda Subversive operations formed a major part of the Nazi pre-belligerent effort. The Germans planted or converted quislings whenever they could, and when they failed to have time to pre-arrange stooges, they converted them rapidly after arrival. A major cause of the German defeat is to be found in the fantastic political policies followed in the Ukraine and neighboring Soviet Socialist Republics. In these areas, despite the Soviet boast that Russia had no fifth columnists within her borders, the Germans found thousands of helpers. The Nazis organized a large army, General Valsov's Russian Army of Liberation, out to Soviet prisoners, and these troops were usable and docile. But in the political warfare field, the Germans were too cocksure. They let their men go wild in orgies of cruelty against the local population. The economic system went entirely to pieces. The natives then became convinced that the worst possible conditions of Sovietism were infinitely better than the best that Nazism could offer. These subversive groups were formed by political means. Propaganda aid was offered to such an extent that it was often difficult to tell how much of the Quisling movement was spontaneously native and how much mere cover for a purely German operation. In the latter phase of the European war, the Russian communists followed the German Nazi example of having tame natives ready to take over the government of the occupied areas. In Poland, the so-called Lublin Committee took over the government from the constitutional Polish government in exile at London. In Yugoslavia, the Russian-trained propagandist, Tito, seized the leadership from the recognized Minister of War, Dreja Mikhailovich, after the British and American governments had shifted their support to him. Later, Mikhailovich was put to death. The Russian army brought along to Germany a considerable number of German communists. In Czechoslovakia, the strength of the constitutional regime was such as to compel the pro-Russians to allow the pre-war leadership a precarious toehold in the new government. The same cadres of sympathetic persons who has been useful as propaganda sources for psychological warfare during the period of hostilities became useful instruments of domination after hostilities ended. The British and Americans, with their belief that government should spring from the liberated and defeated peoples, did not prepare and equip comparable groups to rival the communist candidates. Only in Italy and Greece did the friends of the Western Allies stay in power and then only because they were the nearest equivalent of the jury authorities. In the Scandinavian and the Low Countries, the national leadership re-emerged without prodding or interference by the Western Allies. They passed from the sphere of psychological warfare, that is, of being someone's cover, to that of world politics. Specific black propaganda operations were of considerable value. However, black propaganda is more difficult to appraise than overt propaganda. Analytical and historical studies, gauging the results obtained by black operations in relation to their cost, are not yet available. American Operations, OWI and OSS Long after the outbreak of war in the Far East, and even after the coming of full war in Europe, neither the civilian nor military portions of the American government possessed propaganda facilities. This is not as serious as it may sound, for the United States is lucky in possessing a people well agreed on most fundamentals. 
the commercial press, radio, magazine, and book publishing facilities of the country, for the most part, expressed a national point of view without being prodded. The isolationist issue never brought in the question of America's basic character. Before the war and even after the government entered the field, private American news and publishing continued to engage in operations which had the effect, if not the intention, of propaganda. OWI, at its most vigorous, could scarcely have reached the audience that had been built up by the Time Life Fortune Group, not to mention the Reader's Digest, both of which became truly global in coverage during the war years. American movies already had a worldwide audience. The propaganda turned out unwittingly by such agencies may not have had the gloss and political smoothness of Dr. Paul Joseph Goebbels' best productions, but it had something no government propaganda had the possession of a readership, all of which was unmistakably voluntary, obtained by the appeal of authentic interest in entertainment, and proved by an ability to charm money out of people's pockets. The American problem of propaganda was thus not a simple one. Total psychological warfare was out of reach if we were to remain a free people. Otherwise, the simple seeming thing to have done would have been to put a government supervisor in every newspaper, radio station, and magazine in the country, and according to the whole bunch of them to gather the national interest. Simple seeming. Actually, such an attempt would have been utter madness. Touching off a furious political fight within the country and meeting legal obstacles that would have remained instrumental as long as there was a constitution with courts to enforce it. The simplest official action which the United States could take was therefore hedged about by the presence of private competitors who would watch it enviously, jealous of their established rights and privileges, and by the operational interference which vigorous private media would have on public media. The then Mr. or Colonel, later General William Donovan, had tasted the delights of political warfare in President Roosevelt sent him to Belgrade to talk the Serbs into fighting instead of surrendering. He was successful. The Serbs fought. He came back to the United States with a practical knowledge of what political warfare could do if qualified personnel operated on the spot. The outbreak of the Russo-German war lent urgency to American action in the political intelligence field as well as in the propaganda field. On 11 July 1941, President Roosevelt issued an order appointing Colonel Donovan as Coordinator of Information. The agency became known by the initial COI. The primary mission of COI was the collection of information and its processing for immediate use. Large numbers of experts were brought into its research and analysis branch designed to do for the United States in weeks what the research facilities of the Germans and Japanese had done for them over a matter of years. The inflow of material was tremendous and the gearing of scholarship to the war effort produced large quantities of political, sociological, geographic, economic, and other monographs, most of them carefully classified secret. Even when they were copied out of books in the Library of Congress. However, it was not the research wing of the COI that entered the broadcasting field. Radio work was first done by an agency within COI called FIS, Foreign Information Service. In the few months before Pearl Harbor, the group became organized in New York under the leadership of Robert Sherwood the dramatist, and got his start in supplying the radio companies with material. The radio scripts were poorly checked. There was chaos in the matter of policy. Little policing was possible, and the outputs reflected the enthusiasm of whatever individual happened to be near the microphone. Colonel Donovan had moved into this work 
without written and exclusive authorization from the White House. Hence, there followed a lamentable interval of almost two years, internal struggle between American agencies, a struggle not really settled until the summer of 1943, well into the second year of war. The occasion for struggle arose from lack of uniform day-to-day -day propaganda policy and from an unclear division of authority between the operating agencies, but the work was done. Radio operations had to be coordinated with strategy on the one hand and foreign policy on the other, and we sought to develop methods for doing this. It is significant that all the major difficulties of American psychological warfare were administrative and not operational. There was never any serious trouble about getting the facilities the writers, the translators, the telecommunications technicians. What caused trouble were problems of personality and personal power, resulting chiefly from the lack of any consensus on the method or organization of propaganda administration. Military Intelligence Division had created an extremely secret psychological warfare office at about the same time that CCOI was established. This had brought intelligence and policy functions, but no operational facilities. It was headed by Lieutenant Colonel Percy Black, who began auspiciously by putting Dr. Edwin Guthrie in office as his senior psychological advisor. This ultra-quiet office was called Special Study Group. It and the COI developed very loose cooperative relations, consisting chiefly of SSG making suggestions to COI what COI might or might not use as it saw fit. Meanwhile, the Rockefeller office was conducting independent broadcasts to Latin America. The Office of Facts and Figures was dispensing domestic information, and at the height of the psychological warfare campaigning, there were at least nine unrelated agencies in Washington, all directly connected with psychological warfare, and none actually subject to the control of any of the others. A year of wrangling produced the solution after a joint psychological warfare committee had been set up under the Joint Chiefs of Staff and had failed to fulfill an effective policy supervising function. On 13 June 1942, the President created the Office of War Information. This agency was given control directly or indirectly over all domestic propaganda and over white propaganda abroad, except for the Western Hemisphere, which remained under the Rockefeller Committee in the State Department. The FIS was taken from the COI, and the COI took on the new name of OSS, Office of Strategic Services, under which it retained three major functions. Number one, continuation of scholastic and informal intelligence. Number two, black propaganda operations given explicit authority only in March 1943. Number three, subversive operations in collaboration with regular military authority. The OWI was placed under Mr. Elmer Davis, a Rhodes Scholar and novelist who has become one of the nation's most popular radio commentators. The FIS was perpetuated under the control of Mr. Robert Sherwood, who had a most extraordinary coterie of odd personalities assisting him. Socialist refugees, advertising men, psychologists, psychoanalytics of both the licensed and lay varieties, professional promoters, theatrical types, German professors, a commercial attaché, young men just out of college, oil executives, and popular authors, novelists, slick writers, Pulitzer winners, pulp writers, humorists, poets, and a professional pro-Japanese writer, fresh off the Imperial Japanese Embassy payroll. The War Department Agency under the Military Intelligence Service of G2 
had been renamed Psychological Warfare Branch and had executed within the G2 structure the equivalent of a knight's move in chess, ending up at a new place on the two with no observable change in function or authority. It had passed under the authority of Colonel, later Brigadier General Oscar Solbert, a West Pointer with wide international and business experience. He had been out of the army as a top official with Eastman Kodak, after a cosmopolitan army career, was sent him all over Europe and gave him one tour of duty as a White House aide. With the establishment of OWI, Colonel Solbert's office visit parted like an amoeba. The civilian half of Psychological Warfare Branch with a few officers, went over to OWI to be a brain trust for the foreign broadcast experts who failed to welcome this accession of talent. The military half remained as an MIS agency until 31 December 1943, when OWI abolished its half and MIS cooperated by wiping out the other, leaving the War Department in the middle of a war with no official psychological warfare agency whatever, merely some liaison officers. Psychological warfare became the responsibility of designated individual officers in OPD, the Operations Division of the General Staff, an outfit celebrated for conscientious overwork, as well as MIS and the War Department got along very nicely. Meanwhile, OWI and OSS fought one of the many battles of Washington, each seeking control of the foreign propaganda. The DC and Manhattan newspapers ran columns on this fight, along with news of the fighting in Russia, Libya, and the Pacific. For one glorious moment of OSS, it seemed that the president had signed over all foreign propaganda functions conducted outside the United States to OSS, cutting the OWI out of everything except its New York and San Francisco transmitters. The OWI was stricken with gloom and collective indigestion. The next day, the mistake was rectified, and OWI triumphantly planned raids on the jurisdiction of OSS. Meanwhile, the following things were happening. Highly classified plans for psychological warfare were being drafted for both the Joint and Combined Chiefs of Staff. These were discussed at various meetings and then classified a little higher, whereupon they were locked up lest the propaganda writers and broadcasters see them and break security on them by obeying and applying them. Broadcast thousands of words in dozens of languages were transmitted to everyone on earth. They were written by persons who had little if any contact with federal policy and none with the military establishment except for formal security. The plans at the top bore no observable relation to the operations at the bottom. When the Washington agencies wanted to find out what the broadcasts really were saying, the actual working offices at New York and San Francisco, their feelings hurt at not having been consulted by their joint chiefs, refused on their security ground, to let anyone see a word of what they were sending out. This baffled other Washington agencies a great deal. The author, who was then detailed from the War Department to OWI, outflanked this move in one instance by getting a report on a San Francisco Japanese broadcast from the Navy Department. It had been monitored by an American submarine out in the Pacific. Large overseas offices were set up at various foreign locations. Some of these went down to work quickly, efficiently, smoothly, and did a first-class job of presenting wartime America to foreign peoples. Others, with the frailties of jerry-built government agencies, 
lapsed into inefficiency, wild goose chases, or internal quarrels. Lastly, the poor British officials continue to wander around Washington, looking for their American opposite numbers in the propaganda fields, looking for one and always finding a dozen. This was in 1942 to 1943. By 1945, this had all become transformed into a large, well-run, well-integrated organization. Three weeks before Japan fell, the OWI finally prepared an official index of his propaganda directives, that is, of the official statement of what kinds of propaganda to make, what kinds not to make. The overseas units had been associated with the Metropolitan Shortwave. Personnel had been disciplined. Techniques had become more precise. Under the command of Lieutenant Commander Alexander Layton, an MD who was also a psychiatrist and anthropologist, careful techniques were devised for the analysis of Japanese and German morale. Comparable, though this similar work on Europe had been done by a staff associated with Harold Laswell. The propaganda expert, Leonard W. Dobb, had been appointed controlling and certifying officer for every single order of importance. The military relationship had been clarified. The War Department, acting through G2, had re-established a psychological warfare office under the new name of Propaganda Branch, under the successive commands of Lieutenant Colonel John B. Stanley, Lieutenant Colonel Bruce Buttles, and Colonel Dana W. Johnston. The new branch undertook no operations whatever, but connected War Department with OWI and OSS for policy and liaison, and represented one half of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. An appropriate naval officer from the comparable office representing the other half at the weekly policy meetings of OWI. Military needs in psychological warfare have been settled by regarding the theaters in this respect as autonomous and leaving to their respective theater commanders the definition of their relationship with OWI and OSS and their use of each. OSS and OWI had passed the stage of rival growth and consulted one another enough to prevent operational interference. Each had sufficient military or naval supervision to prevent interference with cryptographic security, communication, and deception operations. Figure 17, Anti-Radio Leaflet Sometimes ground-distributed leaflets were used in an attempt to counteract enemy radio propaganda. This leaflet circulated in France by the Nazis uses the form of an allied leaflet and accuses the armed SS of wanting such things as a decent Europe and end to atrocious killings every 25 years and a worthy life. Allied broadcasters are identified as Jews. End of figure 17. Figure 18, anti-exhibit leaflet. In the China theater, we heard that the Japanese had organized a big exhibit in Canton showing the starved and apathetic population some pieces of shot down planes as demonstration of defeat of American air power. We made up this leaflet quickly and dropped it on the city while the exhibit was still in progress. China, 1944. End of figure 18. End of section 11. Read by Shauna in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Section 12 of Psychological Warfare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Psychological Warfare by Paul M. A. Leinbarger, Chapter 6 C. Psychological Warfare in World War II, Part 3. The Lessons 
The major draw of psychological warfare passed to the theaters. In some theaters, this was kept by the commander directly under his own immediate supervision, and OWI was used simply as a propaganda service of supply. In others, OWI was an almost independent agent. In some places, OWI worked with OSS, as in the European theater, and others independently, as in the China-Burma-India theater. In one, it worked completely without OSS, SWPA, since General MacArthur did not let OSS into his theater at all. OSS got in the general area anyhow, with Navy permission. It turned up blissfully highly nautical and sapien. These theater establishments were the ones that set up local standard wave programs, which the enemy could hear in volume. They provided the loudspeaker units, which were taken right into combat. They serviced the ground and air combat echelons with leaflets as needed. They moved along behind the advances, opening up information booths and explaining to liberated natives why each did not get the four freedoms the three meals a day, and the new pair of shoes he thought he had been promised by the American radio. These military establishments are better described under operations, since it was their functioning which defined, down to the limit of present-day experience, American military doctrine concerning the conduct of psychological warfare in theaters of war. In concluding the historical summary of psychological warfare, it is interesting to look at three major points which emerge plainly from the experience of World War II. Points which either were not discovered in World War I or else failed to make an impact on the minds of the responsible officials and informed citizens. The first of these is simple. It became almost a litany with Colonel Oscar Solbert when he sought to indoctrinate civilian geniuses with military properties. Psychological warfare is a function of command. If command chooses to exercise it, it will succeed. If command neglects it, or if it is operated independently of military command, it will either interfere with the conduct of war proper, or it will be wasted. It took us two bitter years to learn this lesson. Political warfare cannot be waged without direct access to the White House, and the Department of State. Field operations cannot be conducted unless they meet at some common staff point with field command. No one can succeed in improvising alleged policy and presenting that policy as United States policy and get away with it. Sooner or later, actual policy catches up with him. In the field, no civilian can write leaflets for air or ground distribution unless he has some idea of when, where, why, and how they will be used. The second lesson of World War II set forth by Colonel Solbert and Dr. Edwin Guthrie was simply this. Atrocity propaganda begets atrocity. Everyone knows that war is cruel, sad, shameful to the soul of man. Everyone knows that it hurts, degrades, injures the human body. Everyone knows that it is not pleasant to undergo, nor even to look at. If any particular war is worth fighting, it is worth fighting for some reason other than the crazily obvious one, the fact that it is already war. It is a poor statesman or general who cannot give his troops and people an inspiring statement of their own side in war. Atrocity propaganda reacts against war in general, Meanwhile, it goes the enemy into committing more atrocities. The anti-atrocity rule was not lifted in World War II, save for one or two notable exceptions, such as President Roosevelt's delayed announcement of the Japanese having executed the Doolittle Flyers, except for the specific purpose of preventing some atrocity that seemed about to occur in a known situation from actually occurring. Atrocity propaganda heats up the imagination of troops, makes them more liable to nervous or psychoneurotic strain. It increases the chances of one's own psych committing atrocities 
in revenge for the ones alleged or reported. Furthermore, atrocity propaganda scares the enemy out of surrendering and gives the enemy command an easier responsibility in persuading their troops to fight with last-ditch desperation. The third lesson was equally simple. America does not normally produce psychological warfare personnel in peacetime, and if such personnel are to be needed again, they will have to be trained especially and in advance. Qualifications for Psychological Warfare Effective psychological warfare requires the combination of four skills in a single individual. Number one, an effective working knowledge of U.S. government administration and policy, so that the purposes and plans of the government may be correctly interpreted. Number two, an effective knowledge of correct military and naval procedure and the staff operations together with enough understanding of the arts of warfare, whether naval or military, to adjust propaganda utterance to military situations and to practical propaganda operations in forms which will dovetail. Number three, professional knowledge of the media of information, or of at least one of them, book publishing, magazines, newspapers, radio advertising, and its various branches, or of some closely related field, practical political canvassing, visual or adult education, etc. Number four, intimate professional level understanding of a given area, Italy, Japan, New Guinea, Kwantung, Algeria, based on first-hand acquaintance, knowledge of the language, traditions, history, practical politics, and customs. On top of these, there may be a possible fifth skill to make the individual perfect. Number five, professional scientific understanding of psychology anthropology, sociology, history, political science, or a comparable field. The man who steps up and says that he meets all five of these qualifications is a liar, a genius, or both. There is no perfect psychological warrior. However, and then the qualification is important, each psychological warfare team represents a composite of these skills. Some members have two or three to start with, the others virtually none, but all of the personnel, except for men with peculiarly specialized jobs, ordinance experts, cryptographers, translators, calligraphers, end up with a professionalism that blends these together. They may not meet professional standards as officials, officers, journalists, Japanologists, psychoanalytics when they return from psychological warfare operations against the Japanese, but they have met men who are one or more of these and have picked up the rudiments to each skill enough at least to suspect what they do not know. The advertising man or newspaper man skill 3 who goes into psychological warfare must learn something of the enemy neutral or friendly groups whom he addresses skill 4, something of United States civil government procedure skill 1, something of military or naval organization and operation skill 2, and ideally something of psychology or sociology or economics, depending on the topic of his work skill 5. The psychological soldier deals with enemy troops in their civilian capacity. He addresses them as men. He appeals to their non-military characteristics in most instances, and he does not follow sportsmanship as men did in other wars by helping the enemy command maintain discipline. Furthermore, the soldier works with writers, illustrators, translators, scriptwriters, announcers, and others whose skills are primarily civilian, and he takes his policy cues from the civilian authority at the top of the war effort. An infantry colonel does not have to worry about what the Secretary of State is saying if the colonel is on the field of battle, but an officer detailed to psychological warfare must remain attuned to civilian life, even if he has seen no one out of khaki for two months straight. Personnel was probably the biggest skilled problem of the entire war. Should psychological warfare be needed again, 
It will take careful coding of personnel to obtain the necessary staff and operators. The continuation of psychological warfare techniques, in part at least, that both civilian and military agencies in time of peace will, it may be hoped, provide the U.S. with a cadre for the next time. Very little of the living experience of the Creole Committee was carried over into OWI. Walter Lippmann, who had worked with both Creel and Gleichenhorn, was not a participant. Carl Crow, the advertising man and writer from Shanghai, worked on China for the Creel Committee in World War I, and on China again for OWI in World War II. He was exceptional and took no major part in setting up indoctrination. One of the OWI executives in 1946, Shortly after his return to civilian life, read James Mock and Cedric Larson's account of the Creel Committee, words that won the war, Princeton, 1939. His interest was avid. When he finished, he said, Good Lord, those people made the same mistakes we made. He had forgotten that the Creel Committee record had been available all the way through. Effects of American Operations The net effects of the work of civilian-operated propaganda are hard to appraise because the radio broadcasts and leaflets for civilians were designed to have a long-range effect on the enemy. Statistical computations come to nothing. It would appear likely that some parts of our psychological warfare actually lengthened the war and made it more difficult to win. The unconditional surrender formula, the publicity given to proposals for the pastoralization of Germany, the emphasis on Japanese savagery with its implied threat of counter-savagery, were not overlooked by the enemy authorities. It is certain that other parts of our psychological warfare speeded up the end of the war, saved lives increased the war effort which was enormous when measured in terms of the expenditure of manpower, material, and time involved. One operation alone probably repaid the entire cost of OWI throughout the war. The Japanese offered to surrender, but with conditions. We responded, rejecting the conditions. The Japanese government pondered its reply. But while it pondered, B-29s carried leaflets to all parts of Japan, giving the text of the Japanese official offer to surrender. This act alone would have made it almost impossibly difficult for the Japanese government to whip its people back into frenzy for suicidal prolongation of war. The Japanese texts were checked between Washington and Hawaii by radio photograph and crypto telephone. The plates were put into the presses at Sapien. The big planes took off, leaflets properly loaded and the right kind of leaflet bombs. It took Americans three and a half years to reach that point, but we reached it. Nowhere else in history can there be found an instance of so many people being given so decisive a message, all at the same time, at the very dead point between war and peace. The Japanese had done their best against us, but their best was not enough. We got in the last word and made sure it was the last. Soviet Experience Soviet psychological warfare used Communist Party facilities during World War II, turning them on and off as needed. But Soviet psychological war efforts were not characterized by blind reliance on past experience. They showed a very real inventiveness, and the political policies behind them were both far-sighted and far-reaching. The Soviet government was the one government in the world which could be even more totalitarian than Nazi Germany. Many Americans may consider this a moral disadvantage, but in psychological warfare, it has very heavy compensating advantages. The Soviet people were propaganda cautious to an intense degree, but the authorities took no chances. Revolutionary communist themes were brilliantly intermingled with patriotic Russian items. Army officers were given extraordinary privileges. 
everyone was given epaulets. The communist revolutionary song, the famous Internationale, was discarded in favor of a new Soviet hymn. History was rewritten. The czars were honored again. The church was asked to pray for victory. The Soviet officials were able to tailor their social system to fit the propaganda. They did so even to the name of the war. They call it the Great Patriotic War. Outsiders may murmur, what war is not? But the Russian people liked it, and the regime used traditionalism and nationalism to kinch communism in the Soviet Union. In their combat propaganda, the Russians were equally ruthless and realistic. They appealed to the memory of Frederick the Great of Prussia. They reminded the Germans of Bismarck's warning not to commit their forces in the East. They appealed to the German Junker caste against the unprofessional Nazi scum who were ruining the German army, and they used every propaganda trick that had ever been heard of. They turned prisoners into a real military asset by employing them in propaganda and talked a whole staff of Nazi generals into the Free Germany movement. Only in radio did the Russians retain some of their old revolutionary fire with its irritating qualities for non-communist peoples. This was explicable in terms of the audience. The Russians could keep their domestic propaganda half-secret by imposing a censorship ban on those parts of it, or those comments on it which they did not wish known to communists abroad. The censorship was a permanent institution, in war and out, and therefore did not impose special difficulty. They could keep their frontline propaganda quiet, since they did not allow their allies to send military observers up front, and the Nazis could be counted on not to tell the world about effective anti-Nazi propaganda. But their radio propaganda had to be audible to everyone. Hence, the radio propaganda was the least ingenious in using reactionary themes effectively. The Russians and Germans both used black radio, but since each policed the home audience rigorously against the other, it is possible that the efforts cancelled out. Japanese Development The Japanese invented little in psychological warfare. They made excellent and judicious use of news to the American audience. They actually got much more official Japanese news into the American press during the war years than they had succeeded in placing during peacetime when they had offices in American cities. They did so by maintaining the regular Domai news service in English language Morse wireless for the American press, ready edited for the newspaper offices. They put bylines on the stories and it is said they sometimes even told the American newspapers, please hold till 9 a.m. Eastern wartime. Thank you, Domai. In dealing with Asiatic audiences, special Japanese Butai did a great deal of black propaganda along with subversive operations, but they displayed little initiative as to the use of basic techniques. Their chief merits were industry, patience, and the delivery of a first-class news service. Chinese Uses the Chinese Communist forces broke all records for certain specialized aspects of combat propaganda. Japanese prisoners were given cordial welcome, better food than they had in the army, the company of maidens, rich gifts, and political indoctrination about the freedom of Japan. These soldiers then went with the Chinese Communists back into the front lines, and took Japanese sentries out of their strong points. The Yenin forces went to great pains with this propaganda and even elected a Japanese prisoner to the city council of Yenin. The author talked with the political director of the Chinese Communist Authority at Yenin and with some of the Japanese in Communist China. There was evidence of a real understanding of the problems of the Japanese common soldier 
and of real sympathy with him, which the Japanese enlisted men were quick to feel. The communists went so far as to throw gift packages into the Japanese lines, not booby traps, just nice gifts with a polite request for a reply. They learned the names of Japanese field telephone operators and then spliced into the line and argued politics with them in a rough and jolly way. When they had enough prisoners, they kept the most promising converse or political training. They fed the ordinary prisoners well, entertained them royally, and sent them back to their own lines with the suggestion that the Chinese communists would appreciate it if their good Japanese brethren would in combat please shoot their rifles in the air, thus making sure of not hitting communists, while at the same time avoiding unnecessary trouble with the Japanese officers. Under Chiang, the chairman, the Chinese national government waged a dignified, humane kind of psychological warfare against Japan. Few people remember an odd chapter out of modern history, the Chinese bombardment of Nagasaki, although it is possible that ecstatic historians of the future will make a substantial contrast between the Chinese who struck the first blow at that city and the Americans who struck the last. Shortly after the outbreak of the full Kwesi War between China and Japan in 1937, the Generalissimo ordered his bombers to attack Japan. American-built Chinese bombers appeared over Kyushu, the first invaders to show up since the shoguns repelled Kublai Khan 656 years earlier. But instead of dropping bombs, they dropped leaflets denouncing aggression and infantily pointing out that while the Japanese were uncivilized enough to bomb their fellow Asiatics, the Chinese were too civilized to undertake reprisals in kind. The Generalissimo's troops also had frontalization and frontline propaganda, but not to the extent to which the Chinese communists did. The Generalissimo himself followed a very liberal, not in the leftist, but in the true sense, political line towards Japan. He uttered no threat of vengeance. He was the first leader of a great nation to say that the Japanese emperor question was to be settled by letting the Japanese themselves choose their own form of government after the war was all over. He had Japanese on his political staffs, democratic persons whom his officials encouraged, and regular Japanese broadcasts were kept up throughout the war on the Chungking radio. Figure 19. Propaganda against propaganda. As an occasional stunt, propaganda is directed against propaganda. Hitler did so in his book Main Camp. The leaflet shown in the original and in Fasimile was used by the Allies on the Germans in the West. A German leaflet addressed to their own troops, defensive propaganda, was picked up, X'd out, copied and refuted. End of figure 19. Figure 20. Reuse of enemy propaganda. Leaflets sometimes develop an enemy pictorial or slogan theme and use it effectively against the original disseminators. Employing the colors and insignia of the U.S. Air Force, this Nazi leaflet for Frenchmen makes no attempt to minimize American bombing to the French. Instead, it uses the Allied heading, The Hour of Liberation Will Ring, then it adds the grim point, Make Your Will, Make Your Will. End of figure 20. End of section 12, read by Shauna in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Section 13 of Psychological Warfare. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tatiana Chichilla. Psychological Warfare by Paul M. A. Leinbarger. Chapter 7a. Propaganda Analysis, Part 1 Opinion analysis pertains to what people think, 
propaganda analysis deals with what somebody is trying to make them think. Each form of analysis is a new and flourishing field in civilian social research. The bibliographies of Smith, Laswell, and Casey, and the current reviews in the Public Opinion Quarterly demonstrate the existence of a large and growing literature on the subject. Each year, new textbooks in the field or current revisions of old ones can be counted on to bring scholastic and scientific findings up to date. Technical writings on visual education, religious conversion, labor organization, practical politics, revolutionary agitation, and on commercial advertising have frequent bearing on propaganda analysis. Propaganda cannot be analyzed in a logical vacuum. Every step in the operation is intensely practical. There is nothing timeless about it, other than that common sense which is based on the nature of man. The ancient Chinese three-character classic, from which several billion Chinese have tried to learn to read, says, Freely translated, this means, When people are born, they all start good. But even though they all start out about the same, you ought to see them after they have had time to become different from one another by picking up habits here and there. The common nature of man may be at the basis of all propaganda and politics, but incentives to action are found in the stimuli of varied everyday environments. Certain very elementary appeals can be made almost without reference to the personal everyday background, cultural historical milieu, of the person addressed. Yet in a matter as simple as staying alive or not staying alive, in which it might be supposed that all human beings would have the same basic response, the difference between Japanese and Americans was found to be basic when it came to surrender. To Japanese soldiers, the verbal distinction between surrender and cease honorable resistance was as important as the difference between life and death. The Japanese would not survive at the cost of their honor, but if their honor were satisfied, they willingly gave up. Propaganda is directed to the subtle niceties of thought by which people maintain their personal orientation in an unstable interpersonal world. Propaganda must use the language of the mother, the school teacher, the lover, the bully, the policeman, the actor, the ecclesiastic, the buddy, the newspaperman, all of them in turn. And propaganda analysis, in weighing and evaluating propaganda, must be even more discriminating in determining whether the propaganda is apt to hit its mark or not. Monitoring. The first requisite of propaganda analysis is materials to be analyzed. In time of peace, it is usually enough to send a subscription to the newspaper, magazine, or pamphlet series, and to buy the books as they come out. Poster propaganda is more difficult to obtain, and frequently requires on-the-spot contacts. Dr. David Rowe brought back from occupied China, in the early days of the Sino-Japanese War, a spectacularly well done and interesting series of Japanese and Quisling posters. They were not hard to come by once he was there, but he had to go about 20,000 miles to get them in return. In obtaining printed propaganda, better results will be achieved if the same sources are followed consistently over a period of time than if one triumphant raid is carried through. The choice may look like this, see chart 3. If, in this instance, the propaganda analysis is to be a one-man enterprise in a small country or area in time of peace, the one man can collect all the different kinds of samples in March and can then spend several months trying to see how they add up. By the time his analysis is ready, it will be badly dated and will necessarily be less interesting to the recipients than would a report which was up to the week. Furthermore, unless the analyst knows the area very well indeed, he will risk mistaking transient issues for basic ones. If the old agrarians happen to be accused of right-wing deviationism during the week of 3rd to 10th March, the analyst may falsely conclude that the old agrarian issue is tempestuous or profound. Unless he has a large staff, faces a special crisis, or pursues a scholarly purpose, the analyst does well to pick the alternative illustrated in the vertical column. He should pick his media carefully, accepting the advice of people who know the area intimately. In an opinion-controlled area, it is wise to take both a direct government propaganda paper and the opposition of semi-independent paper, if such exist. Local papers are often better guides to domestic propaganda than our big metropolitan papers. The propagandists of the country know that foreigners may watch the big papers, and they will reserve their most vicious, naive, or bigoted appeals for the local press. Along with the local press of one or two selected localities, the analyst should select several government personages and should follow every word of theirs he can find. The basic principle is for the analyst himself to determine the range of materials to be covered by deciding his own workload in advance. This in turn depends on the time he has available for the task, his mastery of the language, his interest in the projects, probable interruptions due to semi-official elbow bending, and other personal factors. 
The rule remains. Consistent analysis of the same output with reference to basic topics over a sustained period will inevitably reveal the propaganda intention of the source. It must be pointed out that the expert analyst still is needed to select topics and to confirm interpretations. To make a first guess as to whether the intended effect is being achieved or not, the analyst uses himself as a propaganda guinea pig. What does he think of the issues? What might he have thought otherwise? What would he think if he were a little less intelligent, a little more uncritical than he is? And to complete the analysis, the analyst must go out to the audience that receives the materials and find out what effects the propaganda has had by asking them about it. Printed materials. The most readily available sources of propaganda are not printed ones. Especially in time of hostilities, it may not be easy to subscribe to enemy materials by the process of sending an international postal money order. Delays involved in transmitting the printed materials may make them useless for spot analysis and valuable only for long-range basic studies of morale. The propagandist who is being analyzed may oblige by reading large numbers of editorials on the radio. During the last war, officers and citizens occasionally exploded with alarm when Radio Tokyo quoted a Life or New York Times editorial several hours after it appeared. They naturally supposed that the Japanese had a secret shortwave transmitter running from New York City direct to Tokyo, and overlooked the fact that the OWI may have quoted long excerpts in slow Morse code on its trans-Pacific beam to China. The Japanese had picked it up, used subquotes, and beamed it back. Printed matter goes on the air in any major news operation. It is only a matter of time before telephoto facilities develop in line with the experimental New York Times edition printed in San Francisco during the United Nations Organizational Conference. This was sent, all in one piece, by wire photo to Frisco and reprinted. The delay between the two editions was merely a matter of minutes. In the future, wireless telephoto may reduce this to seconds, so that all belligerents can simply tune in on each other's major newspapers. Radio. For the present, radio remains the biggest source of propaganda intake. Radio is convenient. It can be picked up illegitimately without too much fear of detection. For the cost per person reached, it is certainly the cheapest way of getting material to millions of people promptly. It lends itself to monitoring, and even standard long wavelengths can be picked up from surprisingly great distances. The only defense against enemy use of radio monitoring or broadcasting consists of the application of wired radio, which means plugging all the radio sets in on the telephone circuit, putting nothing on the air, and defying the enemy to eavesdrop. If the radio sets are then policed and are made incapable of receiving wireless material, that particular audience is effectively cut off from the enemy. When the Red Army, with its acute propaganda-conscious security, moved into many Eastern European cities, the first thing it did was to round up all the radios which the Nazis had overlooked. This prevented the liberated peoples from being enslaved by the filthy reactionary lies of the American and British governments, and made sure that the peoples would stay liberated under influence of their local Soviet-controlled newspapers. Wired radio is expensive. Radio suppression is difficult. The successful concealers of radio receivers become two-legged newspapers and go around town spreading all the hot dope which the authorities are trying to suppress. Scarcity puts a premium on such news. Rumor then becomes unmanageable. Except for strangely drastic situations, it is probable that the great powers will continue to tolerate radio reception, even though it may mean letting foreign subversive propaganda slip in now and then. It is therefore likely that radio broadcasts will be available for monitoring for the pre-belligerent stages of the next war, should war come again in our time, and that radio may last through a great part or all of the duration of the war. Factors which cannot now be foreseen, such as radio control of weapons, will affect this. Radio propaganda analysis follows the same considerations as those which govern choice of materials for analyzing printed matter. It is a surer method to follow one or two programs on a station than to make wide random selections. A standard wave transmitter to the home audience comes closer to revealing the domestic scene than would a global rebroadcast of ostensibly identical material. Radio has a further advantage over print. Few nations print out separate propaganda for each foreign language area, while almost every large and medium-sized country has international facilities for broadcast. Since the programs are beamed to different language groups, the senders automatically make up propaganda lines for each audience. Attentive monitoring can provide material for distinguishing the various lines which any given nation is sending out to its friends, neighbors, or rivals. Frequently, the differences between these lines make good counter-propaganda. If you hear the Germans telling the Danes that all Nordics are supermen and all non-Nordics scum, while telling the Japanese that the national socialist idea of the world transcends Pluto-democratic race prejudice, put the two quotations together and send them back to the Danes and Japanese both.
Radio, unlike print, cannot be held for the analyst's convenience. It is physically unhandy to try to file actual recordings of enemy broadcasts for preservation and reference. When the analysis center is large, as it would be if near the headquarters of a government or a theater of war, the difficulties of monitoring involve problems of stenographic and language help. The monitors themselves can then be stenographers, taking verbatim dictation. They write down the enemy broadcast word for word, either right off the air or from records. The editor then selects the most important parts of the day's intake for mimeographic or other circulation. Important material can be put in a daily radio summary of enemy propaganda for the area monitored. The rest of it can be sent along by mail, put in files, and classified, lest the enemy government find out what its own propagandists really were saying, preserved on recording, or destroyed. During World War II, these basic verbatim reports played a very important part. The Foreign Broadcast Intelligence Service did the job for the United States, operating through the war years under the Federal Communications Commission. It has since been shifted from FCC to the War Department, and from the War Department to the Central Intelligence Group. Its materials sometimes are unclassified, although during most of the war they were marked restricted, and they are not available to the public except through microfilm copies of the Library of Congress file. These FBIS daily reports skimmed the cream off the enemy news broadcasts and included editorial or future material which might have intelligence or policy interest. Monitoring by a single individual. Where monitoring must be done by a single individual or a very small staff, it is desirable to find a basic news broadcast and to take it down verbatim where possible. This gives the analyst the chance of a second look at his materials and keeps him from having to make snap judgments of what is important and what is not, right during the course of the broadcast. Selection of a basic news program, followed by reference to speeches, plays, lectures, and other programs that indicate the overall tone of the day's output, will make it possible for one person to do an adequate monitoring job on about one-eighth of his full-time work per station. This does not leave him time to do much fancy analysis or to prepare graphs, but he can pass along the general psychological warfare situation so far as that particular beam on that particular transmitter is concerned. The most likely situation for the isolated consul, businessman, officer, missionary, or amateur is one in which he can get a certain amount of stenographic help in taking down the broadcast material. The radio from monitoring varies in accordance with general reception conditions. Practically all the U.S. Army Signal Corps receivers will perform satisfactorily for local monitoring. So too will ordinary private sets, including the larger portables. An automobile radio can often be driven away from interference and from a hilltop or the edge of a lake can pick up a standard wave station that cannot be distinguished on a much larger house set in the city. For transoceanic or worldwide reception, a shortwave receiver is of course necessary. It is unwise to pick a sample that involves too much rapid speech, such as a foreign soap opera. The best reception is always the Morse code transmission of news or the slow dictation speed reading of news from one central station to outlying news offices or substations. Selection of a program which usually comes in, arrangement for a verbatim copy of the program, daily checking of the news under standard analysis procedures, this gives a very fair cross-section. One man sitting at Hankow could find out just what both the Generalissimo and the Chinese Communists were trying to tell the French understanding and the Dutch understanding listeners in the Far East. Another with pipe and slippers in Brussels could keep tabs on the basic Russian lines to the Spanish-speaking world. Such monitoring often comes in handy for newspapers, commercial firms, governments, military establishments, speculators, and research institutions. Identification. Propaganda versus truth. The point will invariably arise. This tells me how to listen to a foreign radio. Okay, I'll get the news, the lectures, the plays, all the rest of it. But so what? How am I going to know what's the truth and what's the propaganda? How can I tell them apart? Tell me that. The answer is simple. If you agree with it, it's truth. If you don't agree, it's propaganda. Pretend that it is all propaganda. See what happens on your analysis reports. Propaganda was defined at the beginning of this book as follows. Propaganda consists of the planned use of any form of communication designed to affect the minds and emotions of a given group for a specific purpose. Taking a lesson from communist theory, we can say that any form of mass communication is operated for propaganda purposes if no other motive for running it is evident. Human beings talk. They like to talk. Much private talk is idle, but only an imbecile would talk over a radio network just for the pleasure of hearing himself talking. Propaganda is presentation for a purpose. It is the purpose that makes it propaganda, and not the truthfulness or untruthfulness of it. The collected news of any modern country contains more truth each day than any one man could read in a lifetime. 
The reporters, editors, writers, announcers who collect truth not only collect it, they select it. They have to. Why do they select it? That is the propaganda question. If they select it to affect the minds and emotions of a given group for a specific purpose, it is propaganda. If they report that a little girl fell out of bed and broke her neck with the intent of frightening parents among their listeners into following the Safe Homes Week campaign, that is propaganda. But if they report it because it is the only death in the community and because they might as well fill up the program, it is not propaganda. If you put the statement on the air, an American Negro workman in Greensboro, North Carolina, got 80 cents for a hard day's work last week. That can be presented and interpreted as A. Simple news, if there is something more to the story, about what the man said, or how he spent the 80 cents on cornmeal to feed his pet tarantula. B. Anti-capitalist propaganda, if you show that 80 cents is mighty little money for American business to pay its workers. C. Pro-capitalist propaganda, if you show that the 80 cents will buy more than two weeks' wages of a worker in the city of Riga when it comes to consumer goods. D. Anti-white propaganda, if you show the man got only 80 cents because he was a Negro. And so on, through a further variety of interpretations. The facts, man, happening, amount, place, time, are true in each case. They could be sworn to by the whole membership of an interfaith conference. But the interpretation placed on them, who communicates these facts to whom, why, when, makes them into propaganda. An interpretation can be no more true or untrue than a Ford car can be vanilla or strawberry in flavor. The questions of truth and of interpretation are unrelated categories. The essence of motive is that it is ultimately private and impenetrable, and interpretation commonly involves imputation of motive. You can dislike an interpretation, you can kill a man for believing it, you can propagandize him out of believing it, but you cannot sit down and prove that it is untrue. Facts and logic are useful in propaganda, but they cannot be elevated to the point where you can say, is it propaganda or is it true? Almost all good propaganda, no matter what kind, is true. It uses truth selectively. There is no secret formula which, once applied, provides an unfailing test for propaganda. It is not possible for a person unfamiliar with the part of the world affected, with the topic discussed, with the interested parties, and with the immediate politics involved, to put his finger on an item and say, this rightist charge is propaganda, and then to turn and say, but that rightist statement is not propaganda, it is fact. Untruthful statements are made at times for other than propaganda purposes. Truthful statements may be propaganda or not. The analyst must himself be an interested party. He must determine ahead of time what he will regard as propaganda and what not. And he must do so by delimiting the field of his analysis before he even starts. No one person or staff of people could ever trace all the motives behind a single statement. Even to attempt that, he would have to be a novelist of the school of Marcel Proust, and he would end up feeling like James Joyce, Gertrude Stein, or Franz Kafka. The analyst looks in the direction in which the message is going. He defines the propaganda presentation of the people who get the message in terms of all the public information to which the persons addressed have access. If he does not know the purpose of the message, he may divine it from the character of the audience and from the effect he presumes the message may reasonably be expected to have on an audience. If he does not know the audience, he can at least follow the physical transit of the message. In what language does it move? Whence? Whither? When? Figure 21. Mockery of Enemy Propaganda Slogans Homefront propaganda was sometimes repeated in an inappropriate place, in order to achieve an effect contrary to that originally intended. These Nazi leaflets, dropped on American detachments in Europe, used modifications of the It's Your Job posters and advertisements used by the U.S. for home front purposes. Figure 22. Mockery of Enemy Propaganda Technique When the content of enemy propaganda cannot be attacked, the media themselves can sometimes be criticized. This German leaflet attempted utilization of potential suspicions of Hollywood. In so doing, it used three techniques built up from a news item, suitably faked, raised suspicion of the movies which the Germans knew our army showed for morale purposes, and spread racial hate. Figure 23. Direct Reply Leaflet. World War II propagandists often succumbed to the temptation of using the enemy materials and sending them right back. Sarcasm can be effective if the reader identifies himself with the speaker and not with the addressee. In this Nazi leaflet from the Anzio beachhead, the Germans probably antagonized more Americans than they befriended. A simple statement of the news would have been more effective. 
End of figures 21 through 23. End of section 13. Section 14 of Psychological Warfare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Psychological Warfare by Paul M. A. Leinbarger. Section 14. Chapter 7b. Propaganda Analysis, Part 2. The Stossum Formula. The formula given earlier was found useful in the spot analysis of German broadcasts, both open and clandestine, and Japanese materials during the last months of the war. The formula reads, Source, including media, Time, Audience, Subject, Mission. The neologism, Stasum, may serve a mnemonic purpose. The formula works best in the treatment of monitored materials of which the source is known. First point to note is the character of the source. There are several choices on this. The true source, who really got it out, and the ostensible source, whose name is signed to it. Also, the first use source, who used it the first time, and the second use source, who claims merely to be using it as a quotation. Take the statement, Harry said to me, he said, I never told anybody that Al's wife was a retired strip teaser. Mind you, I don't pretend to believe Harry, but that's what he said all right. What are the possible true sources for the statement of fact or libel concerning Al's unnamed wife? What are the alternatives on ostensible sources? First use? Second use? The common sense needed to analyze this statement is of the same order as the process involved in analyzing the statement. Reliable sources in Paris state that the visit of the American labor delegation has produced sensational repercussions in Moscow and that Moscow, upon the basis of the American attitude, is determined to press for unification of the entire German labor movement. It is soon evident that the mere attribution of source is a job of high magnitude. A systematic breakdown of the Stassum formula produces the following analysis outline, applicable to any single propaganda item, civil or military, in war or peace, spoken, visual, or printed. There are many other possible arrangements. The one given below is not represented as having official sanction or mysterious powers of its own. It has simply worked well for the author. Complete breakdown of a single propaganda item. A. Source. 1. True source. Where does it really come from? A. Release channel. How did it come out? If different from true source without concealing true source. B. Person or institution in whose name material originates. C. Transmitting channel. Who got it to us? Person or institution affecting known transmission. Omitting, of course, analysts' own procurement facilities. 2. Ostensible source. Where does it pretend to come from? A. Release channel. Who is supposed to be passing it along? 3. First use and second use source. First use. Who is said to have used this first? Second use. Who pretends to be quoting someone else? A. Connection between second use source and first use source, usually in the form of attributed or unacknowledged quotation, more rarely plagiarism. B. Modification between use by first use and second use sources, when both are known. 1. Deletions. 2. Changes in text. 3. Enclosure within editorial matter of transmitter. 4. Falsification which appears deliberate. 5. Effects of translation from one language to another. b. Time. 1. Time of events or utterance to which subject matter refers. 2. Time of transmission, publishing, broadcasting, etc. 3. Timing of repetitions. 4. Reasons, if any are evident, for peculiarities of timing. c. Audience. 1. Intended direct audience. For example, in English to North America, or a paper for New York restaurant operators. 2. Intended indirect audience. Program beamed in English to North America, but actually reaching Hong Kong and Singapore by deliberate plan of the sender. A paper for New York restaurant operators being faked and sent to Southeast Europe, in fact. 3. Unintended audience. For example a Guadalcanal native studying Esquire, your aunt reading the infantry journal, 
a Chinese reading American wartime speeches against the Yellow Devils of Japan. 4. Ostensibly unintended direct audience, such as an appeal to strikers in very abusive-sounding language, sent to businessmen to build up an opinion against the strikers, or Hitler's black use of the forged protocols of the elders of Zion. D. Subject. What does it say? 1. Content listed under any convenient heading as though it were straight news or intelligence. 2. Content epitomized as demonstrating new propaganda technique, such as, quote, now they're trying to get us out of Tian Sen by appeals to our isolationists, end quote. 3. Content which may be useful in counterpropaganda, such as, quote, they said that the Greeks are our witless puppets, so let's pass that along to the Greeks, end quote. 4. Significance of content for intelligence analysis. Examples, when the Japanese boasted about their large fish catch, it was an indication their fishing fleet was short of gasoline again, and that the fish catch was actually small. And, when the Nazis accused the Jews of sedition, it meant that rations were short and that the Nazi government was going to appease the populace by denying the Jews their scanty rations by way of contrast. E. Mission. 1. Nation, group, or person attacked. 2. Relation to the previous items with the same or related missions. 3. Particular psychological approach used in this instance, such as wedge driving between groups, or between people and leaders, or between armed services, or demoralization of audience in general, or decrease of listeners' faith in the news. 4. Known or probable connection with originator's propaganda plan or strategy. Such an outline would be useful only if it were applied in common sense terms without turning each item into an elaborate project and thus losing the woods in the trees. In most cases, it would suffice to state the item briefly for reference and study in the order of the entries. When poorly trained help is available, it is of course necessary to print or mimeograph a form to be used. It is vain to prescribe a propaganda analysis procedure without knowing the user, as to prescribe an office filing system while knowing neither the nature of the office nor the kind of files kept. In time of war, subordinate commanders in operational areas will need to keep files at a minimum, while rear echelon or national facilities may be able to keep files of enormous range and thoroughness. In the recording of a large number of propaganda items, however, the material becomes hopelessly unmanageable unless there is some standardized system for organizing it. Mere alphabetization leads inevitably to the question, alphabetization of what? And the analysis function can be exercised more readily in terms of the sources of propaganda than in terms of its incidental topics. Identification of enemy plans and situations. Propaganda has its inevitable mirror image, which gradually becomes plain to the analyst. If the analyst is careful, using shrewd judgment in appraising specific missions, he will gradually see forming in his files a record of the immediate and long-term aims of the propaganda originators. This becomes possible only when enough material is available, over a period of time, to make up a complete list of the probable enemy propaganda objectives for the period covered. The intent of propaganda is always a result observable as action, however remote the action may be from the date of operation. Much of the propaganda of the Communist Party in the United States is directed to the inculcation of correct scientific thinking, which will be of decisive use only when the remote day of revolution arrives. Few of the communist leaders, even in private conference, would venture to predict the exact year of the day of revolution. Some may not even expect to see it. But they believe that if the propaganda is effective, the proletariat will be militant and its leaders will be conscious of their historic role. From the propaganda of today, the action may be anticipated, no matter how distant it may seem. Once the action is determined, the relation of other propaganda items to that action can be traced. In war, the action sought is something militarily harmful to the enemy, strikes against his production, panic in his population, complaint from his consumers, mistrust from his newspaper readers and radio listeners, resulting in eventual subversive or negative action on their part surrender of his troops, disunity of his political leadership to be expressed in deadlocks, and so on. In pre-belligerent or peacetime propaganda, the action sought is against the war-making capacity of the audience, against war itself, if the propagandist feels that his own population is in no immediate danger of being infected by defeatism.
estimating the enemy's propaganda situation. In addition to presenting a picture of the enemy goals and of the psychological means he considers to be useful in reaching those goals, propaganda analysis is also valuable in presenting the enemy's own propaganda situation. He avoids certain topics because he must. He talks about others because circumstances force him to do so. For example, if the Germans stop talking about rations for the Jews in the World War II situation, it may be that their own people, filled with anti-Semitic poison, have been protesting the issuance of rations. Alternatively, it may mean that the Nazi authorities have just canceled Jewish rations and are letting the Jews starve or are murdering them overtly. If the Germans follow this up with an item on the poor barley crop, it may be that they are preparing the sentimental and humane listeners in their own audience for the announcement of Jewish starvation. If they run Paris quizzling accounts of Jewish hoarding and of Jews concealing large quantities of food, it means that they are almost certain to be under pressure to explain their Jewish policies and that, therefore, two factors face the German propagandist. First, he must get ready to announce the attack on the Jews. Second, he thinks that the Jewish situation is going to arouse anti-Nazi sentiment, even in Germany, if these are German language programs. And he is therefore compelled to defend something because public opinion is believed by him to be against it. Out of a silence, no further news on rations, a domestic item, poor barley crop, and a foreign item, Paris Jews allegedly hoarding, it is possible to reconstruct a whole situation. The reconstruction may fall if other interpretations arise, but it provides a starting guess. The situation of enemy morale is often reportable through propaganda analysis long before it can be described by eyewitnesses. Omissions of attacks on the church may indicate that the religious problem has become touchy. Failure to attack communism may mean that the government is seeking a diplomatic deal with a communist state. Mention of children may refer to the fact that parents complain of cold schools, bad food, absent doctors. Good morale is shown by a quiet tone in propaganda. Bad morale is shown by extremes, whether of silence or of great vehemence. It is useful to know what the enemy propagandist thinks he is doing, what he considers the obstacles to his propaganda. Such considerations inevitably get to be embodied in the propaganda itself. A tone of extreme defiance, poor international cooperation, war bluster, and so on, may often spring from the desire to divert a hungry or discontented home public from its real worries at home to imaginary worries abroad. Propanal as a source of military intelligence. Propaganda analysis, or propanal for short, can serve as a very useful adjunct to military intelligence, even if we're not directly connected with counter-propaganda operations. In the first place, the enemy must give news, comment, opinion, entertainment, in order to get attention. The incidental content and makeup of this propaganda is itself useful study material. If his ink is bad, his paper poor, his language incorrect, it shows shortages of supply and personnel. If he boasts about his victories, he usually gives his version of place names and aids cartographic reporting. In mentioning the names of heroes, he may supply order of battle. In making a good story out of his economic situation, he fills in missing statistics. Even if the figures are falsified, they may be falsified for a purpose and can be used in conjunction with others in making up an estimate. Nothing is as smart as a human being, except another human being. What any one man may try to achieve in the way of deceit, another man can try to figure out. The bulk of propaganda, short of preemptory tactical leaflets, is filled with information about the enemy's personnel, his opinion of himself, his opinion of you, his state of mind, his order of battle, his economic system, and all the rest. The Japanese government throughout the war kept the United States informed in English of the changes of ministers and other high officials in the Japanese government. This gave us good political background. There was no use their trying to hide it over a long period of time, and presumably Joho Kyoko, the Imperial Japanese Board of Information, figured that the help it gave the Americans in filling out their political intelligence files for them would be more than counterbalanced by the fact that such news would make American newspapermen, officials, officers, and others read the propaganda in order to get the facts. Over and above the direct contribution to straight news or intelligence, enemy propaganda in times of war or crisis affords a clue to enemy strategy. If the coordination is not present, 
the propaganda may do the enemy himself harm. But the moment coordination is present, and one end of the coordinate is handed over to us, we can start figuring out what the coordination is for. Sometimes propaganda is sacrificed for weightier considerations of security. German propaganda gave little advance warning of a war with the USSR, and Soviet propaganda gave none. In other instances, the coordination does give the show away. In 1941-42, to 42, the Japanese radio began to show an unwholesome interest in Christmas Island in its broadcasts to Japanese at home and abroad. Christmas Island, below Sumatra, was pointed out as a really important place and tremendously significant in naval strategy. Subsequently, the Japanese armed forces went to and took Christmas Island. The home public was delighted that this vital spot had been secured. Of course, Christmas Island was not as important as the Japanese radio said it was, but the significant thing was that the radio talked about it ahead of time. For what little it was worth, the Japanese had given us warning. Enemy realization of an impending defeat may be preceded by disparagement of the importance of the area in which the defeat is to take place, or by description to the home audience of the enormous strength which enemy forces face at that particular place. Enemy action, when the enemy is security-minded, may be anticipated from his complete silence on something which he would normally talk about. It must have seemed odd that the Americans stopped talking about nuclear fission altogether when pre-war years had seen a certain number of news items on the subject in the New York press each month. A nation getting ready to strike a la Pearl Harbor may prepare by alleging American aggression. A nation preparing to break the peace frequently gets out peace propaganda of the most blatant sort, trying to make sure that its own audience, as well as the world, will believe the real responsibility to lie in the victim whom he attacks. Hitler protested his love of Norwegian neutrality, then he hit, claiming that he was protecting it from the British. No hard and fast rules can be made up for all wars or all belligerents. The Germans behaved according to one pattern, the Japanese another. For example, the German high command sought to avoid bragging about anything they could not actually accomplish. They often struck blows without warning, but they never said they would strike a blow when they knew or believed that they could not do it. The British and Americans made up a timetable of this and were able to guess how fast the Germans thought they were going to advance to Russia. Knowing this, the British and Americans planned their propaganda to counter the German boasts. They tried to pin the Germans down to objectives they knew the Germans would not take in order to demonstrate to the peoples of Europe that Nazi Germany had finally bitten off more than it could chew. Later, the Allies remembered this German habit when the Nazis on the radio began talking about their own secret weapons. When the British bombed the V-1 ramps on the French coast, the German radio stopped that talk. The British, therefore, had additional grounds for supposing that the ramps they had bombed were part of the secret weapon the Germans bragged about. The British further knew that the Germans would try to counter the psychological effect of the announcement of Allied D-Day with some pretty vivid news of their own. When the German radio began mentioning secret weapons again, the British suspected that the Germans had gotten around the damage done to the ramps. D-Day came, the Germans, in one single broadcast designed to impress the Japanese and Chinese, announced that the secret German weapon was about to be turned loose and that more such weapons would follow. One day later, the first V-1 hit London. Such statistical use, only if usable records are maintained. A basic item-by-item -item file of all important or new items combined with a worksheet of the amount of radio time or printed space the enemy put into use for a stated period will provide the materials needed for propanol. Propanol is indispensable to psychological warfare. It sifts ordinary intelligence out from propaganda in one process, processing straight intelligence ready for the intelligence people to use, yet providing analysis for psychological warfare purposes. For peacetime purposes, it is to be remembered that though enemies may hide their scientists, their launching ramps, or their rockets, they cannot hide the occasion for war, nor their own readiness measures. No government can afford to seem the plain, unqualified aggressor. Propanol may prove to be one of the soundest war-forecasting systems available to us in a period of ultra-destructive weapons. Psychological mobilization may be disguised. It cannot be concealed. 
End of section 14. Section 15 of Psychological Warfare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Psychological Warfare by Paul M. A. Leinbarger. Chapter 8. Propaganda Intelligence. The psychological warfare operator can usually count on two basic interests of his listener. In the field, he can be sure that the enemy troops are interested in themselves. In the enemy homeland, he can be sure that the civilians are interested in their enemy, himself. He has therefore a certain leeway in which he can be sure of doing no harm, and may accomplish good, if he confines his propaganda to simple, factual, and plainly honest statements on these subjects. Pompousness, intricacy, and bad taste will recoil against him. It is unwise to employ these, even when the situation is well under control. In a developing situation, the propagandist can remain safe by confining himself to simple statements as to how strong his country's armed forces are, how realistic and effective their leadership. Elementary information giving the favorable aspects of his economic, strategic, and diplomatic situation may also prove valuable initial propaganda. This interest can be counted on throughout the war. The enemy is always news. The wise enemy realizes this and keeps himself in the news, trusting that in the wider understanding of himself, his politics, and culture, there is the opening for a more favorable peace in the event of defeat, or for a more docile submission in the event of his own victory. Only unimportant enemies fail to become news. Few Americans, for example, realize that we were at war with Bulgaria in World War II. Had the Bulgars developed sensational weapons, there would have been a sudden upswing of interest in them. People would have realized that Bulgaria, like Hungary and long-lost Avaria, was once a fierce Asiatic state grafted onto the European system. The fabulous power of the old Bulgarian Empire would have become known, and the names of Krum, Simeon, and the Tsar Samuel added to our calendar of hate. But Bulgaria never did enough against the United States to count as an enemy, and even succeeded, by diplomatic ineptitude, in getting into a state of war with all the Axis powers and all the United Nations simultaneously. Bulgaria escaped the fame which goes with hostility. Contrast this with Japan. Thousands of Americans have learned Japanese. Japanese national character is known to us. War has done in a five-year span what education could not have accomplished in a generation. The wise propagandist can, when in doubt, play good music on the air. Or he can, with equal prudence, give the enemy his own elementary school history and language texts. These do no harm and may achieve something. News as Intelligence Harmlessness is, however, a poor ideal for men at war. The propagandist who keeps out of mischief is doing only half his job. To make his message take effect, he must convey to the enemy those kinds of information which tend to disrupt enemy unity, discount enemy expectation of success, lower the enemy will to resist. He cannot do so by means of recorded symphonies or tourist lectures, no matter how well done. He must turn to the first weapon of propaganda, the news. The official propagandist is not a newspaper man. Since he speaks for an army or a government, his utterance is officially responsible. He must be as timely as the peacetime press, but must at the same time be as cautious as a government press agent. He is torn between two responsibilities, his responsibility to the job of propaganda, which requires him to get interesting information and get it out to the enemy quickly, and his responsibility to the official policies of his own government, which requires him to release nothing unconfirmed, nothing that could do harm, or that might embarrass or hurt the government. A sort of institutional schizophrenia is common to all propaganda offices. The sources of news are various. Classified incoming operational reports of the Army and Navy contain material of high interest to the enemy. There are obvious reasons for denying access to such information to the propaganda people. Propaganda men might think of their audience first and security second. If they do not know the secret information, but are advised by military consultants who do, security will be better maintained, and the propagandist will not labor under the handicap of a double standard of information, what they know and what they dare to tell. In technically advanced countries, the regular commercial facilities of press and radio continue to do a normal news job, and usually do better work than the drafted amateurs in the government. What intelligence agency in Washington could compile a weekly report as comprehensive, well-edited, and coldly planned as Time magazine? The author often yearned to paraphrase Time, rearranging it and classifying it top secret, in order to astound his associates with the inside dope to which he had access. 
the nature of news is not affected by its classification, and the distinction between news produced on the federal payroll and news produced off it often consists of the superior professionalism of the latter. The intelligence that goes into the making of propaganda must compete for attention with the home newspaper of the enemy. It must therefore be up-to-date, well-put, authentic. There is no more space in propaganda for the lie, farce, hoax, or joke than there is room for it in a first-class newspaper. Even if exaggerations or nonsense appear in the commercial press of his own country, the propagandist must realize that he is honorary G2 to the enemy, a G2 whose function consists of transmitting news the ultimate effect of which should be bad, but which should go forth with each separate item newsworthy and palatable. A little trick of the human mind helps all propagandists in this regard. Most people have a streak of irresponsibility in them, which makes bad news much more interesting than good. There is a yearning for bad news and a genuine willingness to pass it along. Bad news increases the tension upon the individual and tickles his sense of the importance of things. Good news relieves the tension and to that extent has the effect of a letdown. The palatability of news is not concerned so much with its content as with its trustworthiness to the enemy, its seeming to deal with straight fact, its non-editorialized presentation. One of the reasons why Soviet communist propaganda, after all these years, is still relatively unsuccessful, lies in the incapacity of the communists to get out a newspaper with news in it. They put their editorial slant in all their news articles. Man Bites Dog would not make the front page in Russia unless the dog were Stalinist and the man reactionary. The Japanese, who obediently hated the Americans when it was their duty to do so, nevertheless could not help looking at maps that showed where the Americans actually were. Nazis, who despised us and everything we stood for, nevertheless studied the photographs of our new light bombers. The appeal of credible fact is universal. Propaganda does not consist of doctoring the fact with moralistic blather, but of selecting that fact which is correct, interesting, and bad for the enemy to know. Footnote. Bad news about his side is not necessarily the only kind of bad news for the enemy to know. Gloomy news about our side can harm the enemy listener if his government is running a propaganda campaign to raise production, promote thrift, etc. by claiming things are worse on their side. In such a case, good news about us would be good for him. News must be fitted to the propaganda plan and to the propaganda situation. End of footnote. On the friendly side of the battle lines, the procurement of our own news is a budgetary matter. The propaganda office can subscribe to the news tickers, newspapers, telegraph services, and so on. How much is a matter of administrative housekeeping. In the field, the communications officer can frequently steal news from the news agencies of his own country or allied countries by the process of picking it out of the air. It would be highly unpatriotic of the news agency to send him a bill in the zone of operations, and he can classify his record copies of his material restricted so that the owners of the material would have no legitimate business acquiring copies that could later be taken into court to support a claim. Americans would not do this, of course. The reference is to Byzantines. The Need for Timeliness Some white propaganda, and all black propaganda, needs to be written so as to fit in with what the enemy is reading, listening to, or talking about in his home country. The use of antiquated slang, an old, old joke, reference to a famous man as living when he died some time ago, lack of understanding of the new wartime conditions under which the listener lives and worries, such things sour a radio program quickly. In radio, the propagandist must be living in the same time as his listeners. Since the propagandist cannot shuttle between the enemy country and his own radio office, unless he is a braver and more elusive man than governments ever call for, he must try to get the up-to-the-minute touch by other means. Without it, he is lost. He will be talking about something that happened a long time ago, not the situation which he is trying to affect. This need may be called timeliness. It can be served by obtaining all the most recent enemy publications that may be available, by listening attentively to enemy prisoners and captured civilians, and by carefully analyzing the enemy's current broadcasts to his own people. The Nazis made the unnecessary mistake of assuming that isolationism used the same old language after Pearl Harbor. They were right in assuming that there was considerable anti-internationalist and anti-Roosevelt sentiment left in the United States, but they were hopelessly wrong in using the isolationist language of mid-1941 as late as mid-1942. Pearl Harbor had dated all that, and the isolationist interventionist argument had shifted to other ground. When the Nazis went on using the old language, they were as conspicuous as last year's hat at a women's club. Instead of making friends and influencing people, they made themselves sound ignorant and look silly. 
they lacked the element of timeliness. They could have gotten it by procuring representative American publications in Lisbon and studying them. Propaganda is like a newspaper. It has to be timeless or brand new. In between, it has no value. Opinion Analysis In a favorable intelligence situation, espionage can succeed in running a Gallup poll along the enemy's main street. When this is done, the active propaganda operator has some very definite issues at hand on which he can begin work. When it is not possible to send the Cloak and Dagger boys walking up and down the boulevard of the Martyrs of the 11th of July, Propanal, properly handled, can produce almost the same result. The opinion of the enemy can be figured out in terms of what enemy propaganda is trying to do. To be useful, opinion analysis must be systematic. For a while, the author had the interesting job of interviewing all the latest arrivals from Tokyo at a certain headquarters. The travelers would usually be pumped up with a sense of their own smartness in having evaded the Japanese and arrived at Allied territory. You could almost hear them thinking, oh boy, if gendarmerie chief Bakayama could only see me now. They were ready, in army parlance, to spill their guts. The only item on which most of them maintained one-man security was the question, why, chum, did you yourself go to Tokyo in the first place? Outside of that, they were eager to talk. Some of them had frightfully good reasons to be eager. The adverb is literal. With such sources of information, the author thought that he could find out in short order what the Japanese were thinking. He found out all right. He found out every single time. The refugee engineer said the Japanese were so depressed that there was a bull market in butcher knives. The absconding dairyman said the Japanese were ready to die with gloom. The eloping wife said she never saw a happy Japanese anymore. The military school deserter said the Japanese lay awake all night every night listening for American air raids. The reformed puppet said the Japanese had just gone to pieces. Then each of them grinned, the interviews were individual, of course, and expected to be patted on the head for bringing such good news. Their comments were worthless. What the enemy thinks, in general, is worth nothing, unless your troops are already in his suburbs. What an informant thinks the enemy thinks is worth even less. What do you, reader, think right now? What do you think you think? See? The question is nonsensical. To work, it has to be specific. What do you think about the price of new suits? What do you think about Senator O'May and Congressman McNaples? Do you think that we will ever have to fight Laputa? Are you satisfied with your present rate of pay? Why? What a person thinks, his opinion, is workable in relation to what he does. In practical life, his opinion takes effect only when it is part of the opinion of a group. Some groups are formed by the common opinion and have nothing else in common. At a spiritualist meeting, you may see the banker sitting next to his own charwoman. Most groups are groups because of things which the people are. Negroes, descendants of Francis Bacon, the hard of hearing. Or things they do, electrical workers, lawyers, farmer, stamp collectors. Or things they have, factory owners, nothing but wages, apartment houses, in common. The community of something practical makes the group have a community of opinion, which arises from the problems they think they face with respect to their common interests. Such groups are not only opinion groups, they are interest groups. It is these groups that do things as groups. It is these groups that propaganda tries to stir up, move, set against each other, and use in any handy way. Few individuals belong to just one group at a time. The groups are almost illimitable in number. The propagandist should not get the idea that just because a group exists, it is a potential source of weakness or cleavage. Workers are not always against employers, nor the aged against the young, nor women against men, nor shippers against railwaymen. In a well-run society, groups have interest only for limited purposes. Railwaymen are not permanently hostile to truckers, shippers, flyers, canal operators. At the moment, they may be maddest of all at the insurance companies because of some quarrel about insurance premiums and risks. The poor propagandist tries to butt in on every fight, even when there is none. Often his propaganda is received the way an intervener is received in most family quarrels, with the bland question, what fight? We ain't mad. Sound propaganda picks only those group issues which are acute enough to stand a little help from outside. If outside help would be a kiss of death to the group that is helped, then black propaganda instead of white is indicated. In any case, sound operating intelligence is the first precondition to the attempted psychological manipulation of enemy groups. Profile of Opinion Opinion analysis can prevent a profile of enemy opinion. To make a profile, proceed as though assembling a photostrip map taken by an aerial camera. Take the whole enemy country and divide it into major groups by percentages. Select particularly those groups you are interested in addressing. 
If you have kamikaze-minded collaborators, send them in to the enemy country to ask a thousand enemies the same question, selecting the thousand the same way that the total population is made up. If the country is 32% Catholic, the thousand interviewees should include 320 Catholics. If the country is 36% urban and 61% rural, 3% unexplained, get 610 of your interviewees from the country. The questions do not have to be asked in precisely the same form, but they should bear on precisely the same issues. When your agents come back, you have a poll. If you do not have agents, then use the percentages from reference books and try to estimate how many definite groups have what specific grievances. You are then in a position to proceed. Interrogation. When processing prisoners of war, it is an excellent idea to deal with them for morale intelligence as well as for general and assorted military information. Questions should not aim at what the prisoner thinks he thinks about God, his leader, his country, and so on, but should concern themselves with those things which most interest the prisoner himself. Does his wife write that the babies have enough diapers? How is the mail service? Is he worried about war workers getting his pre-war job? How much money is he saving? How is the food? How were the non-coms? Did they treat him right? Did he get enough furloughs? Does he think that anybody is making too much money at home? Most men carry over into military services the occupational interests which they had as civilians. A carpenter in uniform, even though he may be a good infantry top sergeant, is still a carpenter, and information can be obtained from him as to the problems of skilled labor, of union members, of the poorer city dwellers, and so on. The profile obtained from civilian polls or from Propanel can then be paralleled in the field. Set up a graph showing the entire enemy army, Use several graphs if the army splits along racial, national, or plainly sectional lines. On each graph, enter the component groups. From the poll or from the interrogations, list the dissatisfaction in terms of seriousness with which the dissatisfiee attributes to it. It is not what you think he should worry about that is important. It's what actually he does worry about. His waiting counts. Make up a scale, quantitative on the actual count of mentions of particular gripes. For example, out of 699 prisoners, of whom 167 were union members in civil life, there were 234 separate voluntary mentions of dissatisfaction with the enemy government's labor union policy. When that quantitative count changes up or down, you have a definite guide with which to control your own propaganda policy. Or you can proceed qualitatively. List enemy dissatisfaction under terms such as these for any one issue, shoe rationing, health facilities, minority rights, esteem for government leaders, etc. Prisoner, 1. Is completely satisfied and has no complaints. 2. Has a few complaints, but is generally satisfied. 3. Has many complaints and does not expect improvement. 4. Is despondent about the whole situation. 5. Is definitely antagonistic to home authorities in this matter. Rate each prisoner or captured civilian according to your best judgment. Then make up percentage lists of the grounds for dissatisfaction of each component group in the enemy society. This latter figure will be impressive in documents, but will not mean as much for practical purposes as will the more specific percentages under each separate head. If you feel like showing off, average everything into everything else and call it the gross index of total enemy morale. This won't fool anyone who knows the propaganda business, and you won't be able to do anything with or about it, but you can hang it on a month-by-month -month chart in the front office where visitors can be impressed at getting in on a military secret. Incidentally, if some smart enemy agent sees it and reports it back, enemy intelligence experts will go mad trying to figure out just how you got that figure. It's like the old joke that the average American is 10 elevenths white, 52% female, and always slightly pregnant. Specificity Good propaganda intelligence provides A. News B. Military intelligence which can be released as news C. Military intelligence which cannot be released as news, but knowledge of which will prevent the propaganda operator from making mistakes or miscalculations in reporting the news. D. Enemy news. E. Up-to-the-minute enemy slang, hobbies, fads, grievances, and other matters of current public attention. F. Specific grievances of specific groups and of the nation as a whole, should these arise. G. Information about probable intergroup conflicts. H. Types and forms of discontent with enemy authority. I. Identification of unpopular or popular enemy personalities. 
J. All other information that will enable the psychological warfare operator to act promptly and sympathetically in taking the side of specific enemy individuals against their authorities or other enemy groups. Enemy opinion cannot be manipulated in general. It must be met on its own ground, the current everyday thoughts of enemy citizens and soldiers. These thoughts do not usually concern grandiose problems of political ethics. They are practical like your own. Footnote. Walter Lippmann's book, Public Opinion, was first published in New York in 1922, but it is still clean-cut as a basic statement of the problems of public opinion. The author's own life as a commentator is remarkable in fulfilling the mission which he implicitly set himself when writing about public opinion, the job of lifting issues into emotional and psychological contexts in which the resulting judgment will be based on socially sound factors. End of footnote. They must be appealed to in a way which makes the listener really listen, makes the reader stop and reread, makes them both think it over later. Getting the attention of the enemy is not enough. Most enemies will pay plenty of attention to you, too much at times. Getting sympathetic attention is what counts. This can be done only with specific grounds. With the news, you and he have a genuine common interest. Using his real troubles as a link, you must create that common interest. The force, the effectiveness of your argument, may make him forget that it is the enemy who has brought his attention to this issue. You must leave him with the feeling, by golly, that fellow is right. But to talk about his troubles effectively, you must know what they really are. You must see it his way before you start showing him that his way is your way, that you think he is really on your side, and that his boss's side is wrong, incorrect, and doomed to get whipped anyhow. Propaganda can operate only on the basis of specificity. Real persuasion can be sought only on the basis of real sympathy with real troubles. Old, incorrectly guessed, or poorly described issues are worse than none at all. Figure 28. Nostalgic Black Soldiers in all wars have gotten homesick. Propaganda appeals to homesickness in many ways. One of the simplest is the device shown in this German black leaflet, which shows the husband turning off the alarm clock while the wife wakes up. The printed message on the reverse makes out a discouraging case for the soldier's opportunity to return home, pointing out that the G.I. in Europe, even after victory, will face, quote, that nasty jungle war in the Far East. No identification of the leaflet is given. End of figure 28. Figure 29. Nostalgic white misfire. Figure 30 was carefully adapted to Japanese customs. The mere fact that the Americans knew enough about Japan to celebrate a homey Japanese holiday was probably enough to make the Japanese reader examine the leaflet carefully. Here is a combined nostalgic and surrender leaflet showing how surrender leads the Japanese soldier back to his wife and children. The drawing looks American rather than Japanese, and it is not likely that a genuine Japanese could have been made homesick by use of this leaflet. End of figure 29. Figure 30. Nostalgic White. On March 5th of every year, the Japanese celebrate the colorful custom of Boys' Day. Kites in the form of carp are flown over the cities and countryside, and millions of families set out to give their little sons an excursion or some other treat. It is characteristic of the Japanese that there is no Girls' Day. This leaflet from Psychological Warfare Branch, USAFPA, was designed for dropping on May 5th. It ends with the appeal, You must guard the strength of the new Japan, your treasure, your children. Thus it combines homesickness, patriotism, and pre-surrender indoctrination. End of figure 30. Figure 31. Estrus Black. Young human beings, especially young males, are apt to give considerable attention to sex. In areas of military operations, they are removed from the stimuli of secondary sex references, which are, in America, an accepted part of everyone's daily life, bathing beauty photos, magazine covers, semi-nudes and advertisements, etc. Our enemies tried to use the resulting pinup craze for propaganda purposes, hoping that a vain arousal of estrum would diminish morale. This choice Japanese item is from the Philippines. The best collection of these is kept in a locked file for experts only at the Library of Congress. End of figure 31. Figure 32. Estrus Gray. This and the succeeding illustration show a series of four leaflets which the Nazis used against American troops in Europe. Anti-morale in intent, they rely on the illustrations to get attention and then develop their malicious, salacious, anti-Semitic story. The series illustrates the strength and weakness of Nazi propaganda. End of figure 32. Figure 33, Estrus Gray continued, 
Concluding the series begun in the preceding illustrations, these Nazi leaflets tried to lower American morale by combining estrum, resentment, discouragement, and inter-American hatred. The Dr. Mordecai Ezekiel, mentioned in number two, is a real person, a splendid American and conscientious official. The Nazis used his name because it was so plainly Jewish, hoping that the ignorance of the American troops would permit their lies to spread. End of figure 33. Figure 34, Obscene Black. One of the wildest adventures of World War II concerns this now rare, quote, Chinese Federal Reserve Bank, unquote, one dollar bill. The bank was a Japanese puppet outfit in Peiping. The Japanese had banknotes engraved by Chinese artists, and only after the new pro-Japanese banknotes had been issued all over the city did they notice what the ancient scholar was doing with his hands. The engraver had disappeared, and the Chinese enjoyed a rare, morale-stimulating laugh. Propaganda gestures such as this, spontaneous, saucy, silly, achieve effects which planned operations rarely attain. End of figure 34. Figure 35, Informational Sheet. This British leaflet combines a message for Arabs with instructions for British pilots forced down in the desert. The propaganda content is closely associated with the practical mission of the leaflet. End of figure 35. Figure 36, Counter-Propaganda Instructions. The Wehrmacht in the West had a unit bearing the code designation Scorpion. This unit combined the functions of offensive and defensive propaganda, which remained separate throughout the war in the U.S. Army. The information service sheet shown provides clear, simple leads for counter-propaganda by selecting usable, usable for the Germans, that is, items from Allied sources. From this raw material, morale officers could make up their own leaflets, lectures, or broadcasts. End of figure 36. Figure 37, Defensive Counterpropaganda. The National Socialist Leadership Staff of the Wehrmacht got out this communications for the troops as a guidance sheet for company talks. The content includes thoughts about the Volkssturm, the celebrated American freedoms, and small requests but important. This issue is dated from January 1945. End of figure 37. Figure 38, Black Counterpropaganda. Seeing that the Germans had a good counterpropaganda medium, the Allies decided to use it themselves. They issued this, quote, counterpropaganda, unquote, sheet, shown in original and facsimile in English. The blackness is not very black, since few Germans would consider this to be German in origin once they had read it. End of figure 38. End of section 15. Read by Eli Bishop, San Francisco, March 23, 2021.